market participants, the overall environment, the vocabulary, and the difference between investing and trading. Most importantly, I show you where you fit in and the different ways you can enter the market. There are two main ways of participating in the market. First, you can be an investor buying and holding stocks for long periods. Or you can be a trader buying and holding stocks for a short time. You can choose one method or both. You don't need to decide how to participate right now. Keep in mind there will be many distractions, from touts on financial programs who offer a dozen stock tips a day, to hundreds of articles written about the stock market that urge you to buy this stock right now. At times, the stock market resembles a three-ring circus. I want to help you cut through the confusion and help you identify the information that is most important for your needs. What is the stock market? You will hear a lot of definitions about the stock market and what it can do for you. Many people like to say that it is the greatest wealth building machine ever created. For some people, it is. The stock market is similar to a huge auction with some low priced stocks, it's more like a swap shop where companies list shares so they can raise capital. In fact, when a company goes public, its shares are listed for trading and become available for anyone to trade on an exchange. The New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, is the best known one. The place where members meet to buy and sell stocks is called a stock exchange. The exchange provides an organized marketplace for stocks just as a supermarket provides a marketplace for food. As you probably know, buyers and sellers no longer meet in a physical location on the trading floor of a stock exchange as they did in the old days. Now shares are bought and sold primarily online using computers. All you need is a computer, smartphone, or tablet, and you can participate in the stock market. It is not surprising that so many people are fascinated by the market. With a few clicks of a button or mouse, you can buy and sell shares of stock and other financial products from the comfort of your home. If all goes well, you can make money. What is a brokerage firm? When we talk about the stock market, we are really talking about the buying and selling of individual stocks and all the other financial products you will learn about. To participate in the market, you must sign up with a brokerage firm. A brokerage firm is a company that is licensed to buy and sell stocks on behalf of its clients. Most trading buying and selling is done by using an online brokerage firm where you can trade over the internet. In the next chapter, I show you how to open an account and begin trading. What is a share of stock? This next part can get a little technical, but it will help explain the reason that stock markets exist. The word stock originally came from the word livestock. Instead of trading cows and sheep, people trade pieces of paper, stock certificates that represent ownership, shares, in a corporation. Stocks are also referred to as equities or securities. When you buy shares in a corporation, you are considered an investor or shareholder. As a shareholder, you are allowed one vote for each share of stock that you own. The more shares you own, the more of the corporation you control and the more money you could earn if the stock price increases. Most shareholders investors own a tiny sliver of the corporation with little say over how the corporation is run. That means you aren't allowed to boss anyone around in the corporation. You'd have to own millions of shares of stock to become a primary owner of a corporation whose stock is publicly traded. On one side you have the owners of corporations who are looking for a convenient way to raise money so they can hire more employees, build more factories or offices, and upgrade their equipment. The way they raise money is by issuing shares of stocks to the public in an initial public offering IPO or secondary offering. On the other side are people like you and me who buy and sell shares of stock in those corporations. Remember, when you own a share of stock, you share in the success or failure of the business because you own part of the corporation. Note, there are two kinds of stock, common and preferred. In this book, 
We always refer to common stock because this type of stock attracts the most attention from BU. Errs and sellers. The main difference between common and preferred is common stock gives voting rights to its shareholder, and preferred does not. Only corporations issue stock. To issue stock, the business has to be a corporation, as legally defined. Most large companies that you know about are corporations, as examples, Alphabet, Apple, Boeing, Disney, General Electric, Home Depot, IBM, McDonald's, Microsoft, and Netflix, to name just a few, and their stocks are traded on one of the stock exchanges. Some companies are privately held and do not sell shares to the public. In summary, a corporation issues stock to generate money. Investors buy stock to participate in the success of the business. If the corporation does well, the stock price will probably increase, and those investors will make money. If the corporation does poorly, the stock price will probably decline, and investors lose money. Once a corporation goes public and its stock is traded on an exchange, the goal is to convince investors that the corporation is a worthwhile investment. Corporations do everything in their power to sell products and also attract money from investors. They also want to motivate major institutional investors to buy their stock. Larger corporations spread the word online and through print, television, and social media advertising. Smaller corporations rely more heavily on online advertising, especially social media, as well as on word of mouth, emails, and news releases. Professionals connected to Wall Street always say good things about the market. After all, they want the market to go up. On the other hand, if a stock gets slammed in the media for any reason, this creates negative headlines, which companies prefer to avoid. Initial public offering. The main motivation for a company to sell shares is to raise cash that is used to operate the business. They do that by selling shares and getting those shares listed on a stock exchange. After an initial public offering, the company is uninvolved in trading the shares. All trading, and the profits and losses generated from buying and selling shares, goes to investors, not the company. In other words, even if the stock price of Microsoft increased by 20%, the company gains only from the shares it already owns. It does not participate in shares sold to the public. Nevertheless, rising stock prices are great publicity and keep investors happy. You buy stocks for one reason, to make money. Investing in the stock market is all about making money, either quickly, short-term trading, or slowly, long-term investing. If you own shares of a corporation that does well and consistently grows profits, then you should expect to earn money as the stock price increases. Simply put, you earn money in the stock market when you sell shares at a price that is higher than the purchase price. There is no guarantee, of course, that you will make money. Even the shares of good corporations can decline sometimes, leading to a loss. Profits earned from a stock are called capital gains, which is the difference between your buy and sell prices. If you lose money, it is called a capital loss. This is the risk you take when participating in the stock market. Investors. Make money slowly. Investors buy stocks in corporations whose shares they believe to be undervalued. They plan to hold the shares for the long term, often for years. Investors generally ignore short-term day-to-day price fluctuations and market volatility. Some investors don't even look at their profits or losses until they receive their monthly or quarterly statements. If all goes according to plan, they find that the value of their investment has increased over time. One of the most successful buy and hold investors in history, Warren Buffett, likes to say that he is not buying a stock, he is buying a business. He buys stocks for the best price he can and holds them as long as possible. Buffett buys stock in conservative, some would say dull, corporations like insurance companies and banks and rarely buys technology stocks. 
he became a billionaire using his long-term buy and hold investment strategy. A strategy is a plan that helps an investor achieve a certain goal. When investing, the goal is earning money. Investors who bought and held shares of stock in Amazon, Apple, Walmart, Netflix, Microsoft, Salesforce, Nike, and hundreds of other companies saw the value of their investments soar over time. During the best years, the stock market rallied by huge amounts, and the price of the best performing stocks doubled or trip. Ed. That's as sweet as it gets for investors. During these times, when the market keeps rising for years, it is called a bull market. Unfortunately, there are also times when it's unprofitable to be an investor, during a bear market, when the market generally goes down. During the worst bear markets, it's possible for a year's worth of gains to be erased within weeks. Fortunately for investors, over the long term, the market has tended to move higher more often than it has declined. I will discuss bull and bear markets in more detail in Chapter 4. Short-term traders. Make money quickly. Unlike investors, short-term traders don't care about the long-term prospects of their stocks. They are focused on the short-term movements of the stock price. Their goal is to take advantage of volatility, extreme price movements, to make money. This means that they may buy and then sell a stock within minutes, a few hours or days, or even a few weeks. Professional high-frequency traders who use computers to make the trade may hold positions for only microseconds. There are many kinds of short-term traders. Trading strategies include day trading, holding no longer than a day, swing trading, holding for 3 to 5 days until a price target is reached, and position trading, holding for weeks or a few months. Day traders buy and sell stocks quickly taking profits before the market closes for the day. We will discuss all these strategies in detail in later chapters. Trading stocks is a lot more exciting than investing because the payoff is faster, and when you're right, it's possible to make substantial profits. When investing, wealth is built more slowly over a long time period. When trading, the goal is to make profits every day, week, or few months. As you will discover, it's more challenging to make money as a short-term trader, but the rewards are often immediate. Professional Traders Using OPM to make money Professional traders typically want to use other people's money, OPM, and less often, their own, to invest or trade. They charge a fee for their services. Professionals include institutional traders such as pension funds, banks, insurance companies, mutual fund companies, and hedge funds. These institutional investors have access to billions of dollars, and when they buy and sell huge numbers of shares, they can influence not only the price of individual stocks but the entire market. Some institutions set up high-speed computer programs i.e., algorithms that automatically buy and sell stocks when certain parameters i.e., price levels are met. Many high-frequency traders make thousands of trades per second in order to capture a few pennies in profits. Those pennies can add up to large profits each day. Some describe this strategy as picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, a strategy not recommended for amateurs. Not all institutional traders are high-frequency traders. In fact, most professionals avoid high-frequency trading and use a variety of long-term and short-term strategies to make money for their clients and themselves. It is estimated that professional traders, including computer algorithms, make up approximately 90% of the daily volume in the market. Retail investors make up the other 10%. Two important questions. Before going to the next chapter, here are two questions that beginning investors often ask. 1. Question. How much money do I need to get started? Answer. You can open an account at most brokerage firms for $0, no cash required. Eventually you must add money to the account before you will be allowed to trade. You can check online or call the brokerage firm to find out the exact requirements. 
2. Question. How much money can I lose? Answer. In a worst case scenario, you can lose all the money you invested. And if you go on margin borrowing funds from the broker, which is not recommended, you can lose more money than you invested. Even with these risks, I encourage you to learn about and participate in the stock market. By reading this book, you will learn how to avoid losing your money. Here is an email I received from a reader who was concerned that he didn't have enough money to live on. He hoped that the stock market would solve his financial problems. He wrote, I am 71 years old and am just starting to study stocks because I don't have a retirement fund to lean on. I am working three jobs and know I can't keep doing this for much longer. What should I do? He wanted to know what strategies he should use to make. Oni fast. I feel bad for this man because he is financially vulnerable. No one wants to wake up one day and realize there is no money for emergencies, or even for survival. Therefore, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not investing at all. I hope this man finds a way to reduce expenses and debt while increasing income. I'm not a financial planner or analyst, so I was unable to give him specific advice, but I suggested he get competent financial guidance, and quickly. It's not too late. The good news for this man and the millions of others who have been left out of the stock market is that it's not too late. Conservative strategies can be used to reduce some of the financial burdens of investing and, my hope is, to increase income. I wrote this book for him and millions of others who don't know what to do, and who feel lost because they have been left behind. The biggest problem for this man is that time is running out. Because he wants to start investing so late in life, it will take some time to get started. If you are reading this and are young or middle-aged, you are fortunate that you have time to invest for the short and long term. However, if you, like this man, are past retirement age, you can still make money in the stock market or elsewhere. At first, the most important goal is to get out of debt and cut expenses. Do not bet money on the stock market when you need that money to pay bills. In addition, although short-term trading strategies are included in this book, I don't want anyone to believe it's easy to make money quickly. It takes hard work and study to be a successful short-term trader, and that's one of the reasons why I believe you should first get your feet wet by investing before you try your hand at short-term trading. Note, as you read through the book, you will be introduced to a lot of different vocabulary words. If you ever need a more detailed explanation of any words or concepts, you can go to Investopedia's website, http colon slash slash www.investopedia.com, to find a definition. History of the Stock Market In 1531, government bonds and notes were traded in Antwerp, Belgium, but not stocks because stocks didn't exist yet. Likewise, the Hamburg Stock Exchange in Germany was created in 1558, but once again, oh. Lee goods were traded, not stocks or bonds. Most historians agree that the world's first organized stock exchange began in Amsterdam in 1602 by the Dutch East India Company, where stocks, bonds, and other securities were traded. In the United States, the first U.S. securities exchange was founded in 1790 in Philadelphia, and although the participants traded many financial products, they didn't trade stocks. Two years later, in 1792, the first organized meeting place for buyers and sellers of stock occurred under a buttonwood tree in New York City. It just happened that the name of the street where all this took place was Wall Street. For history buffs, the Buttonwood Tree was at 68 Wall Street. When people heard about what was happening on Wall Street, they wanted a piece of the action. Some days, as many as 100 shares of stock were exchanged. In today's market, billions of shares of stock change hands every day. It got so crowded under the Buttonwood Tree that 24 prominent brokers and merchants decided to organize what they were doing. For a fixed commission, 
they agreed to buy and sell shares of stock in corporations to the public. They gave themselves 25 cents for each share of stock they traded, today we would call these people stockbrokers. The Buttonwood Agreement was signed in 1792. This was the humble beginning of the New York Stock Exchange. It wasn't long before the brokers and merchants moved their offices to a Wall Street coffee shop. Eventually, they moved indoors to the New York Stock Exchange building on Wall Street. Even after 200 years, the name Wall Street is used to describe the entire U.S. stock market, including the financial institutions that the brokers do business with, no matter where those institutions, and brokers, are located. If you go to New York, you'll see that Wall Street is just a narrow street in the financial district of Lower Manhattan. The stock market, or Wall Street, is really a convenient way of talking about anyone or anything connected with our financial markets. Now that you have an idea of how to get started as an investor or trader, the first step is to open a brokerage account. All the financial products you will buy and sell will be found at the brokerage firm. Chapter 2 Opening a Brokerage Account Now that you have an overview of the stock market, it's time to take the next step to get started investing. In this chapter, I show you how to open a brokerage account. Opening an account is similar to opening a bank account, but with more investment choices. Let's go through the steps to open an account. Fortunately, it's easy to do, and most people complete the application online. If you prefer to open an account in person, you can go to the office of the brokerage firm if it has a brick and mortar building. Step 1. Choose a brokerage firm with a good reputation to buy stocks or other investment products, you must have an account with a brokerage firm. This is an important decision, if you choose the wrong firm, it can cost money in unnecessary fees or poor order fills i.e., execution of your order. Because all brokerage firms have a website, most firms will allow you to buy or sell orders from your computer or online device. It's easy to do, and most online orders are processed within seconds. On rare occasions, during an extremely volatile market, orders can be delayed. The most popular brokerage firms have nationally known reputations, a 12-hour help desk to answer questions by phone or chat, Easy to navigate screens, streaming real time stock quotes, rapid trade execution, and they will allow you to trade a variety of financial products. Most brokerage firms have educational resources and information about investing and trading strategies, such as articles, webinars, and podcasts. The top firms offer research with sophisticated charts, trade alerts, customizable screens, and profit and loss figures. Although it's not required, I also recommend finding a broker with a simulated or paper money trading program that allows you to practice making trades. In addition, many brokers have scanning programs in their trading software that allow you to search and scan for stocks and other products that meet certain criteria. Before signing with a broker, call, email, or chat with the representatives to see how quickly they respond to questions. If you are satisfied with the service, it's easy to apply for an online C count. It's also simple to cancel an account if you are dissatisfied for any reason. Nevertheless, try to find a brokerage firm with representatives who patiently answer questions and solve problems as they occur. Note. Many brokerage firms have offices where you can meet with financial representatives, they have a variety of titles, but in reality they are stockbrokers. These firms are eager to manage your money, especially if you have a lot of assets. Scam alert. Be certain to sign up with a well-known, reputable brokerage. Be careful of scammers who create glossy, professional brokerage websites that look real. Their job is to try and convince you to transfer money to their fake firm. Never work with a firm that requires cryptocurrencies instead of currency, because digital currencies are unregulated. 
Ignore strangers on the internet who brag about how they routinely make $25,000 to $50,000 a day and will share their knowledge only if you sign up with their firm. If you're reading this book from outside the United States, you must be even more careful. Many fraudsters operate with impunity from their home countries because of lax regulations. That means any money transferred to them, especially with cryptocurrencies, will never be recovered. There are three main types of brokerage firms, online, full service, and discount, which I will explain below. Online brokerage firms Online brokerage firms are the easiest and most popular to use when trading stocks. Online investing or trading simply means entering buy and sell orders over the internet from your own computer or mobile device. All brokerage firms have a website that allows customers to buy and sell stocks in addition to other financial products such as bonds, index funds, mutual funds, and fixed income products such as CDs and treasuries. In the old days of trading, the first 200 years, clients were charged a commission for every trade, which often added up to big bucks. Once brokerage firms went online, competition increased commissions plunged, and eventually commissions were completely removed. Zero commissions fueled a rise in short-term strategies including day trading and buying options. The do and side to opening an account with an online brokerage is that these firms offer little or no investment advice. That's probably why you're reading this book. If you feel that investment advice is needed or if you have a huge portfolio that is difficult to manage, an online broker may not be right for you. You may prefer a full-service broker, a decision only you can make. Where can you find a current list of the top-rated online brokerage firms? Go to any search engine and type, rank online brokerage firms, followed by the current year. This will bring up a list of articles from independent sources such as Forbes, Barron's, MarketWatch, Keipelinger, NerdWallet, and Bankrate that will help guide your decision. Full-service brokerage firms. Bells and whistles for a price full-service brokerage firms include some of the largest and most influential stock brokerage firms on Wall Street. These brokerage firms provide a variety of banking and investment products primarily geared to wealthy clientele who don't have the time or desire to manage their own accounts. Unless you have a large portfolio, don't expect to receive a high level of personalized service. If you open an account with a full-service brokerage firm, you will be assigned a stockbroker to handle your account. Stockbrokers, who refer to themselves as financial consultants, account executives, investment managers, money managers, or account representatives, are paid to offer advice about buying and selling and to get your orders to the electronic trading floor for execution. Be aware that these brokers require more time to enter an order than online brokers. Typically, representatives are paid a percentage of the cash in your account. Don't be afraid to ask the percentage they are paid, because the fee structure is different at each firm. Clients with larger accounts usually get better rates and service. If you hire a stockbroker at a full-service brokerage firm, my advice is to find an honest, competent individual who truly cares about your investment portfolio. Often, stockbrokers at these firms know little about stocks and are instead salespeople. If the broker is a fiduciary, the law requires the B. Oak to work in your best interest and not in the broker's own interest. If you open an account with a full-service broker, monitor the account closely and make sure you have final approval for any investment decisions the broker makes. By reading this book, you will gain more confidence and knowledge, which should help you make financial decisions. Another choice for those of you with significant sums to manage is to hire a money manager to handle your entire portfolio for a yearly or quarterly fee. Money managers typically have a relationship to one or more brokerage firms and make their trades through them. Because you will be paying a fee to that broker, find out what those charges will be. Although this may sound confusing, 
Don't be afraid to ask questions no matter which method you choose. Most importantly, you must know how to buy and sell stocks independently, whether you do it alone or hire someone to do it. Discount Brokers No frill trading for zero-cost discount brokers grew in popularity in the early days of the internet, but now many have merged with larger firms. As a result, these brokerages no longer refer to themselves as discount brokers, nowadays the terms online brokers and discount brokers are nearly synonymous. Discount brokers are always online and allow you to make your own trades, but they do not provide investment advice or guide you in any way. Step 2. Open a brokerage account Once you select a broker, you can communicate with the firm via phone, online, or in person, if it has local offices. If you ax, the firm will send you an enrollment packet via email. When you enroll, the broker will ask questions about your investment experience, your financial goals, the products you want to trade, and the amount of risk you are willing to accept from low risk to high risk. Don't worry too much about the questionnaire, it's used for informational purposes. Once you finish this book, answering the questionnaire will be a breeze. Eventually, you must fund the account with at least a few hundred dollars. Ask the firm about its minimum requirement. As a rule, you always want extra cash in your account so that you can buy or sell financial produce. T.S. Fund the account with a check, or transfer money from your bank. That money is usually deposited into a cash account, probably a money market account. What is margin? One question the broker will ask is whether you want to use a margin account. Margin allows you to borrow money from the brokerage to buy more shares than you can afford to pay with your deposited cash. If you are a beginner, I recommend not applying for margin. Margin has caused problems for investors who don't understand how much money can be lost when things don't go their way. You can always add it later. Typically, margin is, one to one. For example, if you have $2,500 in your account, the brokerage will let you borrow up to an additional $2,500. This gives you $5,000 in buying power. However, it's not free money, you must pay interest on the borrowed cash. The advantage of margin is that you are using the broker's money to make more money, this is called leverage. Leveraging works great if your investment increases in value. On the other hand, if the stock you chose declines in value, not only do you lose all or some of your original investment, which is painful enough but you'll still owe the broker the money that was borrowed. This adds extra risk to any investment using margin. If the prices of the stocks that you own plunge after you borrowed cash to buy them, you might get the dreaded margin call. The broker will demand that you provide more cash or equities to fund the account, or sell some of the shares. There is no bargaining, you must meet the margin call. If you don't react quickly enough, the broker will sell some of your positions until the margin percentage is at the proper level, usually 30% or higher. In my opinion, margin is a risky method best left to experienced traders. Invest what you can afford without borrowing. If you don't heed this advice, you will quickly know what I mean after you receive that first margin call. What equipment do you need? All you need to get started as an investor or trader is a computer, smartphone, or tablet. Before the internet, it was hard for retail investors to trade stocks. We had to rely on a stockbroker to make the raids, and the commission cost was often high, as much as $100 per trade depending on the size of the order. With improved technology and $0 commissions, it has never been easier to participate in the stock market. I have found that an iPad or other tablet is an ideal device to study the market and read the news. Many people still place trades with a computer, but more and more people are doing their trading on mobile devices. History of the Stock Exchange After the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, was established in 1792, 
brokers who could not meet the financial requirements for trading on the New York Stock Exchange moved their operations to the street curb. They were given the name, curbside brokers. In 1911, these brokers became known as the New York Curb Market. In 1921, the curbside brokers finally moved indoors to a building on Greenwich Street and changed their name to the New York Curb Exchange. In 1952, the exchange was renamed the American Stock Exchange, Amex. In addition to the NYSE and Amex, the third stock exchange was the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System, NASDAQ, which was created in 1971. This was the first electronic stock exchange, and members were linked together by a network of computers. In order to compete more effectively, many of the smaller stock exchanges, including the American Stock Exchange, merged with the NYSE in 2008. The NASDAQ also gobbled up some of the smaller exchanges, but kept its name. If you are in the United States, more than likely you will buy stocks on one of the two major U.S. stock exchanges, the NYSE or NASDAQ. Although this history is interesting, it won't affect you as an investor. It doesn't matter at what exchange you buy stocks. Stock exchanges exist in nearly every country in the world, although the U.S. market is the largest. Other countries with stock exchanges include Germany, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, France, the Netherlands, Russia, Japan, China, Sweden, Italy, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Denmark, Hong Kong, India, South Korea, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Iceland, Armenia, Taiwan, South Africa, Spain, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Ukraine, Turkey, Hungary, Saudi Arabia, and nearly all the countries in Asia, Africa, the European Union, and Latin America not mentioned above. Joining a stock exchange It's not easy for a corporation to be listed on a stock exchange because each exchange has specific listing standards. It may take years for a new corporation to meet all the rules and regulations and have its stock listed for trading on the exchange. For example, the companies that are listed on the NYSE are some of the best known and largest corporations in the world. Blue chip corporations such as 3M, American Express, AT&T, Boeing, Caterpillar, Chevron, Cigna, Coca-Cola, DuPont, Home Depot, Honeywell, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, Lowe's, McDonald's, Merck, Nike, Procter & Gamble, Salesforce, Travelers, United Health, Visa, Walmart, and Walt Disney. More than 2,800 stocks trade on the NYSE. The NASDAQ, on the other hand, is both a stock exchange and an index. The NASDAQ index contains many technology corporations including Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Cisco Systems, Intel, Meta, Microsoft, Netflix, and NVIDIA. More than 3,300 stocks trade on the NASDAQ exchange. In addition to the NASDAQ and NYSE, more than 12,000 stocks are traded over the counter OTC rather than on an exchange. Some of these companies are large, but most are small. Some meet the SEC Securities and Exchange Commission requirements for being listed on an exchange, while others don't. It is recommended that you research these companies thoroughly, i.e., do your due diligence before investing in OTC stocks. Finally, there are also stocks that don't meet the requirements of the SEC and are listed on the pink sheets. My suggestion. Don't buy any stock listed on the pink sheets. They may be easy to buy but are hard to sell at a good price. Now that you have opened and funded a brokerage account, it's time to take the next step, and that is to start investing or trading. I will begin by teaching you how to create a watch list which is simply a list of the most important stocks that you plan to follow. Creating a watch list is the first step in learning how to trade or invest. Chapter 3 Your Watch List By Now, 
you probably opened a brokerage account, or you're thinking about it, and are eager to buy that first stock. I urge you to wait a little longer before investing real money into the market. It is wise to research and study before buying. In this chapter, I will teach you how to create a watch list, which is a list of the stocks or other financial products that you are thinking of buying or already own. Maintaining a list of stocks to follow is essential because it forces you to know about the companies whose shares you plan to own. The watch list is in your brokerage account software, consider it like home base. Unfortunately, many people skip this step because they don't realize how important it is. The alternative is to buy stocks based on tips or hunches. I don't want you to fall into that trap. Let's begin by learning how to find stocks using your own watch list. What stocks to put on your watch list before you actually buy and sell stocks? You may be thinking, where do I find stocks that will make me money? The short answer is, everywhere. Unfortunately, while it's easy to get ideas of what stocks to buy, it's not always easy to make money from them. By the end of this book, however, you will learn how to do both. First, we need to get stock ideas. That's the easy part. The challenge is to separate the wheat from the chaff, that is, to invest in stocks that are true moneymakers. Winning stocks bring profits, sometimes for a day or week, but the best stocks provide gains for months, years, or even decades. For now, your job is to think of companies that you have heard about or know about because you are a customer. Your goal is to find stocks that have the potential for future growth and will increase in value. However, there is a big difference between the stocks you're thinking about buying and the stocks you actually buy. Stock ideas are everywhere for now, make a written lee of stocks that seem to be good ideas. Later you will add these stocks to your watch list. This is not the time to buy but to observe. Unless your neighbor or friend is a financial professional, or fortune teller, that person's stock ideas are about as useful as the tip sheets passed out for free at a horse race. One of the great stock pickers of the 1990s, Peter Lynch, got stock ideas by watching how and where people shopped. He'd go to the mall and see which stores were popular. He'd even count the number of cars parked in the lot. The more cars, the better. This led Lynch to conduct research on these companies. His goal was to find popular companies whose stock was reasonably priced and whose earnings had a good chance to grow over time. Using Lynch's methods, you'd have noticed that Apple was often the busiest store in the mall. Other crowd favorites were Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, Starbucks, and McDonald's, mostly because of their competitive prices and popular products. Anyone who bought and held shares in these companies made money. As more people turned to online shopping, it became obvious that Amazon was a huge hit. You may have noticed that fewer people were shopping at Sears than at Apple. The difference between traffic at the two stores was striking. Although Sears hung around for another decade, eventually this once popular company went out of business. Anyone who invested in Sears stock and held for the long term lost money. This is just one method of finding stocks. We will discuss other methods later. Hint. I recommend that you use a stock screener to find stocks to buy. A stock screener is an excellent tool to search for stocks with any fundamental or technical criteria that you enter. For example, search for stocks that are at or near their 52 week highs. It's possible these stocks will continue moving even higher. We will talk later in this book about other criteria to look for. Financial websites with stock. Screeners include Yahoo Finance, Google Finance, Barchart, MarketWatch, Zacks, Finviz, MSN Money, and Market Chameleon, to name a few. You can also find a full list of websites in the appendix at the end of the book. Watch list information The stocks on your watch list contain basic information such as the most recent stock price, the bid-ask prices, volume, and other important data. 
Figure 3.1 shows a partial screenshot of a watch list that I created. You can add, edit, or delete any stock on the list. Most brokers allow you to create multiple watch lists. Figure 3.1 Watch List Source Interactive Brokers Client Portal Platform June 2021 Each stock has a unique set of 1 to 5 letters, called the ticker symbol. For example, Apple's letter code is AAPL. Amazon's ticker symbol is AMZN. Adobe's is ADBE. When creating a watch list or checking stock quotes, enter the letter code or company name. There are several columns in the customizable watch list, but I will focus on the information that is most important to you. 1. Symbol. A unique letter code and the company name. 2. Stock price. The most recent stock price. 3. Change. The price difference in percent between yesterday's closing price and the last price. 4. Bid ask price. This is the stock quote. We will discuss this thoroughly in Chapter 5. 5. Volume. The number of shares traded on any given day. Heavily traded stocks can trade millions of shares a day, while low volume i.e., thinly traded, stocks may trade as little as a few thousand shares each day. Hint. If you are a beginner, I recommend that you aim to buy stocks with a lot of volume, at least 100,000 shares traded per day. Although there is a lot more information that can be viewed in the watch list, these columns may be all that you need. As you gain experience, you may want to look for more information. Stocks on my watch list Most experienced traders have a watch list O. Oh. Stocks they follow and monitor, and you should, too. To help get you started, below is a list of 88 well-known and popular companies, at the time I wrote the book, included on my watch list. If you are new to the stock market and this is your first watch list, 88 stocks might seem excessive, and it probably is for most people. Please don't worry, because you will not be investing or trading that many stocks. This list offers a core group of stocks that you can use to monitor. In alphabetical order by symbol, the following individual stocks are on my watch list. Admittedly, many of these stocks are on the pricey side. Feel free to create your own list of stocks that fit into your comfort zone. Over time, the names will change. Keep an updated list with stocks that interest you. Some of the stocks on your list will have a high correlation with the stock market, i.e., the Dow, the S&P 500, and NASDAQ, and represent the core group of stocks that you will monitor. Note, to follow or monitor a stock requires a bit of work. That means frequently searching for news stories and making sure that you understand whether the news is important for the company's future. The list constantly changes. Consider your watch list as a starting point. As economic conditions change and the years go by, so will your stock list. Some stocks will decline in price or fall out of favor with institutions. New companies will emerge, and you may choose to include or exclude them from your list. Hint. Let's say someone gives you a tip about a hot stock he or she read about. Instead of immediately going to your brokerage account and buying the stock, start by adding the stock to your watch list. If the tipster is right, the stock price will move higher over time. If the tipster is wrong, the stock price will fall. Watch, but don't buy until you are certain the stock is a winner based on fundamental and technical analysis, which you will learn about later. Remind. R. Experienced traders and investors use scanning programs that are included in the brokerage software. With a scan program, you set the specific criteria you're looking for. As you gain experience, you will get a better idea of the criteria you want. How is the market doing? In addition to watching individual stocks, you should also be aware of how the overall market is performing. The financial world is obsessed with knowing how the market is doing. If you know people invested in the stock market, 
you may hear them talk about whether the market is up or down. Let's find out what they mean by the market. When people talk about the market, they are often referring to the Dow Jones Industrial Average DJIA, which is an index or basket of 30 large, well-known U.S. companies often referred to as blue chip stocks. The index is affectionately known as the Dow. By the way, many of the stocks in the Dow 30 are on my watch list above. The stocks in the Dow periodically change as the owners of the index, S&P Dow Jones indices, add or remove the stocks of individual companies. The owners have various reasons for adjusting the index, including removing a stock that no longer represents the leading industrial companies in the United States. Sometimes they remove a stock and replace it with another that more accurately reflects the current economy. Other major market indexes. S&P 500 and NASDAQ The Dow is not the only index worth following. Because the Dow created back in 1896 was the first index to track stocks, it is the most well known. Today, Hundreds of other indexes have been created to track everything from retail to utilities to technology stocks. Some sophisticated investors keep an eye on many of these indexes, but most individual investors watch the top three. After the Dow, the next most popular index is the S&P 500. The symbol for this index is SPX because it represents the entire U.S. stock market. If you guessed T. At this index contains 500 stocks, you are right. This index contains 500 stocks with the largest market capitalization. In other words, unlike the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is price weighted, each stock on the S&P 500 index is assigned a weighting based on its total market capitalization. Market capitalization i.e., market cap tells you how large a corporation is. It will be discussed in more detail in Chapter 10. The third most popular index is the NASDAQ Composite Index NASDAQ, which tracks all the stocks traded on the NASDAQ exchange. Wherever you see the Dow listed, you will almost always see the S&P 500 and NASDAQ below it. Other popular indexes are the Russell 2000 Index and the Wilshire 5000. Goal of the Pros Beat the indexes If you were a professional money manager, your goal would be to beat the major market indexes every year. What does this mean? It means that if the Dow or S&P 500 were to move higher by 15% this year, your portfolio would have to return more than 15%. Your year-end bonus depends on it. The bad news is that it is very hard for most people, even professional investors, to beat the indexes regularly. In fact, it has been reported that more than 80% of professional fund managers do not beat the indexes each year. In some years, only 15-20% to of professional managers and hedge funds beat the S&P 500 index, and in some stock categories such as the international, technology, and financial sectors even fewer beat the indexes. You can respond to this situation in several different ways. Some of you may think that if a professional manager can't consistently beat the indexes, then what are your chances? First, you could train yourself to do better than the pros, which is possible, but difficult. Second, you could invest directly in the indexes by buying exchange-traded funds, ETFs, and thus mimic the performance of the indexes rather than try to beat them. We will disc. SSETFs in more depth in Chapter 6. For many investors, matching rather than beating the performance of the indexes is a worthy goal. How to monitor the market The easiest way to discover for yourself how the market is doing each day is to sign into your brokerage account and look at your watch list. You can also look at the dozens of websites that provide stock quotes and financial news. In addition, every financial website, newspaper, and TV station provides quotes from the three main indexes. If the Dow or the other indexes are having a particularly good or bad day, it will be big news. Explore the brokerage software The watch list is just one part of the powerful software offered by your broker.
It's fun to examine all the tools and software and educational resources available to you, though you may find it overwhelming at first. Take the time to explore the software. Most brokerage software is easy to use, many with bells and whistles offering dazzling and powerful features that you may never use. You also have the opportunity to customize the software, for example, changing the font size or color scheme. You can alter the information displayed on your screen, such as whether it displays news about specific stocks. It's important to be familiar with the software before making a real trade. Hint. Before signing with a brokerage, experiment with the software to check whether the screens are easy to navigate. Some brokerages provide access to a simulated trading program or paper money account. If yours does not have this feature, there are a number of third-party websites that allow you to paper trade in a simulated account. I recommend paper trading before making your first, real, trade. How the Dow Jones Industrial Average was created in 1884, a reporter named Charles Dow calculated an average of the closing prices of 11 railroad stocks. His goal was to find a way to measure how the stock market did each day. He wrote comments ab. Oot the stock market in a four-page daily newspaper called a flimsy, which became known as the Wall Street Journal in 1889. A few years later, Charles Dow's company launched the Dow Jones Industrial Average with 12 industrial stocks. The average was calculated by adding all the prices of the stocks in the index and dividing that by the number of stocks, 12 at the time the average was created. The original 12 stocks in the Dow were the largest and most widely held companies at the end of the 19th century, American Tobacco, Distilling and Cattle Feeding, U.S. Leather, and General Electric, to name a few. Guess which stock still remains in the index? If you guessed, none, you are right. The other corporations either went out of business or merged with others. However, General Electric remained in the Dow until 2018, when it was booted out. By 1928 the Dow Jones Industrial Average had increased to 30 stocks, and it remains at 30 today, the reason the index is also called the Dow 30. These 30 stocks are a cross-section of the most important industrial sectors in the stock market. A sector is a group of companies in the same industry, such as technology, utility, energy, pharmaceutical, etc. The Dow is a price-weighted index, which means that stocks with a higher weighting affect the Dow index more than stocks with a lower weighting. For example, since Apple is weighted high in today's market, because of its high stock price, when its price falls by several points, the Dow is very likely to be lower for the day even when none of the other stocks decline by much. It's easy to see how the Dow performs each day, it's reported online, on TV, and just about everywhere else. Since more than half of the public is invested in the stock market, there is great interest in what the Dow does each day. By watching the Dow, you can get a general idea of how the market performed now and in the past. It also gives clues to the trend of he market. Higher, lower, or sideways the trend is simply the direction in which a stock or market is going. Therefore, when talking about the Dow, we're really talking about a representative group of 30 stocks. Even if the market declines, the stocks you own could be up, down, or flat for the day. Here is a current list of the 30 Dow stocks, including the ticker symbol. Note. It's possible that by the time you read this book, several Dow names will have changed. Over the long term, it's hard to go wrong buying some of the most widely held and successful stocks in the world.
3M, um, American Express, AXP, Amgen, AMGN, Apple, AAPL, Boeing, BA, Caterpillar, CAT, Chevron, CBX, Cisco Systems, CSCO, Coca-Cola, KO, Dow, Dow, Goldman Sachs Group, GS, Home Depot, HD, Honeywell International, Hun, Intel, INTC, International Business Machines, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, JNJ, JP Morgan Chase, JPM, McDonald's, MCD, Merck, MRK, Microsoft, Microsoft, MSFT, Nike, NKE, Procter & Gamble, PG, Salesforce, CRM, Travelers Companies, TRV, United Health Group, UNH, Verizon, VZ, Visa, V, Walgreens, Boots Alliance, WBA, Walmart, WMT, Walt Disney, Dis, Figure 3.2 is a photo showing stock quotes written by hand on a chalkboard at a brokerage firm, the way stock exchanges kept track of stock quotes before computers were invented. Figure 3.2 This photo, one that I own, shows the New York Stock Exchange quotations written on a blackboard at a brokerage firm in 1909. The brokers hired, board boys, to maintain the latest quotes on the wall-sized blackboard. The quotes were transmitted by a special telegraph, or stock ticker. Although the great inventor Thomas Edison wasn't the first to invent the stock ticker, in 1869 he made it a lot faster and more efficient. I hope that learning how to create a watch list was helpful to you. In the next chapter, I show you how to buy and sell stocks, the chapter many of you have been waiting for. Chapter 4 How Wall Street Keeps Score In this important chapter, you will learn how to keep track of how much money you made or lost in the stock market. Don't worry, the math is simple. Understanding how profits and losses are calculated is essential to your success as an investor or trader. You will also learn the point system that Wall Street uses to track stocks, and we'll discuss the main reasons why stocks go up or down, the answer may surprise you. The stock quote The stock quote is typically the first item you need before entering an order. As you already know, each stock has its own ticker symbol. If you aren't sure of the ticker symbol, type in the name of the company in the search box, and the symbol and quote will immediately be displayed. You must enter the proper symbol when making trades. Many people refer to a stock by its symbol rather than its full name. Once you begin trading or investing, you will easily memorize the stock symbols of your stocks. An example of a detailed stock quote for XYZ Manufacturing Company, not a real name, is shown in Figure 4.1. When you look at the quote, you see that the price of XYZ is $143.76 per share, that is the last price at which the stock traded. Figure 4.1 An example of a detailed stock quote. Source. Yahoo Finance. Before making that first investment or trade, it's important to check the stock quote. The more you understand how stock prices constantly change throughout the day, the easier it will be to buy stock for a competitive price. As you learned in the previous chapter, the stock quote includes basic information such as the ticker symbol, the latest stock price, the current bid-ask price, and today's volume. It also includes details such as the number of outstanding shares, market capitalization, 52-week high and low, ex-dividend date and dividend pay date, if any, and the stock's one-year price performance, which we will discuss in more detail in Chapter 10. If you don't know the current stock price, you can quickly find it online at your brokerage firm's website or at do. Ends of financial sites. You can also download apps for your mobile device that provide quotes. It's all about the points now that you have a general idea of the stock market, let's talk about money. Remember that we previously talked about shares of stock, which is another way of saying that you, share, in the success or failure of the company you own. You can buy any number of shares of stock, as many as you can afford. Each stock trades independently and has its own price, ranging from a few pennies these are called penny stocks to thousands of dollars per share. The stock prices are constantly changing. To measure gains and losses in the stock market, Wall Street uses the term points to represent $1 per share. 
Let's dig deeper into how to keep score tracking profit and loss for each trade or investment. For example, pretend you bought a stock for $20 per share. If the stock price increased to $25 per share, the stock went 5 points higher. Your scorecard would show a profit of $5 for every share owned. If your stock price rose from $10 to $11 per share, you earned 1 point or $1 per share. That's how we keep score on Wall Street. The same type of scorecard is kept for the major indexes such as the Dow, DJIA, NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. If the Dow rallied from 30,000 to 30,100, then we would say the market moved higher by 100 points. Hint. Although it's acceptable to tell people how many points you made or your percentage gain, it's not considered polite or wise to tell people how many dollars you made in the market. I'm not an etiquette expert, so use your own judgment. How much does a stock cost? If you can do the following calculation, then you can understand the numbers behind buying or selling stock. Because the market is an auction, every trade occurs at a specific price. That price changes frequently, several times per second for some stocks. Let's say you're interested in XYZ manufacturing company, and it's $20 per share. You decide to buy 100 shares. The math goes like this. 100 shares multiplied by $20 per share is $2. Zero, zero. This means that you must pay $2,000 to a stock seller who is anonymous. That cash is transferred through your brokerage firm, which acts as an intermediary. Another example. Let's say you want to buy 500 shares of a stock that is trading for $22 per share. How much will it cost? The answer is $11,000, 500x $22. Note. Remember that after you open a brokerage account, you deposit money to the broker, it's referred to as, funding your account. That money is placed in a cash or money market account until you need it to buy stock. When you're ready to buy, the broker automatically transfers the correct amount of money from the cash account to the stock account. Before the internet, you'd have to pay a commission for each transaction, but those days are gone, and good riddance. Now nearly all online brokerage firms charge zero commissions to trade stocks. However, check with your broker to make sure there are no additional fees. Note. Most stocks bought by retail investors range in price from $5 to $300 per share, and sometimes much higher. Nevertheless, it is a personal decision which stocks to choose and how much you are willing to pay. If you can't afford to buy 500 shares of a $300 stock, you can buy a number of shares that is affordable, from one share to as many shares as you want. How much did you earn, or lose? Obviously, the goal when participating in the stock market, and the reason you are reading this book, is to make money, for either the short term or long term. If you buy a stock and hold it for a long time period, months or years, you are an investor. If you buy a stock and sell it quickly, within the same day or within days or even weeks, you are a trader. As you will learn later in the book, you can be both, if you so choose. It's essential to track profits and losses. Investors should monitor their portfolio at least once per month or per quarter, while short-term traders should monitor their portfolio daily. Very short-term traders probably won't take their eyes off their trading screens. Let's say that you desi. E to buy 100 shares of a stock at $15 per share. You already know the cost is $1,500, 100x $15. If the stock goes to $16, you earn 1 point. If the stock goes to $17, you make 2 points. Here's the important point. If you own 100 shares of a $15 stock that increases by 1 point, you made $100 profit on paper. Therefore, the more shares of that stock you own, the more money you'll make. Another example. 
If you have 200 shares of that same $15 stock and the stock rises by 2 points, you made $400, 200 shares x 2 points. The opposite is also true. If you own 50 shares of a stock that you bought for $15 per share and it falls by 3 points, you have lost $150 on paper. Until you actually sell that stock, it is not a real loss, only a paper loss, but when you look at your account and see you are down by $150, you probably feel pain. That is why it is so important to choose stocks with the potential to move higher over the short or long term. Capital gains and losses When you buy stock whose value increases, the profits are called capital gains, which is the difference between your buy and sell prices. If you lose money, it is a capital loss. Very simply, you make money in the stock market by buying at one price and selling at a higher price. It's really that simple. Fortunately, when you buy stocks in corporations that do well, you should be rewarded with a higher stock price over time. However, there is no guarantee that any trade will make money. Even the stocks of good corporations can lose value and the stock price goes down sometimes. When participating in the stock market, there is always a risk you could lose money. How much is a stock worth? The stock price is actually a small piece of the puzzle that we call the stock market. Although you must know the current cost when trading, that doesn't tell you how much a stock is worth. After all, you don't want to buy a stock that is overpriced. Most importantly, the stock price doesn't tell you whether the stock is a good value or is trading at a fair price. That gives me the opportunity to pair if. Ace a quote by Oscar Wilde. People know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Your job as an investor is not to know just the stock price but also the value of a company. This is not always easy to determine. In chapter 14, I will show you how. Are you bullish or bearish? When you believe the market will improve in the future, you are said to be bullish about the market. Another way of putting it is that when you own stock, you are long the stock market or a specific stock. For example, if you buy shares of Apple at one price with a goal of selling at a higher price, you are bullish on Apple. On the other hand, there are some people who believe that certain stocks or even the entire market will sink. Those people are said to be bearish about the market. If you place a bet against a certain stock or the entire market, you are short the market. We will discuss shorting strategies later in the book. Many market participants try to identify whether the overall stock market is in a bull market or bear market. Let's discuss these terms in more detail. Bull market. When the market goes up bull markets are very profitable for most traders and investors. During a bull market, those who work on Wall Street are pleased because investors are gleefully putting more money into the market and money managers are receiving huge bonuses. Individual investors are delighted because the value of their 401ks and IRAs are rising, helping to create a wealth effect. Businesses are gratified because when consumers feel wealthier, they will spend more freely. In a long-lasting bull market, Everyone seems to be in a stock buying mood, often simply because everyone else seems to be buying. During these times, the major indexes seem to have nowhere to go but up. People are optimistic about their ability to get jobs, and there are many conversations related to the stock market, and a lot of know-it-alls are giving stock tips, which you should probably ignore. In the early 1920s, the bull market was fueled by the increased popularity of automobiles and electricity. I. The bull market of the 1990s, the widespread use of the internet and online shopping drove stock prices higher. At the beginning of the 21st century, after two stock market crashes, in 2001 and 2008, a bull market was fueled by a cooperative Federal Reserve, increased optimism about the world economy, and low interest rates. After the 2008 crash, interest rates were cut to historic lows, which created one of the greatest bull markets in history.
That bull market, beginning in 2009, seemed unstoppable, and even with a few hiccups along the way, it continued to move higher for the next 13 years. During lengthy bull markets, investors believe that the good times will last forever. You know it's a bull market when negative news is ignored while the market climbs higher. Investors buy stocks without a worry in the world. Their only fear is the fear of missing out on a continued rally. Note. Bull and bear markets are part of a market cycle. The market can't keep going up forever, nor will it go down forever. In the past, most bear markets have been relatively short, no longer than a year, while most bull markets have traditionally lasted three or four years, with a few notable exceptions such as the 2009 bull market. However, because every bull and bear market is different, it's impossible to predict exactly how long one may last. Bear markets. When stocks go down sometimes the market goes through a period of several months or longer when it keeps falling. This has happened a number of times in stock market history. When the stock market declines by more than 20%, it officially becomes a bear market. During this market decline, the major market indexes, the Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P 500, are plunging. To stop the bleeding, many investors panic and sell their stocks for whatever price they can get. Others may hold on, trapped and confused about what to do next. Sometimes but not always, the overall economy is weak during bear markets, and corporate earnings are also declining. A long-lasting bear market is pretty depressing for those who work O. Oh, Wall Street and anyone who owns stocks. Many people tend to avoid the stock market and put their money in cash, gold, or bonds. On Wall Street, the major brokerages stop hiring or lay off employees. When a company releases positive news during a bear market, stocks may remain unchanged or even drop in price. Since the stock market can sometimes predict what will happen to the economy, a lengthy bear market may signal that a recession is coming or has already arrived. No one can predict how long a bear market may last, although with a few notable exceptions, past bear markets have been relatively short. Note. A market correction occurs when the market moves much lower but declines less than 20%. What makes stocks go up and down? Why do stock prices go up and down? Generally, if there are more buyers than sellers, the stock price will move higher. If there are more sellers than buyers, the stock price will decline. This is Capitalism 101, the heart of our financial system. There is more to the stock market than just supply and demand, however. Stocks also move because of technical reasons, overbought or oversold fundamental reasons, for example, poor earnings from one major company can affect the entire market economic reasons, this could be inflation, deflation, or unexpected employment numbers positive or negative investor sentiment, whether investors are bullish or bearish about the stock market, and breaking news. Often, stock prices fluctuate based primarily on people's perceptions. This is why so many corporations spend money on advertising and on actions that bring them positive publicity. This is also why some shareholders send out emails or post messages in chat rooms to try to convince strangers to buy more stock. Stocks also go up or down depending on the mood of the country and the state of the economy. Once again, this is based on perception. If people believe that economic conditions are improving and the country is on the right track, they are more inclined to invest in the stock market. Conversely, if people are worried about the erection of the country, the economy, job growth, or the likelihood that we'll go into a recession, they are less likely to invest. Many times, the stock market rallies even when people are feeling gloomy about their finances, the economy is struggling, and the world is in turmoil. That is the power of a bull market, when the market tends to ignore all bad news. Unfortunately, if we are in a bear market, the market may react negatively to even good news.
Even though the economy may be improving, or will in a few months, the market continues to move south. Stock prices also shift based on the buying and selling activities of institutions such as mutual funds and pension funds. By the sheer volume of their trades, these institutions collectively have the power to move the markets. In addition, high frequency algorithms, also called algos, move the markets nearly every day by trading millions of shares of stock. With every rumor or important news story, these major players affect stock prices. One fact is certain no one can consistently predict what will happen next in the stock market. People can make educated guesses, but no one knows for sure. And yet each day someone appears on TV or on the internet to confidently explain why the market went up or down, and tell you which direction the market will go in the next few days or weeks. In reality, no one but fortune tellers can accurately forecast what will happen in the future. The Federal Reserve System a government group not to be ignored the Federal Reserve System, the Fed, is so powerful that anything it does influences the stock market. Formed in 1913, it is the central banking system of the United States. Often, when the members of the Federal Reserve Board, FRB, speak or act, it moves the stock market. The FRB, established in 1935 and appointed by Congress, is a seven-member group that directs the actions of the Federal Reserve System. The Fed has many duties, including monitoring the economy for problems, especially inflation or deflation, and controlling the country's money supply. It also has a powerful tool that directly affects the stock and bond markets, the ability to raise or lower interest rates. The Fed doesn't alter interest rates by flipping a switch. Instead, it either buys or sells billions of dollars worth of treasury securities, which allows it to adjust interest rates. Why is this so important? When the Fed lowers interest rates, it becomes cheaper to borrow money. With low interest rates, more people can afford to buy a house, and businesses can borrow to expand. Then they will need to purchase furniture household goods, and appliances. The more money consumers and businesses spend, the better it is for the economy. It is always a big deal when the Fed raises or lowers interest rates. The stock market may rally on news of a rate cut or fall on news of a rise in the rate. The market may move dramatically in advance of a Fed decision when a rate change is anticipated. There's an old saying, known by most investors, don't fight the Fed. When the Fed acts, it might not affect the stock market immediately, but after a few months or years, the actions of the Fed influence the market. There is something else you should know about the Fed. Technically, it isn't supposed to care about the stock market, and if you ask the board members, they will say that the market does not influence their decisions but it's an open secret that they do pay attention. For example, if the market is on the verge of crashing and the economy is teetering, the Fed may intervene with an emergency interest rate cut and buy massive amounts of longer-term bonds, a strategy known as quantitative easing. The bottom line, if you are participating in the stock market, pay attention to the Fed and the actions it actually takes or says it is prepared to take. Now that you know how Wall Street keeps score and how to calculate your gains and losses, it's time for you to do the important part, buy and sell stocks and other financial products. This is also when you need to pay close attention. Part 2 The Art of Buying and Selling In Part 2, you will learn how to buy and sell stocks and other financial products. As you will discover, the mechanics of buying and selling stocks is the easy part. The hard part is making profitable trades, and even more importantly, keeping the profits that you made. Usually, it's less stressful to be an investor than a trader. Investors buy stock and hold for a long time. Time is on their side, so most investors are in no rush to sell. Traders, on the other hand, must make split-second decisions, be unemotional about the trades they make, and thoroughly understand technical analysis. 
Trading is much more demanding. If you are new to the stock market, it's too early to decide whether you want to be a trader or investor. Many people do both. For now, keep an open mind as you learn all aspects of the stock market. Eventually, you will find which method works best for you. Now it's time to learn the most important part of the stock market, making trades. Chapter 5 Buying your first stock now that you have opened a brokerage account, or are thinking about it, and created a watch list, it's time to learn how to buy and sell stocks in your brokerage account. This is the exciting part. After all, brokerage firms have spent millions of dollars to make trading an uncomplicated experience. The challenge is earning profits, which you will learn to do later. In this chapter, I will show you the steps to take when buying your first stock. As you continue reading, you will learn in detail the language of the stock market. Let's begin by looking at the trading screens. Note. I urge you to read this entire book before you invest real money in the market. As you keep reading, you will learn about the importance of research and also how to analyze stocks using fundamental and technical analysis. If your broker has a simulated or paper money program, I urge you to make practice trades first before investing. The order entry screen to buy stocks online, begin by entering your user ID and password and sign into your account. The first screen you should see is an account overview, including your account balance and a list of your positions, the stocks you own, if any. To place a trade, on the front page of the brokerage software, Look for a list of financial products such as stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, and index funds. We will begin by buying stocks. We will discuss other products later. Action. Find the stocks tab and press the buy button. Some brokerage firms might first ask you to choose the trade tab rather than buy or sell. The buy order screen should look similar to the one shown in figure 5.1. In this example, I entered a limit order to buy 100 shares of YYYY at $45.51 per share. Figure 5.1 Buy Order Screen Source Interactive Brokers Client Portal Platform June 2021 Here is a brief description of the items on the buy order screen, not all of the items below are displayed in Figure 5.1 symbol. Carefully enter the correct stock symbol. If you enter the wrong symbol, you will buy the wrong stock. Fortunately, there is a preview button that allows such mistakes to be caught. Always double check the stock symbol to make sure you are buying the right stock. As another safety check, verify that the stock price is the same as the stock that you intend to buy. Action. Typically, there are drop down menus with Action, choices. The default T entry is buy, which is exactly what we want. If you click on the drop down list, you should see other actions, such as sell, sell short, and buy to cover. Your broker may have different labels. Because we're going to buy shares of stock YYYY, click on the buy button. Quantity. Select how many shares to purchase. For this order, we enter 100 shares. You may choose as many or as few shares as you like as long as you have enough money in the account. As you will learn later when we discuss risk, just because you have enough money to buy a lot of shares doesn't mean you should. Order type. You can enter a limit order or a market order. The limit order is executed only if it can be filled at your specified price or an even better price. In other words, it allows you to negotiate for the best possible price. A market order is filled immediately at the best available price, but often not at a competitive price. The primary reason for a market order is when you must make the trade immediately. I encourage you to almost always select a limit order because it gives you more control over your order. Bid price and ask price. When selecting a limit order, 
The computer screen displays the bid price, the highest price that anyone is willing to pay at the precise moment that you are viewing the quote, and the most current ask price the lowest price that anyone is offering to sell. Note. Understanding the bid and ask prices becomes easier as you make more trades. Think of the bid and ask prices as auction prices. Your goal is to try to buy at the best possible price, but much of the time you buy or sell at or near the bid or ask price. Don't worry if you don't think the current prices are favorable to you. They can change within seconds. Time in force. The default entry is, good for the day only. This means that the buy or sell order must be filled before the end of the day, or it is cancelled. That is not a problem. If you still want to trade this stock, you may enter the order again tomorrow. The other choice is, good, till cancelled, GTC. A GTC order stays open indefinitely, or until it is cancelled. New traders sometimes forget that they have a GTC order in place. To avoid this situation, for now, stick with the default entry, i.e., good for the day only. Stop order. A stop order, or stop loss order, is designed to limit losses if the stock is a loser. Or to lock in gains if the stock is a winner. A stop order is activated once the stock trades at the stop loss price or lower. Stop orders may be limit or market orders. It's easy to complete the entries on the buy order screen, but it's also very easy to make mistakes. Make sure you understand every item on the screen before making a real trade. As every trader knows, mistakes can cost you money. Your first trade it's important that you study the entry screen before investing. People often fail to spend enough time thinking about the entry price. They just want to buy quickly. If you don't buy at a good price, it becomes difficult to make a profit. That's why you must learn to do it correctly. You have already signed into your brokerage account. Now let's enter our first order and our first stock purchase. 1. In our example, you have $5,000 in the account and you want to buy 100 shares of YYYY, which last traded for $45.51 per share. The current bid ask price is $45.49, the bid price by $45.51 the ask price. Note that the ask price is always higher than the bid price. When buying, you will enter a price at or near the ask price the higher price. Note, keep in mind that the stock quote is just a quick snapshot in time. Just as for every stock, the price of YYYY frequently changes during the trading day. It moves higher or lower, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. It is not necessary to pay the ask price or to sell at the bid price. You may enter an order at any price that suits your needs. However, the further you move away from those bid ask prices, the less chance your order will be filled. 2. To buy YYYY immediately, you can pay the current ask price, which may be more than you prefer to pay. You can also try to buy at a lower price by entering a limit order and hope that it is filled during the day. It's important to make trades at good prices, even if it means waiting. The price paid for a stock is far less important to a long-term investor than it is for the short-term trader. 3. If you decide to buy YYYY at $45.51 per share, the cost is $4,551, 100 shares x $45.51 per share. The spread when it's time to trade, using limit orders often allows you to buy or sell stock at a price between the bid and ask prices. In the example above, the difference between the bid and ask prices is only a few pennies. That difference is called the spread. With many stocks, the spree. D is only a penny or two. On the other hand, illiquid stocks, stocks with low volume and not much trading activity, often have wider spreads, a nickel, a quarter, or even a dollar. Hint. When a stock has a wide spread, it's a red flag. 
A widespread makes the entire process costlier, because you must deal with that spread when buying, now, or selling, later. The narrower the spread, the better it is for investors and traders. Digging deeper. Market and limit orders Do you pay the highest price for your orders, or do you negotiate for a better price? In other words, what are the pros and cons of market orders and limit orders? Market order. Fast fills at a poor price If you prefer not to haggle over pennies per share, then a market order may meet your needs. Unfortunately, in a fast market, i.e., volatile or with a wild stock, market orders may be filled at a poor price. Executing market orders for stock is similar to paying the sticker price for a car, which means no negotiation. If you want the stock badly enough, you can pay the market price. Just know that you are paying a bit more because of your need for an instantaneous fill. If you are an investor who makes infrequent purchases, there is nothing wrong with occasionally placing a market order and getting filled quickly. But for those who hope to buy at the most competitive price, use the limit order. Limit order. Slower fills at more competitive prices because the stock market is an auction, you do not have to pay the highest advertised price. The limit order allows you to negotiate for a better price, but it may take extra time before it is filled. However, there is always the chance that you will not be able to complete the purchase, which is what happens when nobody wants to sell at your price. The advantage of a limit order is that you decide the price at which you want to buy or sell. Here's how the limit order works. Imagine the current quote for YYYY is $64.53 by $64.56 bid ask spread per share. Obviously, it would be great if you could pay less than $64.56. To do that, you could enter a buy order with a limit price of $64.54, which is between the bid and ask prices. If the stock trades at $64.54 during the day, then your order will be filled. It's possible the stock will not trade at your price anytime soon. Because the order is good for the day only, it expires at the end of the day. If you still want to buy YYYY at that price, you muse. Enter the order again tomorrow. Be aware that you will also always have the choice to immediately cancel the limit order and replace it with a different price. In the above example, if you want your limit order filled quickly, place a limit order at the current ask price, $64.56, it is extremely likely you will get filled at that price. The only exception would be if there was a fast market, where the price moved higher before your order hit the trading floor. In that case, you might have to enter a higher price to buy the stock. However, do not chase after the stock if it keeps rising. This is so important that I'll repeat it. Do not chase after stock prices. Note. When placing a limit order, there is a possibility that your order might take a few extra seconds or minutes to fill or not get filled at all. Don't let that deter you. If your adrenaline is pumping because you didn't get filled immediately, be patient. One of the keys to success in the market is to be unemotional when buying or selling. Limit orders mean control many investors like limit orders because this kind of order puts them in control of their transactions. Using the above example, you could enter a limit order for a much lower price, for example, $62. Because your bid price is outside the current market, it's possible that your order will go unfilled by day's end. If you are determined to buy stock at that lower price, you would have to enter the order again the next day, or opt to use a good, till cancelled order. Which is better? Limit order or market order? If you are new to the stock market, you probably want to know which is better, a limit order or a market order. Although market orders are filled quickly, speed is not important for a long-term investment although traders may still want a faster fill. For most investors, getting the best price is important. With limit orders, you have an opportunity to buy or sell at competitive prices. 
In my opinion, limit orders are usually better for investors and traders because they give you more control over your order. If you want to buy and have the order filled quickly, simply enter the current ask price as your limit. Now that you know all about limit and market orders, it's time to buy your first stock. Wait just a few more seconds. I have one more suggestion. Before you press the enter key, if you are a newcomer, start small, with a small amount of cash. At this STA, E of your education, preventing large losses is far more important than seeking big profits. Now is the time to learn. Begin with a reasonable sum, an amount that will vary for each person. The goal is to gain a great education at a low cost. After you have gained more experience and knowledge, you can increase the size of your investment. If you have access to a simulated or paper money account, practice in the test account before buying or selling. The more practice trades you make, the better. Practicing helps reduce mistakes as well as helps you become familiar with the brokerage software. Here's something else to think about. Expect to make mistakes. You are probably going to lose money when first entering the market. Start small, and practice. The focus of this book is on managing risk. Once you enter the stock market, risk is unavoidable. If you don't want to lose any money, invest in a money market fund or a savings account, where you are almost guaranteed not to lose money, though you won't earn much, either. Our goal is to try to find that happy medium where you take some risks for the chance to earn decent profits. It's a balancing act that nearly every investor and trader must accomplish. Now that the caveats are out of the way, let's buy your first stock. Press the enter key you have decided to buy 100 shares of YYYY, which is now trading at $45.51 per share, the ask price. You place a limit order to buy 100 shares of YYYY at $45.51. After you press the enter key, a review order screen appears. Review the information on the screen to make sure it is correct. If there are no errors, click on the Buy Order or Submit Buy Order tab, see Figure 5.1. Congratulations! You are now a stockholder. What happens to your order? After you press the Enter key, here is how your order is routed behind the scenes. If you choose to buy a stock that trades on the NYSE, the order is routed to a specialist on the exchange, who fills your order electronically. If you buy a NASDAQ listed stock, a market maker handles the order electronically. As an investor or trader, your major concern is that your order is executed quickly and at a reasonable price. Your broker sends the order to an exchange where the software finds the best price available, or holds the order until it can be filled. The best brokers are efficient during all market conditions. Using our example above, the brokerage firm automatically transf. RS $4,551.45.51 per share x 100 shares from your cash account to the trading account. You should receive online confirmation of the trade, if not, check to make sure your order was filled. Once you receive confirmation, you are a YYYY shareholder. Review. Manage the position to review. If YYYY goes up a point, you have a paper gain, real, but not yet realized, of $100. Once the stock is bought, your job is to manage that position, and that means keeping an eye on it and deciding whether the position still belongs in your portfolio. You made the buy decision. Periodically, you must make the hold or sell decision. If you are a long-term investor, you will probably pay less attention to how the stock price fluctuates each day unless you want to do so. On the other hand, a short-term trader must pay much closer attention to stock prices because taking profits and cutting losses is what makes this person successful. After you buy your first stock if this is the first stock you bought, it's an exciting feeling. Picking the right stock at the right time can generate profits. 
By participating in the market, you will learn how to use money to make more money. This is the purpose of investing. One of the great things about the stock market is that while you are at work or on vacation, your money is working for you. The longer you hold your investments, the more that compound interest works on your behalf. Over time, if you have chosen the right investments, you should be very pleased with the results. Note, interest can be calculated in one of two ways, as simple or as compound. Compound interest involves reinvesting your earnings including dividends, sometimes referred to as making interest on interest. It has helped many investors build wealth over the long term. As I've mentioned before, buying stocks is easy, holding on to your gains is challenging. The hardest part for many people is to avoid the temptation to spend that money paying bills or going on vacation. Note, before buying your next stock, think about this. Sometimes the smartest action you can take is not buying a stock immediately. Take the time to analyze before buying. Fortunately, the stock market will always be there for you, and so will the stock you want to buy. Question from a reader. What happens if no one wants to buy my stock? I received this excellent question from a concerned reader. I told her not to worry. The stock exchanges. Avenue a system in which there is always someone who acts as an intermediary for each stock. After buying, your order is routed to a specialist if the stock trades on the NYSE, or to a market maker if the stock trades on the NASDAQ who fills your order electronically. In the old days, people used to fill orders manually. Once trading volume increased from hundreds to billions of shares per day, computers were installed to handle the order flow to make sure the market was orderly. Ironically, the NASDAQ was originally set up as a computerized stock exchange when it was created in 1971. The job of these intermediaries is to provide liquidity in the marketplace. This is a way of describing how easy it is to buy or sell a stock. The more liquidity, the better it is for buyers and sellers. When there are no buyers, or too few buyers, the specialist or market maker steps in and buys for his or her account. Specialists or market makers have a responsibility to maintain a fair and orderly market, though there is no requirement that they have to buy the stock at a price that is bad for them. The main point is that someone is always willing to buy or sell your stock. Before the market opens you just learned how to buy your first stock, so congratulations. Before you learn how to sell a stock, I want to let you know about a time period that is very important, called the pre-market. Believe it or not, there are traders, often professionals, who trade before the official market opens each day. The pre-market the market officially opens weekdays at 9.30 a.m. E.T. However, traders and investors can enter orders before the opening bell. Even though it is not difficult to do so, trading during the pre-market, also referred to as the after-hours market, is not recommended for beginners, the chances of losing money are high. Why? Because the bid-ask price is offered during off-hours are often less than desirable. In fact, trading in the pre-market, or after-hours market, is more like the Wild West than a stock market. I recommend that if you plan to trade, do it during the regular market hours between 9.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. E.T. if in the United States. A main problem with trading in the pre-market is that trading volume is thin. In the regular market, Several billion shares are traded during each day, but only thousands are traded after hours. When volume is low, it means there is a lack of liquidity. When you hear traders t. lk about liquidity, it's another way of saying that it is easy to buy or sell shares of stock. When you buy or sell stocks, you want liquidity. A stock without liquidity may be easy to buy but more difficult to sell at a price that is good for you. Note, trading low-volume stocks, and especially low-liquidity stocks, can cause strange things to happen to prices. If you are unfamiliar with after-hours trading, 
Here is an unbreakable rule. Never enter a market order after hours, because you may get a terrible fill. Trading after hours is a tricky business, and my advice is to avoid trading during those hours. Trade during the regular market hours when volume and liquidity are strong. Studying the futures quotes before the market opens, experienced professionals make a lot of trades. They often buy and sell the major market index futures such as the S&P 500 SPX. These traders influence the direction of the market before its official opening time. This means that before the market opens you will be able to see quotes for the futures market and learn in which direction the market will open. If you type stock futures in your search engine you will be directed to financial websites that show the direction of the major market indexes websites such as cnn business yahoo finance google finance marketwatch cnbc and bloomberg will appear with news and quotes for the futures market your brokerage firm will also provide up-to-date futures quotes on your screen and if it doesn't contact your broker to get access at least 30 minutes to an hour before the market opens, look at the stock quotes on your watch list. The pre-market quotes for the stocks on your list appear. Those quotes provide important clues to whether the market will rise or fall at the open. There is no guarantee these quotes will remain for very long since stock prices constantly change both before and after the market opens. When you look at the futures quotes of individual stocks or the indexes, you can see whether the market is expected to open higher, lower, or flat. The market tends to open in the same direction as the futures market, but not always. Congratulations for learning how to buy your first stock. That was the easy part. Now that you have a better idea of how to buy stocks, you will learn how to buy mutual funds and ETFs. Believe it or not, these products are even easier to buy than stocks. Chapter 6 ETFs, Index Funds, and Mutual Funds In this chapter, you will learn how to buy and sell ETFs, index funds, and mutual funds. These products are easier to understand and trade than individual stocks, and because of the power of diversification, they are often less risky to own than stocks. Those who buy ETFs, index funds, and mutual funds are instantly diversified, one of the secrets of stock market success. One poorly performing stock in a mutual fund won't be harmful to your portfolio, because buying a fund represents a basket of stocks rather than owning only one or two. This is one reason why these financial products have exploded in popularity over the last few decades. Mutual funds. A convenient way to buy stocks for many investors, investing in mutual funds is an excellent idea. Instead of picking individual stocks, you allow a professional money manager to make the decisions for you. It works like this. An investment company creates a mutual fund by pooling investors' money and using that cash to invest in an assortment of stocks, bonds, and fixed income. Investing in a mutual fund is similar to hiring your own money manager, buy and sell decisions are left to the professionals. Mutual fund managers plan to invest in stocks they believe will outperform the market, and that means outperforming market indexes. The disadvantage is that you have to pay an annual fee for the fund manager's expertise ranging from a puny 0.05% of assets invested to a mind-boggling 10% for some specialized funds. There are mutual funds for every conceivable strategy or industry. For example, some mutual funds invest in stocks this kind of fund is called a stock fund, or in sectors such as technology, a technology fund others invest in bonds, a bond fund international stocks, an international fund, or gold, silver, and soybeans, a commodity fund. Some mutual funds provide alternative products such as investments that sell stocks short profiting when the market declines. Others trade both sides of the market by owning long and short positions. No matter what kind of investment you're interested in, there is a mutual fund that meets your needs.
Mutual funds may be the answer for people who don't have the time, knowledge, or interest in researching individual companies. For example, if you want to invest in growth stocks or value stocks and don't want to find them on your own, you can invest in a growth or value mutual fund. This is one of the reasons that mutual funds have become so popular. For a minimum investment of a few hundred dollars though some mutual funds have higher minimums, such as $2,500, you can buy a slice of a basket of stocks. Your brokerage firm has a list of all the mutual funds you can buy. There are as many mutual funds as there are stocks. Each mutual fund has its own style and strategy, and finding a quality mutual fund can be almost as time-consuming as finding individual stocks. There are two types of mutual funds, load and no load. A load fund has extra sales charges and management fees, so it's more expensive. That's acceptable if the fund is truly a good performer. A no-load fund is less costly because it has no sales charges and reduced management fees. You are allowed to select any fund you want, and there are thousands of choices. You can do a search of the highest rated or largest mutual fund companies. Look for ratings of mutual funds by independent sources such as Barron's, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Bankrate, Kiplinger's, and Morningstar. Morningstar http colon slash slash www.morningstar.com is an excellent resource for anything related to mutual funds. It provides detailed information about each fund, a rating, and the fund objective. In my opinion, you're better off investing in a no-load mutual fund or a fund with very low fees. Why? Because it's exceedingly difficult for funds with high fees loads to outperform the major market indexes when saddling investors with excessive expenses. Before buying any mutual fund, however, look at how it performed in the past. There is no guarantee that a fund's performance record will be repeated in the future, though it is not a bad idea to buy funds that have consistently done well over many years. If looking for no load funds, there are hundreds of fund families to choose from. Be sure to do your research before buying. No matter what fund you choose, if you don't like the fund's results, you can easily switch to another mutual fund, but first you must hold the position at least 30 days, or long enough to avoid a redemption fee. Net Asset Value Calculating mutual fund profits and losses The value of each mutual fund share is based on the closing prices of each of the stocks in the fund's portfolio. The total value of the fund is calculated by multiplying the value of all the stocks in the fund's portfolio by its corresponding number of shares plus any cash on hand minus any liabilities. This gives a net asset value, or NAV. A net asset value is the value of one share of the fund, similar to the value of a single share of stock. NAV is calculated only once per day based on closing prices, and can be found on your brokerage trading screen, online at any quote screen, or on Morningstar's website. Mutual fund owners tend to invest a specific dollar amount rather than buy a specific number of shares. For example, if you have $200 and want to buy shares of ABC Mutual Fund with a $10 NAV, the order is placed to buy $200 worth of the fund. Use the buy screen to complete the purchase. As soon as you press the confirm button, your broker transfers cash from your account to the mutual fund. Because today's closing price is not yet known, the purchase is made after the market closes at 4 p.m. ET. In this example, the next day you will be the owner of approximately 20 shares of mutual fund ABC. The exact number of shares is displayed in decimal format, and depends on the actual closing price. Thus, if ABC fund closed at $10.04, you would own $200 divided by $10.04, or 19.92 shares. The number of shares owned is not important when owning mutual funds, it's more important to keep track of the value of the shares. To evaluate past performance, 
the software can display how your fund performed during various time periods, from yesterday to a year ago or longer. Note. It's easiest to buy mutual funds, or other financial products, through your brokerage firm. You can also buy mutual funds by writing a check to the funder through a company payroll plan that automatically takes money out of your paycheck every month, or two weeks. Most large companies offer their employees the ability to invest in mutual funds, and other financial products, through tax-advantaged accounts like a 401k. Limitations of mutual funds Because they have professional managers, mutual funds are expected to outperform the market averages. However, these funds are far from perfect. According to reports, at least 80% of mutual fund managers fail to beat the index averages each year. When you add in sales loads, it's even harder for many managers to beat the indexes consistently. As mentioned earlier, many mutual funds charge a redemption fee if you sell the shares within 30 days of purchase. Mutual funds are designed for investors and not traders, and many funds penalize investors when they sell too soon. Mutual funds. LSO aren't ideal for investors looking for larger profits. If you are a trader who seeks huge gains, then you might not be satisfied with a relatively small daily gain. For example, if you owned shares of Apple and it went up 5% in one day, you would make approximately 5% that day. But if you owned shares of a mutual fund that owned Apple, instead of the 5% gain you hoped for, you may make no more than 1 or 2% profit on the fund that day. For that reason, no matter how well the mutual fund may perform on that day, it can never rise, in percentage terms, by as much as the best performing stock in the portfolio. The bottom line, if you seek large daily gains that come from owning shares of high-performing stocks, mutual funds may not be for you. The advantage of owning a basket of stocks instead of one is that the risk of loss is diminished, in exchange for more modest returns. Buying ETFs a clever way to increase profits similar to mutual funds, exchange-traded funds ETFs, have boomed in popularity in recent years, and for good reason. ETFs consist of a basket of securities that track a specific index or sector. Although ETFs are designed like a mutual fund, there is one huge difference. An ETF trades like a stock, you can buy and sell it whenever the market is open. There are thousands of ETFs, and new ones are created each year. The most popular ETFs are those that track the major stock indexes such as SPY, tracks the S&P 500, QQQ, NASDAQ 100, IWM, Russell 2000, and DIA, Dow Jones Industrial Average. You can also find ETFs that follow industry sectors such as semiconductor, oil, technology, retail, and pharmaceutical. You can buy fixed income ETFs, which include mostly bonds and treasuries. There are also international ETFs that track the stock market of almost any country in the world. For example, if you wanted to invest in or trade a group of stocks based in Germany, you could buy a German ETF. The benefit of ETFs is obvious. Instead of buying a group of stocks in a certain index, sector, or country, you can buy the entire basket of stocks, it contains dozens and sometimes hundreds or thousands of securities with a single trade or investment. This gives you instant diversification, one of the most important methods for reducing risk by not putting all your eggs in one basket. It would be too difficult for a single investor to track and own every individual stock in a specific sector or index. If you think, that ETFs sound like a good idea, they are. They are easy to trade whenever the markets are open, and annual expenses are very small. Because ETFs can be held for the short or long term, you can create a basket of ETFs that meets the needs of any strategy. Your brokerage firm has a list of all available ETFs. The risks of ETFs ETFs have the same risks and rewards as owning stocks does. In other words, if the price of the ETF declines, you will lose money.
Imagine that you buy a technology ETF, and that later the technology sector sinks. That means most or all of the stocks in that sector will move lower, some more than others. If you own that ETF, you will lose money for as long as the technology sector remains weak. Warning. Leveraged ETFs There is one kind of ETF that takes risk to a whole new level. Leveraged ETFs. As you know, if you buy an ETF, it is correlated to the index or sector on a one-to-one -one basis. These are the traditional non-leveraged ETFs discussed in this book. On the other hand, a leveraged ETF is designed to give you two or three times the return of the underlying index. Unfortunately, it usually doesn't work that way. For example, let's say that you buy a leveraged ETF that allows you to profit when the S&P 500 rises. Instead of making a gain of 1% if the S&P 500 rises by 1%, you could make 2 or 3%. You may be thinking, this is great. I can double or triple my returns. Unfortunately, because of complex calculations and tracking errors, when an ETF deviates from its benchmark, even when the underlying index rises, you could lose money, especially if you hold longer than one day. Leveraged ETFs are primarily aimed at day traders, and for that reason alone, I recommend against buying them. There are plenty of non-leveraged ETFs that can meet your needs without venturing to the extra risky side. Index funds. If you can't beat them, join them. Index funds are constructed to use money pooled by investors to buy a basket or a group of stocks to track a specific index. The idea behind owning index funds is that since it is so difficult to outperform the indexes, you may as well buy them directly. Index funds have no active manager who makes buy and sell decisions. Unlike active fund managers, whose goal is to beat the market, an index fund manager tries to match the index as closely as possible. For example, if the S&P 500 is ahead by 10%, then the S&P 500 index fund returns very near that 10p. R cent. Buying index funds is referred to as passive investing. Index funds are less expensive to own than mutual funds because there is no active fund manager. There are also no sales charges, and expenses are much lower. For these reasons, index funds are extremely popular. Because they are designed to match the market, they do well during bull markets and poorly during bear markets. If you don't want to take time to investigate individual stocks, then index funds may be the right product for you. There are two types of index funds, an index ETF and an index mutual fund. Index ETFs Because an index ETF is an exchange-traded fund, it can be traded during the day, just like a stock. As mentioned earlier, the most popular index ETFs are SPY, QQQ, DIA, and IWM, but there are many more. Just like other ETFs, index ETFs provide instant diversification and narrow bid-ask spreads, and their costs are low. There are also index ETFs that track sectors, asset classes, and foreign markets e.g., Europe ETFs, Brazil ETFs. Index mutual funds Just like an index ETF, an index mutual fund has low expenses, instant diversification, and low portfolio turnover, the stocks in the indexes are rarely changed. You can buy index mutual funds from your brokerage or directly from the mutual fund company. The main difference between an index ETF and an index mutual fund is that an index ETF can be traded during market hours, but an index mutual fund can only be bought and sold at the end of the day. Most mutual fund companies require a minimum investment, typically $2,500 to $3,000, while an index ETF has no minimum investment. Popular index mutual funds include the Vanguard 500 Index Fund Investor Shares, BFINX, Fidelity 500 Index Fund, FXAIX, and the Schwab S&P 500 Index Fund, SWPPX, but there are hundreds more. The Vanguard 500 Index Fund 
created by John Bogle, was the world's first index fund. Note. Because an index ETF and an index mutual fund are so similar, moving forward I will refer to these products as, index funds. Choose the product that is best for your needs. Getting started in the stock market using index funds as I was writing this book, one of my friends called to ask how to get started in the stock market. He said he didn't have the time to pick stocks and wanted to know what to buy. I told him to do the following. 1. Open an account with a brokerage firm. 2. Invest at least $100 into an index fund that matches the performance O. The S&P 500. If you are new to the stock market, buying a low expense index fund is an excellent place to get started. You can always pick individual stocks later. 3. Here is the hard part. Get in the habit of investing $100, or any amount that is comfortable for you, every month into the same, or another, index fund. 4. Buy and hold the index fund indefinitely. When the market is lower, you will be buying additional shares at a lower price. When the market is higher, you will be buying at a higher price and get fewer shares. As long as the market moves higher over time, then this strategy, dollar cost averaging, works. 5. As your income increases over time, increase the monthly investment. Get in the habit of paying yourself first by buying an index fund. As the market continues to move higher, so will the value of your index fund. Dollar cost averaging involves investing an equal amount of money over regular time periods, such as monthly. It is one of the easiest ways to enter and participate in the stock market. This strategy is designed to reduce the volatility of your account by spreading purchases over long time periods. Dollar cost averaging makes more sense than dumping all your money into an index or any investment at one time i.e. lump sum because it allows you to invest at both low and high price points. Profits from dollar cost averaging tend to outperform lump sum investing. Most importantly, by using this strategy, you avoid mistimed entries, which reduces anxiety and other emotions. Dollar cost averaging will be explained in more detail in Chapter 8. Why index funds are not for everyone One of the potential risks of dollar cost averaging into index funds is lengthy bear markets. Although we've had several bear markets, the longest bear market in history lasted almost three years, from 1929 to 1932, note that there is some dispute among historians on the precise length. By the time it bottomed, the market had lost 89% of its value, from its peak. Although index funds were not available at that time, if they had been available, it may have taken decades to earn back the lost money. Put another way, there is no downside protection when you own index funds. For some people, another negative to buying index funds is that you may find it boring. If you are looking for fast profits, this easy and slow-moving strategy may be unappealing. Nevertheless, it isn't boring to make money. That is why even TRA. Earth should set aside some money to put into a, dull, index fund. Participating in the stock market with a 401k or IRA One of the easiest ways to invest in mutual funds or index funds in the United States is through a 401k, a voluntary tax-deferred savings plan offered to employees by many companies. The popular 401k plan is a key reason that so many people are involved in the stock market. The advantage of 401ks is that tax does not have to be paid until the cash is withdrawn at age 59 and a half or older. And if you change jobs, the 401k can be rolled over, or it can be converted to an IRA individual retirement account, another type of tax-deferred savings plan. It is important to note that 401k and IRA rules are complex and do change occasionally, so seek professional tax advice before participating or making any changes to these plans. It is my opinion that if you have the opportunity to participate in a 401k or an IRA, do so.
Many companies match your contributions up to a specified limit, taxes are deferred, and the plans offer many investment choices, including mutual funds and index funds, and some plans even offer individual stocks. I want to help you understand the stock market and make better investment choices. Participating in an employer-sponsored 401k or IRA is definitely one of those good choices. Interview with John Bogle I was fortunate to have interviewed the late John Bogle several times over the years. John Bogle was the founder and former CEO of the Vanguard Group, Inc. As noted earlier, he created the world's first index fund, and he was a huge proponent of this product. Sincere. When did you first come up with the idea of buying index funds? Bogle. It goes back to 1951, when I was at Princeton University. I wrote my senior thesis on the mutual fund industry. I examined many funds and studied their data. From my research, which I admit was somewhat superficial, I concluded that it was difficult, if not impossible, for mutual funds to consistently outperform the market averages. For me, that's where it began. Sincere. How did you start the first index fund at Vanguard? Bogle. By the time Vanguard started in 1974, we were in an ideal position to bring out the world's first index fund. I was inspired by a 1974 article in the Journal of Portfolio Management by economist Paul Samuelson, who was one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. He challenged anyone to find brute evidence that acti E managers can beat the market. He pleaded for the creation of an index fund. In 1975, my first major business decision at Vanguard was starting the world's first index mutual fund, and Dr. Samuelson was my greatest supporter. He followed up by writing a four page article in Newsweek in which he said that his prayers were answered. It was important for me to have his support. Sincere. Did the mutual fund industry follow your lead? Bogle. Not at first. There was a poster circulating around Wall Street that said, index funds are un-American. The mutual fund industry didn't understand why anyone would want to be average. Also, most people in the industry were not looking to lower costs for investors, Rather, their goal was to increase revenues for mutual fund management companies by gathering assets and raising fees. It wasn't until the 1990s that index funds started to grow. Sincere. Why do you like indexing? Bogle. Index funds take the cost out of the system and guarantee investors their fair share of stock market returns. It's simple, although for some people it might be boring. Sincere. What do you think about index ETF funds? Bogle. I don't know if I approve or disapprove. If you were to buy an ETF such as SPY, SPDRS and P500, or BTI, Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF, there is no reason why you can't buy and hold. The cost of holding an ETF and what I call a traditional index fund is about the same. The difference is that with an ETF, you can trade all day long, which you cannot do with a traditional index fund. So we must ask ourselves this question, is that an opportunity or a curse? I would say it's a curse. The idea of trading, all day long, in real time, is just silly. Sincere. You believe strongly in buy and hold. What if you see a bear market coming? Should you still hold? Bogle. Yes. First, you should be properly diversified, and your asset allocation must be right. 60% stocks and 40% bonds is a good place to start. If you see a bear market developing in advance, you must get out at the height of the market and jump back when it hits its lows. But I don't know anyone who can tell you precisely when a bear market is going to begin, and I certainly can't tell you when it's going to end. That means you have to be right twice. The chances of that are so small that you should just stick to your long-term investment plan. It's great advice to tell me to get out of stocks before a bear market.
But can you drop me a note when it's time to get back in? I think investors should stay the course whether it's a bear market or not. Don't try to outsmart the market. Sincere. What do you suggest? Bogle. Don't pay too much attention to the daily gyrations of the stock market. If you have a diversified portfolio with low costs, simply stay the course. Yes, you would have been right if you got out at the high and back in at the low, but not only do I not know anybody who actually did so, I don't know anyone who knows anyone who did it. Sincere. How should someone start with an index fund? Bogle. If you get out of college and are able to put a couple of hundred dollars away in an index fund, which is the only intelligent choice, you'll learn how markets work. You'll learn what happens when prices go down and learn about the wisdom of a buy and hold strategy. Don't try to time the market. Simply stick to a disciplined, long-term investment strategy. Invest whatever you can afford to save every month, and don't worry about what the market is doing. It doesn't matter. When the market suffers a 50% drop, people panic and think about getting out. Their emotions lead them in the wrong direction. Don't fall for that trap. Simply continue to invest every month without worrying about the momentary movement of stock prices. Just look at the quarterly statements, and over the course of an investment lifetime, you'll be overwhelmingly satisfied with your returns. You'll see that you fared much better than most other people who let their emotions get the better of them. Sincere. Should you ever sell? Bogle. Gradually, as you get into your 30s and 40s and you have more money at stake, you should begin to diversify some of your assets in equity index funds and invest in a bond index fund. You want to change your allocation gradually by reducing your stock portfolios and building your bond position. Historically, bond index funds have generally had higher yields than stock index funds, although that will not always be the case. Sincere. Should investors buy and hold individual stocks? Bogle. If you are one of those rare, fortunate people who know how to pick winners, by all means you should definitely buy good stocks and forget indexing. But I don't know how to do that. The record is quite clear that, in many cases, what we thought were good stocks can turn out to be disasters. Look at it this way. People like to gamble. And investors are no exceptions. The math is the same on Wall Street as it is in Las Vegas. You bet on red, someone else bets on black, but in the long run, only the house wins. And Wall Street, the croupier in the middle, doesn't care what you do as long as you do something. Sincere. What about investors who think they can beat the market? Bogle. First, you should create a long-term investment portfolio with an appropriate mix of stock and bond index funds. This is your serious money account. It's the money you need for retirement. That should be 90 to 95% of your investable assets. It is very boring to watch but exciting when you are ready to retire. Take the other 5% of your assets and use it as funny money. I recommend creating a separate account for your funny money, and you can trade in that account to your heart's content. Many people have a gambling instinct, and in this account, you can trade individual stocks. After five years, check out the returns and see if you actually beat the market. Did you? I think the chances are not quite zero, but maybe one or two percent, that you did. Sincere. Why doesn't everyone buy index funds? Bogle. The idea of indexing is somewhat counterintuitive. It's the idea that no one is consistently better than the index. If you get a salesperson that says you shouldn't believe the index fund bonk, that his or her fund is better, it can be hard to resist. But the person doesn't tell you that many active fund companies switch managers often. When you include all the additional expenses incurred by actively managed funds, what are the chances that all these asset managers can beat the market? I would say it's not zero, but maybe 0.0001%.
But asset managers are great marketers, and they focus only on those funds that beat the market. Sincere. Any final advice? Bogle. In the long run, investment return is driven by economics, not emotion. Corporate value increases over time through dividend payments and earnings growth. In the very long run, stock market returns equal corporate returns. In the short term, all bets are off. Now that you have learned about buying mutual funds, ETFs, and index funds, it's time to learn how to sell your first stock. Although it's much more enjoyable to talk about buying, it's essential that you also learn about how and when to sell. After all, selling is a lot more involved than many people realize. Chapter 7 Selling Your First Stock Most people prefer to think about buying stock rather than selling. After all, it's a lot more pleasant to dream about all the money you can make if you choose the right stock or ETF. However, if you want to become a successful investor, at some point it's essential to learn everything you can about selling your positions. It's not difficult to sell a stock, the hard part is selling at a price that is beneficial to you. No matter when you sell, you often get the feeling that you could have done better. For example, if you sell too soon, you might kick yourself for losing out on potential profits. There is a lingering feeling that if you had held the stock longer, you, could have, made more money. On the other hand, if you wait too long to sell, Sometimes a winning stock or ETF position turns into a loser, painful to both your account and ego. Most beginners don't realize that selling is one of the most challenging parts of trading and investing. Why sell a stock? Simply put, you sell stocks or other financial products to lock in profits or to reduce losses. When your investment target has been reached, there may not be any reason to continue to own the shares. On the other hand, when you sell a stock for a loss, you are admitting you made a mistake. Most people don't like to admit they were wrong, but accepting losses is an essential part of your investment experience. Most importantly, underperforming stocks do not belong in your portfolio. Unless you have a real reason for believing the market has mispriced the shares, it's time to move on. Disciplined traders and investors learn that when an investment or trade is not working as expected, it needs to be sold or replaced. It's better to take a small loss now rather than taking a much bigger loss later. Conversely, if you made so much money on a stock you are giving high fives to your friends and family, that's a red flag, and you may want to think about selling something soon. It's easy to lose big winners, especially if you are inexperienced. Another reason people sell is that they don't want too much cash tied up in one position. That's why many people use asset allocation, a strategy we will discuss in Chapter 10. Note. Traders sell more quickly than investors, but even investors should not hold indefinitely. Even S. OCKS in the best companies decline over time. Perhaps the products they sell lose popularity, or there is mismanagement, but stocks fall for a variety of reasons. Take a look at what happened to Sears, Kmart, Lehman Brothers, and a whole slew of other previously successful companies. Selling stock. Step-by-step instructions Now let's discuss the step-by-step procedures for selling a stock or ETF. To refresh your memory, in Chapter 5, we bought 100 shares of YYYY at $45.51 per share, which is now 2.11 points higher at $47.62 per share. Since we own 100 shares, our gain is $211, 2.11 point gain x 100 shares. The profits are real, but the gains are unrealized until the shares are sold. To sell this stock, first bring up the sell order screen, which should look similar to what figure 7.1 shows. In this example, I entered a limit order to sell 100 shares of YYYY at $47.62 per share. Figure 7.1 sell order screen. Source. Interactive brokers. 
Client Portal Platform, June 2021. As you see, the sell order screen is nearly identical to the buy order screen shown earlier in Chapter 5. Let's briefly review the different items on the sell order screen. Some items below are not displayed in Figure 7.1. Symbol. Enter the correct ticker symbol in the symbol box. Hint. Make sure that the name of the stock is listed in the symbol box. When selling, also be certain that you own the stock before trying to sell. If you sell a stock that you don't own, you would be adopting a slightly risky strategy called selling short discussed in Chapter 18. Selling short is not a strategy recommended for most beginners. Action. Choose. Sell order. From the drop-down menu, your screen may have a different label such as, sell. There are other choices, but second on the list should be, sell. Quantity. Type in the number of shares you want to sell. For this order, enter 100 shares, because that is how many shares are owned. You can enter any quantity of shares as long as it does not exceed the amount that you own. Order type. Select limit order from the drop-down menu. As you may recall from Chapter 5, you can enter a limit or market order. I recommend using a limit order, which means that you are negotiating for a better i.e., higher price. Just because you wish to sell at the highest possible price dosen. T mean that others will be interested in buying. The market determines prices, and if you want to see your order filled, make sure to choose a competitive price. A market order will be filled immediately, but it may not be at a price that is best for you. The ability to select your own prices is why limit orders are a better choice. Note, the only time to use a market order is when you need the stock to be sold, right now. Typically, there is little need to do this. Time in force. The default entry is, good for the day only, which means you direct the computer to sell your stock the same day. Another choice is, good, till cancelled, or GTC, this order is held indefinitely until the order is cancelled or completed. This is a personal choice. Your first sale the most difficult part of selling is getting an acceptable price. It takes skill to sell stock and exit with a decent profit when right, or with a small loss when wrong. One way to improve your negotiating skills is to practice in a simulated or test program. Read the sidebar at the end of this chapter for more information on using paper money programs. Bid and ask prices The bid and ask prices are displayed on the trading screen, for example, $47.62 by $47.64. When selling, you will typically sell at a price at or near the bid price, i.e., the lower price. Although it would be ideal if you could sell at the highest price, i.e., the ask price that seldom happens unless more buyers appear. If you choose to sell, at the market, with a market order, you will be filled at the current bid price. Remember, the market is similar to an auction with stocks as the main product. As with any auction, try to buy at the lowest price and sell at the highest. Calculating gains or losses. Use simple math as you remember, you had previously bought 100 shares of YYYY at $45.51, which cost a total of $4,551. When looking at the quote screen, you may notice that the price of YYYY is constantly changing. At other times, the price may hold steady for a while. In this example, we decided to sell our stock and lock in the gains. Sure, we could hold longer, seeking additional gains, but those gains may not appear, at least immediately. Let's review how much we made on this trade. The math is simple. We bought YYYY at $45.51, and now see that it has risen to $47.62 per share. We plan to sell at that price. Therefore, the profit equals $47.62 minus $45.51, or a gain of 2.11 points per share. 
Since we owned 100 shares, the net gain is $211. That may not seem like much money, but it is a 4.6% gain. This is the enjoyable part, calculating how much profit you're going to make. The more shares you own, the greater the profit. As you gain trading experience, you can always increase or decrease the number of shares traded or the amount of money invested. In this example, you have a $211 gain. Do you sell quickly and lock in the gain? Or do you wait longer and attempt to make even more money? Traders tend to have a profit target and sell quickly when it is achieved. Investors hold for much longer and periodically decide whether the stock is worth holding. But what if you have losses? Do you wait and hope for the stock price to recover, or do you sell to cut your losses? These important questions are answered in the next two chapters. Press the sell order button when you are ready to sell the stock. You simply press the sell order, or submit sell order, button on the sell order screen, see figure 7.1. After clicking the sell button, the order is submitted. If the price is accepted, then the order is filled, and the proceeds from the sale original amount invested plus the gains are transferred to a cash or money market account. After the sale, there is a two-day settlement date not including Saturday and Sunday. This means that the cash from the sale is not delivered to your account until two days after the trade date. Although the cash is not available, the buying power is, and you can reinvest the proceeds from a sale immediately. Why? Because you don't have to ante up the cash until two days after the trade date. Note, while you are allowed to buy another security with unsettled funds, you are not allowed to sell that security until the cash used to make the purchase has cleared. In other words, you can buy another stock with the unsettled proceeds but you cannot sell that stock until the settlement period is over. If you break this rule, you will get a good faith violation. Most brokerages allow you to break the good faith violation three times in a calendar year. After that, your account may be restricted for a specified time period. Cut your losses if you asked me for one rule that prevents. Owe you from losing a lot of money, first on my list would be this, cut your losses. Many investors who buy stocks are shocked when their stock price declines. Rather than cutting losses at a certain point, traders often adopt the strategy of, hoping, the stock price will come back to their break-even price. Many succumb to temptation and buy additional shares, i.e., buy the dip. Sometimes the strategy works, and losses are recovered. Many times, the strategy doesn't. That's why you want to get out of a losing stock when the loss reaches your limit price. To survive in the stock market, always have an exit price in mind in case you are wrong about the stock price. Stick to that plan, unless something unexpected changes your outlook. For example, even stocks of the best companies rise and fall over the months and years, especially during a correction or bear market. Unfortunately, some people won't admit that they made a mistake and continue to hold as their stocks continue to decline. That 7 or 8% loss becomes a 10% loss, which may soon become a loss of 20 or 30%. Once this happens, the traders feel trapped and never sell the stock. They become what are known as, stuck holders. Automated stop loss tools Automated stop loss tools are available on your brokerage firm's trading screen when entering an order to buy or sell stock. If you've never used them before, they may seem overwhelming. The purpose of these automated tools is to assist you with one important task, reduce or cut losses. The tools can be used automatically to lock in gains or to stop further losses at a predetermined price or percentage. After using them several times, they become easier to understand. Now, you will be introduced to a number of tools that help with sell decisions. Every brokerage has these automated selling tools built into their trading screens. The number one rule for traders and investors is never let a small loss turn into a big loss. 
That is why it's useful to have automated stop loss tools, price alerts, mental stops, or time stops. Stop loss order. Reduce losses as the name implies. The purpose of a stop loss order is to protect profits or to cut losses. A stop loss order to sell is activated once the stock trades at the stop loss price or lower. Stop loss orders may be a limit or market order. Let's begin W. TH the stop loss market order. The main advantage of a stop loss market order is that it automatically limits losses when the stock price moves lower. It is useful when you cannot watch the market but still want to sell if certain conditions are met. This is one way to keep your emotions out of the decision process. Here is how the stop loss market order works. Enter a price that is below the current market price. The idea is to exit the trade if and when the stock price dips to your stop loss price. Entering a stop loss order here's an example. Let's say that you buy XYZ at $30 per share. Next, place a stop loss order at $28.50 per share, a 5% loss. If XYZ trades at $28.50 or less per share, a sell order will be generated instantly. The market order will be filled at the best available bid price, as with any other market order. It may be sold at $28.50, in this example, but that price is not guaranteed. The purpose of the order is to limit losses on this trade to 5%. Without a stop loss, you would have no protection if the stock price continues to fall. By entering a stop loss order at a specified price, you accept the fact that your trade did not work as planned, resulting in a relatively small loss. This insurance is not free. However, in return for preventing a significant loss, you lose the opportunity to participate if the stock price turns around and zooms higher. The stop loss button on the sell order screen is illustrated in figure 7.2. Your screen should look similar to this. In this example, I entered a stop loss order to sell 100 shares of XYZ at $28.50 per share, so that if XYZ drops to $28.50 per share, a 5% loss the stock will be sold at the market price good for the day only. Figure 7.2 Stop Loss button on the sell order screen. Source. Interactive Brokers. Client Portal Platform. June 2021. Think of the stop loss price as an emergency exit price that limits losses on a stock trade. When the stop loss is initiated, it will automatically sell at the price that you enter. You are free to adjust the stop loss price to any level. As a guideline, I suggest a 7 to 8 percent stop loss, but you should establish your own loss limit based on your risk tolerance. Stop loss market order. Lock-in gains while the stop-loss market order is often used to prevent or minimize losses, it also can be used t. Lock-in gains. Let's say you own Apple, whose stock price has been rising steadily for months. To protect your unrealized profits, you enter a stop-loss order below the current price. If the stock price drops to that level, an order would be entered automatically to sell at the market price. Using a stop loss order to lock in gains is a sound idea but is not for everyone. Some investors can't stand the idea of selling stocks as they move higher, and that is understandable. The main reason for locking in gains with a stop loss order is if the stock has begun to reverse. Hint. Let's say you are going on vacation and can't watch your position. You could enter a traditional stop loss order to sell if the stock falls by 7%. Then you could enter another order to sell when the stock rises by 5%. Yes, the broker allows you to initiate multiple stop loss orders on one stock. In this example, you are protected if the stock moves too high or too low. You could also enter two OCO, one cancels the other orders. When one order is filled, the other order is automatically cancelled. Problems with stop loss orders The stop loss order works as advertised, but it isn't perfect. 
Although it is guaranteed that your stock will be sold, using a stop-loss market order, there is no guarantee that it will be sold at an acceptable price. In fact, one of the risks of using a stop-loss market order is that in volatile markets, your stop-loss order might be triggered at a price that is much lower than anticipated. Here's what could happen. Let's say that you initiate an XYZ stop-loss order at $28.50 per share when it is trading at $30. Later that day, XYZ drops from $30 per share and is falling fast. When XYZ hits $28.50, the stop loss is triggered. But because XYZ is dropping so quickly, the next available price could be even lower, perhaps $25.50. In this example, instead of locking in a 5% loss, the loss was 15%. Note. During extreme conditions, such as a market that suddenly gaps down by thousands of Dow points, Perhaps because of negative breaking news or panic, the next available selling price could be substantially lower. Fortunately, unexpected, flash crashes, and extreme sell-offs are rare, but they do expose the weakness of a stop-loss order. It's a personal choice whether to use a stop-loss order. Some pay. PLE love using them, while others are uncomfortable giving up control to the computer. Another choice is to use a mental stop order, which I will explain later. Stop limit order in many ways, the stop limit order offers more control than the market order. Here's how it works. Instead of entering one stop loss price, enter two prices. The first triggers the stop. The second specifies the limit price you are willing to accept for your shares. For example, if you own a $30 stock, enter a stop limit order at $27.90, a 7% stop loss, and a limit price of $27.90, the two prices are identical by choice. In this example, once the stock hits $27.90 or lower, the order is triggered and becomes a limit order to sell at $27.90 or higher. If that $27.90 price is available, the order will be filled. If the stock can't be sold at $27.90 because the stock price is falling, then your order will go unfilled for now. Perhaps it will be filled later in the day, assuming the stock price moves back to $27.90. The potential problem with the stop limit order, as always, is that in a fast-moving market, the order won't get filled. This is a risk, which is why I suggest making the limit price a few pennies below the trigger price. On the other hand, if the market plunges and then bounces back, you'll be thankful you are using a stop limit order rather than a stop loss. Just remember that on a rally, that now triggered order will get filled at your limit price. Figure 7.3 shows a screen of a stop limit order. It's nearly the same as the stop loss order, except that you enter two prices, not one. The figure shows you how a stop limit order looks after you buy 100 shares of stock at $50. Your stop price is $47.50, and your limit price is $47.25. Figure 7.3 Stop Limit Order Source, Interactive Brokers, Client Portal Platform, June 2021. Trailing Stop Order The Trailing Stop Order, which is entered as a dollar or percentage amount, seems like a perfect idea. The trailing stop automatically trails behind the rising stock price. It is designed to lock in gains or limit losses. When a stock pulls back by a certain amount, in dollars or percent, the order is triggered and filled, if possible. For example, if a stock rises to $50 per share, enter a 5% trailing stop, which automatically triggers when the stock falls 5% from its P. Price. The benefit of the trailing stop is that if the stock moves higher, the trailing stop also moves higher, tick by tick. The trailing stop won't trigger unless the stock pulls back by 5% from its highest price. 
The disadvantage of using the trailing stop is that, in a volatile market, a sudden burst of selling could result in an overdone market dip, triggering the stop order. This is the chance you take when using the trailing stop, or any other automatic triggers. Note, it's also possible to enter a trailing stop limit order, which can give you even more control over your order. However, the trailing stop market order will get you out of the position, while the trailing stop limit order may not. Price alerts. The best of both worlds legendary mutual fund manager Peter Lynch once told me that stop losses were like, death by a thousand cuts. It's true that if you constantly sell using stop loss orders, those small losses can add up. There is an alternative. Rather than using stop losses, you can set up automatic price alerts for the securities you buy and for those you plan to buy. For example, if you buy YYYY at $50 per share, you can set a stop loss price alert at $47.50, 5% loss or even at $55, 10% gain. If the $47.50 alert is triggered, you will be notified by a sound from your computer, an email, or a text message you can set the notification method you prefer. You would also be alerted if the stock rose to $55. After receiving the alerts, it is up to you to enter an order, if you so choose. Price alerts allow you to control if or when you will sell. New technology has made price alerts possible. Mobile devices allow for instant notification, allowing you to take immediate action if desired. It makes sense to take advantage of these features, which investors from previous centuries could only dream about. Note, it takes discipline to buy or sell based on a price alert. That's why traders who tend to ignore price alerts may want to use automatic stop losses. If you don't have access to your trading account, perhaps you're on vacation, then automatic stop losses are an excellent choice. Mental stop losses Let's say that you bought stock at $25 per share and promised yourself that if the stock falls to $23 per share, an 8% loss, you would sell. This is the mental stop loss, A. D for disciplined investors and traders, it is appropriate. You can think of this as similar to having a wait-and-see attitude. Unfortunately, many investors do not have the discipline to sell a losing stock when it hits the, mental, target price. They may freeze in fear when their beloved stocks fall, or they may convince themselves that the lower price is only temporary. Others won't get rid of a losing stock because, it's too cheap to sell. They may refuse to accept any loss. Some people fall in love with their stocks and treat them like a family member, and won't sell. Others may ignore the mental stop loss and hope their stock comes back to even. Nevertheless, the mental stop loss is an excellent choice for those people who want to avoid the limitations of the automatic stop loss programs, and have the discipline to sell when the stop loss is triggered in their mind. Time stops. Sell based on the calendar A time stop is a useful but underutilized technique to cut losses or lock in gains. After buying a stock or ETF, set a day or time at which you will sell the position for either a gain or loss. For example, after buying a stock, if it is underwater, draw a line in the proverbial sand and sell by Friday no matter what the stock price. If you are a short-term trader, you may consider selling during the same day or the next day, or by Friday. Instead of selling based on points or percentages, you sell your stock based on the calendar. A final thought about selling. You need to give as much thought to selling as you do to buying. Knowing when to sell for a profit or to reduce losses is the key to your success as a trader or investor. A failure to think about selling is a mistake many beginners make. I don't want that to happen to you. Test before you trade now that you know how to buy and sell stocks, you may be excited about the idea of making a trade. I'm sure you have trading ideas, perhaps tips from friends and acquaintances, or your own ideas, or something that you saw on the internet or TV. If you are a beginner, 
I encourage you to use the broker's software to make practice trades. Many brokerage firms have simulated trading software, which is one of the best ways to test which strategies work or don't work. By making practice trades in a paper money or simulated trading account, you also get to char. N your trading skills. Would you let someone pilot an airplane before using a simulated program? Of course not. Before making real trades, it's a good idea to use a test account to explore the brokerage software. Becoming familiar with the trading platform cuts the probability of making trading mistakes like pressing the wrong button or entering the wrong stock symbol. If your brokerage doesn't offer a paper money account, you can find a simulated trading program on the internet. An excellent free simulated program is at this website platform.thinkorswim.com. You are allowed to practice using the Thinkorswim software from TD Ameritrade for 60 days at no cost. Anyone in the world can use the software. Call the brokerage firm for specific instructions on using this technology. Interactive Brokers also provides a free, and powerful, simulated trading program that is available to traders even if you don't have an account. Go to its website at http colon slash slash www.interactivebrokers.com for details. Other brokerage firms that offer paper money trading programs include TradeStation, E-Trade, and Webull. More brokerage firms will be offering simulated trading programs in the future as more customers are demanding it. In addition to brokerage firms, MarketWatch has a simulated trading game through its virtual stock exchange, with a 15-minute quote delay and $100,000 in play money. Investopedia also allows you to set up a trading game with $1 million in play money and a 15-minute quote delay. The bottom line, the next time you are thinking of buying a stock, test before you buy. Although not everyone is a fan of this method, the benefits far outweigh the drawbacks. Rushing into a trade without testing is a mistake you don't have to make. However, if you want to skip the simulated program and start trading immediately, there is an alternative, invest only a small number of dollars in a stock that you want to own. Trading small is a reasonable alternative for anyone who is not patient enough to test trade first. Now that you have learned a number of selling strategies, we will discuss how to make money. You can do it slowly with long-term investments or quickly with short-term trades. You can also do both. For many of you, part 3 is a must-read, and I promise to do my best to meet your needs. Part 3 Money-Making Strategies This part contains a variety of strategies, all designed to make money. A strategy is a trading plan for buying and selling stocks with a specific idea of how to earn a profit. Having a viable strategy is essential if you want to make consistent profits. It is more than just buying low and selling high, which sounds great in theory, but in reality is an extremely difficult strategy. Without a strategy, or plan, people often flip from one idea to another with no achievable goal. It's similar to climbing into your car in Chicago and driving in a random direction, hoping to arrive in Florida. Without advanced planning, it's likely the trip will be unsuccessful. If you are new to the stock market, it's best to keep an open mind before choosing a strategy. It may take some time before you find an investing or trading strategy that fits your personality and risk tolerance. Boot it's worth the effort. You aren't limited to using a single method. Some people use a combination of strategies, whereas others are comfortable using only one. There is no right answer about which is the best approach for you, although I will help you with making the decision. Keep in mind the following about strategies. 1. No matter how brilliant and ingenious the strategy, it must be well executed. 2. Not all strategies work under all market conditions. 3. Don't become so devoted to one strategy that you become blind to the fact that it is not working and you are losing money. Money is the scorecard that determines whether or not your strategy is successful.
In part 3, I'll introduce both long-term strategies for investors and short-term strategies for traders. You don't have to choose one over the other, you can use both. Let's start with long-term investment strategies. Chapter 8 Long-Term Investment Strategies Anyone interested in being an investor is likely to enjoy reading about the various ways of making money slowly. Buy and hold is the strategy of choice for those who prefer to make money over the long term. As you will see, there are many types of long-term strategies. Find one that fits your personality and risk tolerance. If you are a trader with little interest in holding positions for more than a few days or weeks, I also urge you to read this chapter. There may be times when, even as a trader, you will want to put some money into longer-term investments. The most popular investment strategies The following investment strategies are well known and popular among retail investors. In certain market environments, they can increase your profits and thus help build wealth. The best environment for making money is a bull market because the major market indexes, and the vast majority of stock prices, keep climbing higher with no obvious end in sight. Unfortunately, as many learn the hard way, there is always an end, even if no one knows when. Many popular investment strategies don't fare as well during bear markets when the major market indexes decline, often steeply, for months, if not years. Most investors lose money during these times, but many will refuse to sell their holdings because they fear missing the next rally, an affliction known as FOMO, or the fear of missing out. Many others are afraid not of missing out but of losing most of their money. These investors often give up and sell all their stocks, just as the market is nearing a bottom. The good news is that the market has always moved higher over the long term, providing rewards to those who stay the course. For that reason, this first strategy on our list is popular with investors, and it's easy to see why, it's the simplest strategy to use. Buy and hold The majority of investors prefer to buy stocks with no predetermined holding period. This is a strategy made famous by billionaire Warren Buffett, who once said that he doesn't just buy shares of a stock, he also buys a business. He buys stocks for the best price he can, and holds them for a long time, reportedly saying that his favorite holding period was, forever. The idea behind the buy and hold strategy, is that purchasing stock at a fair price in a fundamentally sound company and holding it indefinitely, think in terms of years provides a more than satisfactory return on your investment. The beauty of buy and hold is that you can own shares of a company and periodically see the price of the shares gain ground without constantly watching the market. The key to this strategy is choosing stocks of undervalued companies that have room to grow over the long term. Investors who bought shares in Apple, Netflix, Starbucks, Home Depot, Lowe's, Costco, McDonald's, Walmart, and Meta formerly Facebook, in the early days and held for the long term were richly rewarded for their patience. Even those investors who were late in buying these shares did well as the profits and the stock price continued to grow. Of course, there are no guarantees that shares in these companies, or others will continue to go higher forever. Nevertheless, for long time periods decades, investors did very well if they chose successful companies. A buy and hold success story There are times when buying and holding for decades worked brilliantly. In 1997, a young couple, Mary and Larry, bought two shares of a new company, Amazon, that sold books online. They liked the simplicity of ordering books for their young son. They decided to invest in Amazon for their son, but all they could afford was two shares. For years, the son wanted to sell the shares as the price of Amazon climbed. His parents insisted that he continue to hold, and he did. 24 years later, Amazon turned into one of the largest corporations in the world, and the young couple's two-share purchase turned into an $81,098 windfall, or a 172,449%, 
split adjusted percentage increase, source, Insider, April 2021. Their son, Ryan, finally sold some of his 24 shares, the shares had split three times, in 2021 so he could buy a new house. This couple wrote the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, to thank him for creating such a great company. In their letter, they wrote the following postscript, we wished we had bought 10 shares. This story shows that you can buy and hold a long time and build wealth. That is why the strategy of buy and hold forever can work if you choose the right stock in the right market environment. On the other H. N. D. Although buy and hold forever has worked with certain stocks, this strategy has its downside. For example, look back at the original 12 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and you'll see that not one remains, as mentioned earlier in the book, the last holdout, General Electric, was kicked out of the index in 2018. The other stocks in the Dow were replaced as the DJIA was updated. Imagine if you had bought and held Sears, Kmart, Lehman Brothers, or thousands of lesser-known companies that eventually went bankrupt. We all have stories of people who bought and held certain stocks, forever, only to lose money. During a lengthy bull market, this strategy is brilliant. During the next bear market, take a look at these same stocks and see if the strategy holds up over time. Buy and hold, until something changes, there is a class of investors who buy and hold and are willing to sell their shares when something changes. That, something, could be a management shake-up, weak earnings, or a change in the outlook for the company. It could also mean that a technical indicator warns of temporary problems. These technical indicators will be discussed in Chapter 12. Any of these changes should motivate investors to reevaluate whether to continue buying additional shares, or even whether to hold on to shares bought earlier. Although it is appropriate to be a long-term investor, that doesn't mean holding indefinitely. That is why it's so important to evaluate your stocks and other financial products periodically to be certain that your portfolio is worth owning. After all, the strategy is not, buy and forget. The bottom line, if you choose stock in the right companies, or if you buy an index fund, the odds are good that you will make money over the long term. Never forget, however, that anything is possible when it comes to the stock market. When buy and hold doesn't work when you are unlucky enough to buy stock at the wrong time, such as right before a correction or bear market then you are likely to lose money regardless of which stocks you own. For example, during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, as people stayed home and cancelled travel plans, the shares of cruise lines, airlines, and anything else connected to the travel industry plummeted. Before the pandemic, the stocks of many of these companies, especially airline stocks, were doing spectacularly well. And then, just like that, the pandemic wiped out the profits of these companies, and stockholders were punished. It is nerve-wracking for buy-and-hold investors to watch shares of their stocks plunge by 30 or 40 percent, sometimes more. If you were a true believer in the buy-and-hold strategy, and refrained from panic selling, you were rewarded when the market returned to making new highs in 2021. Often, after a temporary setback, many stocks resume their winning ways. Not all people have the skill required to recognize stocks with great potential, nor do many have the patience to hold as profits accumulate. As soon as the market turns from bullish to bearish, many investors sell in a panic, afraid of losing all their money. It can take nerves of steel to buy and hold when the economy is cratering and even the stocks of good companies are sinking. That's when many investors discover how much risk they are willing to accept. Note, it is a personal decision whether to buy and hold indefinitely or buy and hold until something changes fundamentally in the company. Certain stocks can be held for a lifetime and generate positive returns. Most stocks, however, must be routinely monitored, at least once every year, for signs of potential problems.
Those who use technical analysis such as moving averages may reduce positions when there is a sell signal. Your intention to hold forever should change when there is good reason to sell some or all of the shares. Dollar cost averaging. A systematic way to buy stocks dollar cost averaging DCA is a popular practice that involves investing a set amount of money into stocks, ETFs, or index funds on a regular, systematic basis such as every month or every quarter. With this method, you accumulate a greater number of shares over time as stocks rise and fall. The alternative is to use the lump sum investment method to make a single investment or invest at random whenever there is extra money in your pocket. The advantage of dollar cost averaging is that when stock prices decline, you buy more shares with the same sum, so the average price per share moves lower. When share prices rise, you buy fewer shares each month. This ESULTS in owning a greater number of shares as long as the market doesn't move straight higher with no dips. For example, let's say you invest $250 in YYYY when it's at $20 per share. Next month, if the price drops to $18 per share, you invest another $250, assuming you have the discipline to keep investing after a 10% decline. After a rally, your next investment is $250 at $22 per share. This method is preferable to investing $750 at one time at $20 per share because it allows you to accumulate extra shares when markets undergo normal fluctuations, i.e., both higher and lower. Here is the math you may not be able to buy fractional stock shares, but you may do so when investing in an index fund A. Lump sum. If you invest $750 in one lump sum when the stock is $20 per share, you own 37.50 shares. B. Dollar cost averaging. With DCA, if you invest $250 three times over a period of time, for example, at $20, $18, and $22, these trades would purchase 12.50. 13.89, and 11.36 shares, respectively. Total shares bought. 37.75. C. The DCA advantage. Method B works better because investors will own more shares. In this example, 37.75 shares versus 37.50 shares. This may seem like a trivial difference, but it is actually 0.66% more shares. When this scenario is repeated multiple times, and when the value of your investments compounds, these additional shares make an important difference. Choose the stock of a successful company that has a history of outperforming the market averages, and you will appreciate dollar cost averaging. The key to this strategy is that the stock price increases over time even if there were temporary pullbacks. If the stock does not increase in value over the long term, it may be time to dollar cost average into another investment. You may also want to consider dollar cost averaging into index funds. In fact, when I speak to investors who are first starting out, I suggest that they get in the habit of paying yourself first that is, depositing at least $25 to $100 into an index fund every month. Even if all you can afford is a smaller amount, it's still worth the effort. As mentioned in Chapter 6, dollar cost averaging also works during down markets because you are buying at lower prices instead of buying all at once. This strategy is designed to give a boost to your portfolio especially when compared with the lump sum method. Buy the dip. Buy good stocks for bargain prices. The buy the dip strategy is another popular investing plan. It works like this. When a stock price declines, especially when you believe that the company is still fundamentally sound and that the decline is only temporary, you would buy shares or buy more shares if you already own the stock. If the shares bounce back upward, investors make money. Most of the great companies mentioned throughout this book have had temporary pullbacks at one time or another and rebounded strongly. 
That is why buying the dip is so popular with investors. The idea is to take advantage of the short-lived mishap and buy stocks that are on sale. Not everyone realizes it, but this is a market timing strategy. It works as long as you buy the right stock at the right time. I previously told you about the couple and their son who made a big profit by buying and holding Amazon for decades. One of my acquaintances had a different approach. A few years ago, he bought a few shares of Amazon when it was $350 per share. At the time, it seemed like a high price to pay for a popular online retailer with too much debt and too little earnings. Nevertheless, on the days that Amazon dipped, my friend bought more shares. He continued using this simple buy the dip strategy for years. Five years later, Amazon went as high as $3,500 per share. Even though my friend started with a relatively small position, he made a fortune buying and rarely selling this one stock. In this example, buying the dip worked because my friend chose a winner. The good news is that there are dozens of other stocks that have had excellent long-term results. Remember, just because a stock has performed well in the past does not guarantee it will continue to do so in the future. That's why it's so important to study and analyze companies before buying their stock. If my friend had chosen the wrong stock, the buy the dip strategy would have failed. Let's look at other reasons why this strategy is less than perfect. Problems with buying the dip The main problem with buying the dip is with the timing. It's hard to know when the dip is only temporary or when the stock price will contain. E to decline. Getting the timing right is difficult, even for professional traders. Therefore, if buying the dip, don't buy a stock on the way down, this is similar to trying to catch a falling knife. Instead, wait until the stock has stopped falling and reverses direction to the upside before buying. In addition, not every stock is able to bounce back. These stocks don't just dip, they plunge. In the past, investors poured money into, can't lose, stocks that seemed like bargains at the time, but were actually overpriced or headed toward bankruptcy. In hindsight, it's easy to identify overpriced or underpriced stocks. At the time you want to buy, it's not as clear. As an investor, you are not as concerned with getting the timing exactly right as long as you get a decent price. As long as the dips are short-lived, which may not be apparent immediately, the strategy can work. It's psychologically difficult for some investors to buy the dip. When the market is falling hard, and so many excellent stocks are being dragged down with the market, it is tempting to join the panic and sell rather than buy. As you can see, while buying the dip sounds wonderful in theory, in real life it's not that simple. Bottom fishing. Finding bargains with unloved stocks If you are a bottom fisher, you look for stocks whose prices are so low that they appear to have hit bottom and have nowhere to go but up. If you find one of these gems, you will earn a profit if the stock price recovers. Many of these unloved stocks are in the basement for a reason typically, poor earnings. Some may have been winners in the early days but fell out of favor. There are two kinds of stocks that bottom fishers buy. The first kind includes previously strong and successful stocks that have taken a dive. As an investor, you must determine if this is a temporary setback or if there are severe problems with the company that aren't going away anytime soon. For example, after founder Steve Jobs left Apple in the early 1990s, its stock went below $6 per share, adjusted for stock splits, and the company was near bankruptcy. Jobs triumphantly returned in 1996, and over the next few years, the stock zoomed higher. As Jobs introduced the iPod, the iPad, and, of course, the iPhone, the stock price was unsto. Payable. This is just one example of when bottom fishers did extremely well. The second kind of stock that bottom fishers like buying includes shares of unknown or unloved companies selling at low prices. 
Investors with a long-term view who can identify such stocks will be richly rewarded if and when these companies succeed. The main risk when bottom fishing is that you never know where the bottom is. When a high-flying stock drops from $100 to $20, for example, investors may believe that it has become a bargain and buy shares. The assumption, really, it's more about hope, is that the price cannot go much lower. They may be the same investors who bought shares on the way down, at $50, $40, and $30. By the time the stock falls by 80%, it is likely in a, death spiral. The diving stock price suggests there is something wrong with the company although you may not know what it is until later. Being a bottom fisher is not an easy way to invest. Many if not most of these companies never return to profitability. If they do, it may take years before that happens. Most of these stocks do not recover the way Apple did. Typically, stocks that are in the basement tend to remain there. Note. There is a difference between bottom fishing and bargain hunting. Buying a stock that has fallen so low that it's massively oversold is bottom fishing. Buying a strong stock that is temporarily on sale is bargain hunting. Averaging down Averaging down is an investing idea that involves buying additional shares whenever you choose to do so, and almost always when the purchase price is lower than it was last time. With dollar cost averaging, there is a plan, invest a set amount each period, e.g., monthly. With averaging down, however, you buy additional shares whenever you please. Unfortunately, history has taught us that averaging down offers no guarantee of ever making back your money, especially without a plan. Another problem with this strategy is that weak stocks often get weaker and never climb out of the basement. Averaging down is an undisciplined strategy that you may want to avoid. Value stocks. Buying stocks on sale value stocks or shares of companies that sell at a discount compared with their true worth, or value. The hard part for investors is determining what a company is Ray. Lee worth. That is why value investors use fundamental analysis to discover good quality stocks that trade at a bargain. They often search out stocks with a low price earnings P.E. ratio, which you'll learn about in Chapter 15. Often, value investors buy stocks in companies that other investors don't want. These often include old-fashioned companies such as insurance companies, retail stores, and certain banks. Value investors are typically long-term investors who are willing to wait years for their investments to trade above fair value and become profitable. It's not easy to find good quality value stocks. It takes a lot of time to do the necessary research, and many individual investors don't have the time or ability to analyze a company's fundamentals. The goal is to find solid stocks that are undervalued. Some low-priced stocks that seem like bargains may be costly, while a high-priced stock may actually be a bargain. Just knowing the price of a stock isn't enough, you also have to know what it is worth. Another problem with finding value stocks is that in certain market environments, the stocks of many companies have risen so high that it's hard to find a bargain. That's another reason why value investors must be patient and look for stocks that are, diamonds in the rough. An alternative to finding your own stocks is to invest in a mutual fund or ETF that invests in value stocks. Buying a mutual fund may not be as much fun as making your own investing decisions, but that is not important if your main goal is to make money, which is a different kind of fun. Buying dividend or income stocks and ETFs Dividend or income stocks are those that return money to shareholders in the form of dividends. The payment is usually made in cash. Some investors, usually those who don't like taking big risks, like to receive dividends because they provide a cash return on their investment. Corporations that pay dividends tend to be larger, less risky blue chip companies in the game of poker. Blue chips are the most valuable, one of the reasons that many conservative investors like them.
Investors near retirement are attracted to dividend stocks because these investors plan to use the dividends as an income stream. Collecting dividends is a great idea. Investors receive a portion of the company profits in cash. Reinvesting those dividends and compounding the earnings is a time-honored method of building wealth. Dividends are not free money to stockholders, because the stock price declines by the amount of the dividend being paid, which occurs on the ex-dividend date. The dividend is paid to investors who already own its stock prior to the ex-dividend date. New buyers are not entitled to receive that dividend. Keep in mind that the board of directors is not required to distribute dividends, but does so when dividends fit into the company's business plan. A dividend increase is typically a positive event, and the stock price often increases. On the other hand, a dividend cut suggests that business may not be going well and the company cannot afford to pay those dividends. Often, the stock price will fall after a dividend cut. Note. Many companies make it easy to reinvest dividends automatically by letting you buy additional shares through a drip dividend reinvestment plan. Disadvantages of buying dividend OR income stocks There are a few disadvantages if buying dividend stocks. First, dividends are considered taxable income, so you must report that income to the IRS, see a tax advisor for specific advice. Second, Dividend stocks can decline just like other stocks. Just because you own a stock in a so-called conservative dividend-paying company doesn't mean that you are protected against losing money when the stock market moves lower and the stock price declines. Look at what happened to General Electric, GE, one of the most dependable dividend-paying stocks in history. On June 19, 2018, GE's dividend was cut from 12 cents per share to only 1 cent after its stock price fell to less than $10 per share. GE was removed from the Dow Jones Industrial Average and replaced by the Walgreens Boots Alliance drugstore chain. Although GE has not been invited back to the Dow, the good news for the company is that the stock price made a stunning recovery over the following four years. The dividend, however, remains only a few pennies per share at the time of writing. When to sell a dividend stock typically, those who buy dividend stocks rarely sell. After all, the whole idea behind buying these stocks is to bring in steady income, or cash flow, in T. E form of quarterly dividend payments. However, there are times when it is prudent to sell dividend-paying stocks no matter how high the dividend payments. As mentioned above, no matter how much you love the company, if the dividend is cut, consider selling the stock. Find out why the company cut the dividend and if there have been any potentially negative changes such as falling sales and earnings or new management. It may be time to look for other stocks to own. As an example, Let's return to General Electric. When the company first cut its dividend from 24 cents to 12 cents per share, the stock was trading for $190 per share. After the cut, the stock price tanked. That first dividend cut was a strong clue there were internal problems. Investors who refused to heed the warning were punished as the stock price fell and the dividends were eventually reduced to a penny per share. There is an important lesson here. Buying and holding dividend stocks is similar to any other stock in your buy and hold portfolio, buy but don't hold forever. Once the dividend is reduced, it is no longer a dividend growing stock and probably does not belong in your portfolio. Once a stock falls out of favor, there is no reason to stick around. Hint. You can easily find the dividend payment if any, of every listed company by looking online or in a financial newspaper. Hint. Instead of buying individual dividend stocks, you can also buy ETFs or mutual funds that own dividend-paying stocks. Examples of dividend ETFs include SDY, TDB, TMDB, and Noble. No matter which method is used, the goal is to find companies that consistently pay dividends to shareholders.
If this company is a member of the S&P 500 and has increased its dividend for 25 consecutive years, investors anoint these companies as aristocrats. A dividend, King, is a company that has increased its dividend each year for more than 50 years. One example of a dividend King is Tootsie Roll TR. Growth Stocks Thriving stocks fueled by strong earnings growth stocks are the stocks of companies that consistently grow their earnings year after year. The companies are expected to grow faster than the competition, and the stock price reflects that expectation. Strong earnings, and the acceleration of those earnings, make growth stocks occur. See it for investors and short-term traders who want quick, profitable trades. These stocks are often in the technology sector. Growth stocks can be an excellent holding for long-term investors who believe in the company and its business model. However, the day-to-day -day volatility can be unnerving for some investors. Owning growth stocks can sometimes be risky. Even one disappointing earnings report can cause the stock price to decline quickly. Sometimes growth stocks can be overvalued with a higher than deserved P.E. ratio, especially when the company's earnings aren't spectacular. This occurs when growth investors have above normal expectations or when a stock moves too high and fast. Typical growth investors prefer to see earnings growing by at least 15 to 20 percent a year. This is only a guideline, because each investor has his or her own criteria. These stocks usually don't pay dividends because extra cash is plowed back into the growing company. Growth investing works best during a bull market when stocks are moving higher and the P.E. ratio is expanding. Although the rewards are fantastic when investors find a good growth stock, the penalty for owning the wrong growth stock can be severe. For example, Many shareholders became wealthy by holding certain successful growth companies, many that have been named in this book. Unfortunately, there were thousands of others that didn't fare as well including WorldCom, Pets.com, Webvan, Boo.com, and Global Crossing, to name only a few. The bottom line, growth investing is an exciting strategy that requires an ability to find winning stocks. If you are interested in growth stocks but don't have the time or motivation to pick your own stocks, you can invest in a mutual fund or ETF that invests in growth stocks. Warren Buffett. Buy and hold value investor If you ask professional investors to name the greatest investor of all time, most will probably name billionaire Warren Buffett. He is best known as the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway a company that owns or has large investments in a number of businesses including insurance, publishing, and manufacturing companies. Buffett typically buys stock in mundane companies such as insurance companies and banks with some exceptions. Some of the stocks Buffett bought and held were Kraft, Heinz, Coca-Cola, American Express, Bank of America, and Apple. He also has the skill, along with a team of professional analysts, to recognize and invest in potentially valuable companies at low prices. Benjamin Graham, the author of the value investment classic, Security Analysis, first published in 1934, influenced Buffett early in his life. Buffett later worked for Graham at his brokerage firm, learning from the guru how to manage investment portfolios and pick value stocks. Buffett made a number of successful modifications to Graham's original strategies. He uses a stock's book value, its P.E. ratio, and its dividend yield, among other measurements, to calculate the company's fair value. He believes in buying a company for less than it is worth and patiently holding its stock for a lifetime, although he does sell stocks in companies that are underperforming. Buffett strongly believes in buying stock in companies that are simple and understandable. He avoided investing in internet stocks because he couldn't determine their true value. In the early days, most internet companies had little or no earnings and sky-high P.E. ratios. When internet stocks were most popular, starting in the 1990s, several pros derided Buffett for not investing in these companies. In hindsight, 
Buffett had the last laugh as he dodged the 2000 internet stock bust. Buffett, along with his right-hand man, Charles Munger, has earned a reputation for honesty and a sense of humor. Buffett is also known as one of the first to point out the importance of being cautious about investing in companies that play accounting games by compensating employees with stock options. Many have tried to emulate Buffett's successful buy and hold strategies. A number of excellent, common sense books have been written about his investment methods. The difficult part is learning how to correctly value a business, something that Buffett has mastered after a lifetime of investment success. Now that you have learned ways to increase income as an investor, it's a good time to learn how to make money quickly as a short term trader. Although not for everyone, many of these trading strategies are useful, especially when the market is volatile. It's worth your time to learn these methods. Chapter 9 Short-Term Trading Strategies In this chapter I will show you how to make money quickly using short-term trading strategies. These strategies are for those who are comfortable taking more risks with the chance of making a bigger reward. Short-term strategies are popular with aggressive traders who attempt to make money by taking advantage of volatile market conditions and short-term trends. Traders primarily analyze stock or market movements and trends using technical analysis. If you are primarily an investor, there is no rush to learn the strategies in this chapter. You should start as an investor and leave short-term trading for another day. On the other hand, those who want to learn how to make money quickly but with increased risks, keep reading. Short-term trading includes day trading, buy and sell within one day, swing trading, holding three to five days, and position trading, holding for a month or two. In addition, most traders either follow a stock trend, trend trading, or use high-risk momentum strategies. These methods are for those who try to profit from relatively quick stock price movements. Each strategy will be discussed in this chapter. Note. As I stress throughout this book, although learning how to make money using short-term strategies is important, your core holdings should be in long-term investments. Once you have a long-term portfolio, then consider using a portion for short-term trading. Swing trading Swing trading involves buying and selling stock within 3 to 5 days. This strategy takes advantage of short-term trends but for a longer time period than a day trader would take. The swing trading strategy involves using technical analysis to catch an uptrend, when going long, or a downtrend, when selling short. When their price target is hit, or time runs out, swing traders sell. This short-term method works fantastically at times, especially during a bull market when stocks or indexes continue moving higher for days or weeks. In the past, strong stocks such as Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Netflix, Tesla, and hundreds of others ran higher for weeks, months, and years, bringing profits to both short-term traders and long-term investors. Using the swing strategy paid off well for traders willing to hold for 3 to 5 days. Note. I created a street. A-T-E-G-Y that I call, weekly trading. It's similar to swing trading except that you buy early in the week and always sell by Friday. The advantage is you get to lock in your profits, if any, and enjoy the weekend without a Monday morning sell-off surprise. Day trading. Buying and selling within minutes or hours for those with a shorter time frame who seek even quicker money, day trading or intraday trading is an attractive strategy. Day traders, as the name suggests, Open and exit positions within seconds, minutes, or hours, or in microseconds for high-frequency algorithm traders but always within the same day. Using technical analysis, day traders attempt to anticipate when a stock or ETF has reached a short-term top or bottom. Day traders have received a lot of media attention over the years, especially when they earn or lose large amounts of money. The traditional caricature of a day trader is someone who trades dozens, or more, stocks and ETFs, trying to earn small profits on each trade. As you will learn, 
Making dozens of trades every day is an extremely difficult strategy for most people and takes an extraordinary level of discipline to be successful. A wiser day trading strategy is to trade no more than one or two stocks at a time. This method is easier on the mind and often on your trading account. By focusing on only one or two stocks, for example, you learn a stock's personality, i.e., how it trades during the day, which may give you an edge over other traders. It's hard enough to make money when trading one or two stock positions, but juggling any more than that is just asking for trouble. In addition, if you are tempted to day trade, it's recommended that you, trade small. Instead of trying to spend $10,000 to make $500 picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, try to spend $500 to make $1,000 or more. If you insist on day trading, this method is less risky. Day trading was so popular in the late 1990s that thousands of people quit their jobs to trade full-time. As the stock market climbed higher and higher, it seemed as if everyone was making money. It ended abruptly when a vicious bear market hit in early 2000, wiping out the accounts of many day traders who had never learned to sell stocks properly. So many traders lost money that FINRA Financial Indu Trial Regulatory Authority created the Pattern Day Trading Rule. The Pattern Day Trading Rule Day traders must obey the Pattern Day Trading Rule, which requires that you have at least $25,000 in your trading account. If your account has less, then you are limited to making only three round trip day trades buy and sell one position within the same day within a five day period. If you make that fourth trade within that five day period, you will be labeled as a pattern day trader and will be required to maintain at least $25,000 in the account. If you cannot bring the account up to that minimum, the account will be restricted from trading for the next 90 days. For example, if you buy YYYY manufacturing and then sell it within the same day, that is considered a day trade. If you buy YYYY on Monday afternoon and sell on Tuesday morning, that is not a day trade, and, in fact, is an overnight trade. Although the pattern day trading rule seems harsh, it makes sense. If you are a new trader with less than $25,000 in your account, you are forced to be very picky about your trades. If you day trade without adequate training and practice, it's easy to blow up your account. If you use this strategy, it will take time to become a better trader. While you are learning, however, it's wiser to risk a relatively small amount than a large sum. As all day traders learn the hard way, managing risk always comes first. Profits come second. Hint. Ask your brokerage for the latest regulations regarding the pattern day trading rule. Day trading is not an easy strategy. Day trading is a challenging strategy for most people. Even with the best computers and software, only a small percentage of day traders consistently make money. It takes an incredible amount of discipline and excellent timing skills to make a profit each day. Although some day traders make money, it is a difficult way to make a living. Occasionally, this strategy may work. When market conditions are volatile, there will be many opportunities to day trade successfully, then you may be glad that you learned this strategy. Note. Day traders rely heavily on technical indicators and oscillators to determine when to enter or exit a stock position, or to identify when a stock is overbought or oversold. The most useful indicators for day trade. S include MACD, Moving Average Convergence Divergence, RSI, Relative Strength Index, BWAP, Volume Weighted Average Priced Stochastics, Bollinger Bands, and Moving Averages. Note. If you are a beginner and are intrigued by day trading strategies, you can start by reading my book Start Day Trading Now, Adams Media. In addition to day trading, I discuss other short-term trading strategies, such as swing trading. Position trading. Hold for weeks or months for longer-term traders. Position trading is a worthwhile strategy.
The goal is to buy a stock and hold the position for weeks or even a few months. Like many strategies, position trading works well during bull markets and often fails during bear markets. Position traders do not hold indefinitely but sell when their profit targets are reached or when they detect a market reversal. Basically, the plan is to sell when the uptrend ends, not always easy to determine, or the anticipated profits are earned. This strategy works best when you choose the strongest stocks in the strongest sectors. Position trading is not buy and forget, which is why it can be a challenging strategy. You have to study the market, learn how to use technical analysis, and keep your emotions under control for relatively long time periods. It takes more patience to use this strategy, because unlike day trading or swing trading, profits are not as immediate. However, if you are willing to wait for a stock to hit your price target, and if you choose the right stock that is moving in the right direction, you can do well as a long-term position trader. Follow the trend. A simple way to follow the market trend trading is an extremely popular trading strategy. The goal of trend traders is to identify the current market or stock trend and follow it. There are actually three types of trends uptrend, downtrend, and sideways trend. When a stock or the overall market is moving higher, it is in an uptrend. If the trend continues after you buy a stock, you sell your shares at an even higher price and book the gains. Although trend trading is not always precise, the idea is quite simple. Buy stock early or add to existing positions when the stock is in an uptrend. It's a very easy concept but differs from the traditional method of buying low and selling high. With trend trading, you are buying high with a plan to sell even higher. This strategy works brilliantly during bull markets when the entire market is in a long-term uptrend. That's when buying winning stocks for the short or long term can bring in excellent gains. Many strong stocks rally higher not just for days or weeks but for months or years. The idea is that instead of trying to beat the market, you follow it. Buy shares of companies that are in an uptrend and hold until the uptrend ends. Trend following, although not for everyone, works very well when you can correctly identify a trend. You may be thinking, how do I identify a trend? You must use the tools of technical analysis, indicators and oscillators, which you will learn about in chapter 12. For example, certain technical indicators such as moving averages help you determine whether a stock is in an uptrend or downtrend. Oscillators such as RSI help you identify overbought or oversold conditions. Some novice traders mistakenly believe that one glance at a stock chart will tell them the trend direction. While the eye test is a popular method for evaluating trends, more analysis is needed if you want to successfully use this strategy. Note, most trend traders are long only. However, bearish trend traders will sell short or move to cash when the stock or index is in a downtrend. Trend trading criticisms on paper. Trend trading seems simple. Identify the trend and follow it. In real life, trends are not clear cut and change frequently, especially in the short term. Sometimes an uptrend or downtrend develops in the morning and reverses direction in the afternoon. That is one reason why short-term trading is so challenging. Even when you identify a stock in an uptrend, it can be tricky deciding when to sell for a profit. Do you hold for a day, a few days, or weeks or months? Do you set a specific profit target and sell regardless of the strength of the uptrend? Long-term investors don't worry about when to sell, while short-term traders have to be alert to when the uptrend ends. Another criticism of trend trading is that it may not feel comfortable to buy high and sell higher. This method is difficult for some people to understand. Of all the strategies included in this chapter, however, trend trading is the easiest method to use in as the potential to bring decent profits without having to be an expert trader. Following the market trend is a smarter idea than trying to time the market. 
It requires patience, choosing the right stock, and knowing basic technical analysis. The bottom line. Here's one rule that all short-term trend traders know. Don't fight the trend. Note. It's true there are contrarian traders who trade against the trend, but they are usually very experienced. Momentum trading. Buy high and sell higher momentum trading, also known as MOMO, involves buying stocks whose prices have exploded higher on strong volume, and hoping that momentum will drive prices even higher. This strategy is about following the stock price and has nothing to do with the worth of the company. Momentum traders hold stocks as long as the stock price is rising, usually within a short time period such as the same day. Although this method is similar to trend trading, there is a big difference. With trend trading, you follow strong stocks that are steadily moving higher. With momentum trading, you buy stocks that have already moved excessively higher very quickly, often right after the market opens. In other words, MOMO traders jump into the trade only when the stock has extremely strong momentum and volume and hope to sell at a much higher price. In bull markets, or even on bullish days, momentum trading works like a charm. Market participants bid up stocks to extreme levels until the momentum stalls. The key is to sell quickly, hopefully for a profit. Although momentum trading is exciting and potentially profitable, it takes excellent timing skills to find success. The challenge is separating winning stocks from those that crash and burn soon after the opening bell. I refer to them as, one-minute wonders. Obviously, when stock prices reverse direction, MOMO traders are left holding a worthless bag. It's common for inexperienced momentum traders to have large losses. Another problem is that too many MOMO traders end up, chasing, stocks. Buying stocks as they trend higher is a reasonable trading strategy. Chasing stocks as they spike higher is neither a wise strategy nor a reasonable plan. In fact, no matter what trading strategy you use, you must not chase after stocks. That almost always leads to losses. Beginners should generally avoid momentum strategies. They require a lot more experience and skill than many traders realize. Although these skills can be developed over time, don't be in a rush to use them when first starting out. There is always time to learn this high-risk strategy later. Note, several of these high-risk, high-reward strategies are discussed in more detail in my follow-up book, How to Profit in the Stock Market McGraw-Hill. Counter-trend strategies. Buy low and sell high counter-trend strategies involve trading in the opposite direction of the trend. This is difficult for most people to believe, but the most popular counter-trend strategy is one that nearly every investor knows, buying low and selling high. Counter-trend strategies are not easy. For example, buying at a low price and selling at a high price takes excellent timing skills. Here's how this strategy works. Let's say a stock drops quickly at the open. A counter-trend trader would buy at a low point then sell if the stock reverses direction and moves higher. This is also known as the buy the dip strategy that you read about in the previous chapter. Perhaps you're wondering, how do you know when a stock is low and when it is high? These are excellent questions because low and high are relative terms. Remember the story I told you about Amazon. When Amazon was trading at $350 per share, the price seemed high. In hindsight, however, the price was actually low, but no one knew it at that time. A few years later, Amazon was trading as high as $3,500 per share. Another example. When Bitcoin was selling for $300 per coin, my knowledgeable neighbor said to buy it. At that time, I thought that paying $300 per coin for an unknown technology was too risky, so I passed. However, when Bitcoin rose to $3,000 per coin, my neighbor still considered it a bargain, so he bought 20 coins. As it turned out, he was right, 
When Bitcoin went to $20,000 per coin, he hit the jackpot. Unfortunately, he sold most of his coins in a panic when Bitcoin plunged to $6,000 a few weeks later. The point of my story. Low and higher relative terms. It is only later that you learn the true value of any stock, ETF, or cryptocurrency. If you are able to identify when a stock is low, and when a stock is high, you'll make a fortune. That I. Why most traders use technical analysis to get clues to when a stock or an ETF is high or low, and trade accordingly. As you will learn as you keep reading, trading is as much art as science. Although there are technical tools that will help identify when to enter or exit a stock position, there are no easy answers. This is one of the reasons that trading stocks can prove so challenging for people. Minimize mistakes and increase profits You need to know that short-term trading, while extremely popular and potentially profitable, is a demanding strategy, even if it seems easy to make a fast profit. Nevertheless, if you are willing to put in the time to learn technical analysis, keep your emotions under control, and make good trading decisions, you can be a successful short-term trader. Your main goal right now is to learn as much as you can about the market and to improve your trading skills. As you gain experience, knowledge, and discipline, your goal is to minimize risk and mistakes while increasing profits. Believe me, this is a worthy goal, and one that long-term investors also must achieve. Please don't make the common error of trying to get rich quickly. Your goal is not to make home runs every trading day but to work on making singles to use a baseball analogy. That is why beginners should start trading with a small amount of money, a sum that will differ for each person. As you gain experience, you can increase how much you put into your trading account while diversifying into other investments. And now a treat for you. William O'Neill, author of the best-selling book How to Make Money in Stocks and creator of the Can Slim Investment Method, agreed to speak to me about short-term trading. Trader and author William O'Neill After William O'Neill joined the U.S. Air Force, he bought his first stock with $500, all the money he had at the time. After completing his tour of duty, O'Neill experimented with a number of different strategies, and at first, he didn't do very well. In fact, it took him two and a half years to figure out how to make money in the stock market. He spent that time studying and learning everything he could about stocks. There was a lot of trial and error. The books that influenced him the most were written by or about professional traders Gerald Loeb, The Battle for Envy. Team and Survival Edward Lefevre, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, about legendary trader Jesse Livermore, and the stock trading methods of Bernard Baruch. Their ideas and writings helped O'Neill develop the framework for many of his strategies. At first, O'Neill simply bought the market leaders and thought that he had done well. In fact, he hardly made any money. This is when he made an amazing discovery. He knew how to buy stocks, but he had no idea when to sell. To solve this problem, he created a long list of selling rules. In 1962, his new selling rules told him to sell everything, which he did. He even made a little money by selling short. When the market turned around in 1963, he invested all his cash, $3,000, borrowed another $2,000, and pyramided his $5,000 investment into a $200,000 windfall. He bought a seat on the New York Stock Exchange with the profits. Sincere. Are there any clues that show when a market reaches a top? O'Neill. You start to see leading stocks falter and begin to sell off. If the winners can't buck a difficult market, that's a signal of weakness. Traders shouldn't go by instinct. Rather, they should look at what the market and individual stocks are telling them in terms of price and volume action, and fundamentals. Sincere. Have volume numbers changed since you first started investing? O'Neill. Yes, there's more money in the market, 
more stocks, and more traders than there were decades ago, but the chart patterns remain the same. In an ideal, strong market, you're looking for stocks to make new price highs on heavy volume. You can see this action in charts, which are vital to timing any investment. The key is to watch what the market indexes and stocks are doing. Sincere. How do you make money during market corrections? O'Neill. Often, the safest place to be during a correction is on the sidelines in cash. But it's an interesting statistic that 72% of stocks that maintain a good base pattern during a correction are typically the first out of the gate when the market goes into an uptrend. Although you do not want to stay invested in a correction because three quarters of growth stocks follow the market trend, it is an important signal to watch for stocks holding up against that downtrend. Sincere. What did you learn from Jesse Livermore? O'Neill. Pyramiding, or averaging up in a stock, is one key strategy that he followed. What Livermore meant is that you wade into a stock with your first purchase, but if the stock rises, you can buy a few more shares. Sincere. Is there any particular economic indicator you watch? O'Neill. Rather than look at individual economic indicators, we look at how the market reacts to those indicators. For instance, the monthly payroll report can be a big market mover. Sincere. What else should investors do? O'Neill. The most successful strategy is one that has rules and is devoid of emotions. That's how an investor avoids falling in love with a stock. Investors need a strong plan to manage any scenario that might come up. Emotions can curb sound judgment. Sincere. What was the most important lesson you learned from Bernard Baruch? O'Neill. Don't be afraid to sell a stock that is rising and lock in your gains. Baruch did this regularly to achieve major success. Sincere. If you had to choose three lessons for investors, what would they be? O'Neill. Learn the rules. Learn to read charts. Study your mistakes. Sincere. Are there any other rules you learned? O'Neill. This is not my system, but a historical analysis proves how stocks build steam and are recognized and bought by the institutions. It's basically watching the market action as it happens using CanSlim as your guide. That doesn't mean that markets don't have nuances, and that's why we're always studying markets to catch those. That means, for instance, that market conditions are unique each year, but the general rules are the same. Can Slim Can Slim, a rule-based investing method created by William O'Neill, combines both technical and fundamental analysis. Each letter in Can Slim stands for a performance characteristic of winning stocks. Ideally, winning stocks will have all these attributes. Here are the seven performance characteristics. See current quarterly earnings per share annual earnings increases and new products. New management, or new highs S supply and demand L leader or laggard I institutional sponsorship M market direction according to Can Slim, great stocks have superior earnings and sales. Therefore, it makes sense to buy stocks with year over. Year increases in quarterly earnings and sales, preferably 25% or more. Stocks with strong quarterly earnings and sales growth have a higher possibility of continuing their success. You also want companies that have introduced new products or changed management, something that sets them apart from the competition. Using technical analysis, look for stocks in companies that have broken out to new price highs. Pay attention to companies whose stocks are rising on higher volume, a signal that institutional investors are buying. When a stock breaks out to a new high, you want to see above average volume. With the Can Slim method, look for companies that buy back their own stock or for managers who privately own shares in their own company. It means they have a stake in the success of the company. Using this method, buy the strongest stocks in an industry group or sector. They are the market leaders. In particular, buy the leading stocks in the strongest industries and, it is hoped, in a good market i.e., a bull market or a market in an uptrend. 
buy stocks that are owned by institutional investors such as pension funds, banks, hedge funds, and mutual funds. Stocks with strong institutional support are liquid, so positions are easy to enter and exit. Finally, observe price and volume indicators to understand the strength and weakness of the market. Because most stocks follow the overall market trend, three out of four stocks according to O'Neill's research pay close attention to the overall market trend. This, in a nutshell, is Can Slim, a common-sense approach to finding strong stocks in strong sectors in a strong, uptrending market. If you can find one of these stocks, then you can do well by investing or trading it. One of the most interesting parts of O'Neill's strategy is that he doesn't buy the dip, even though it is a popular strategy. O'Neill questions why anyone would want to buy shares in a company that is losing value. In other words, if a stock is moving lower, it is happening for a reason, which is why he feels it should be avoided. Now that you have been introduced to short-term trading strategies, we will discuss some of the fun ways to increase a portfolio's value, diversification, allocation, compounding, and classification. Chapter 10 Fun Ways to Increase a Portfolio's Value As you gain experience with the stock market, you will discover different ways to grow your wealth. In this chapter, we delve into some of the things that you can do to increase a portfolio's value. When used correctly, these methods can help protect what you own while also helping to increase your income. These methods are essential for becoming a successful investor or trader. Here are some of the things you can do with stocks. Diversification allocation compounding classification In addition, you will learn about market capitalization, float, and stock splits. Pay close attention to these concepts. I'll begin with one of the most valuable investment concepts ever created, diversification. Diversification. Don't bet everything on one stock. One way to reduce investment risk is by diversification. That is, instead of betting your entire portfolio on one or two stocks, or a single market sector, spread the risk by investing in a variety of securities. The idea behind diversification is that when one or two investments go sour, your other investments can make up, or at least minimize, the losses. Note. A portfolio consists of all the assets that you own, including stocks, mutual funds, bonds, ETFs, and cash equivalents, such as money market funds and treasuries. If you aren't sure how diversification works, let's dig a little deeper. Let's say that you are 100% invested, i.e., all your available cash is in the stock market. To be properly diversified, you would need approximately 5 to 10 stocks in various industries. A common mistake is putting all your money in one sector such as technology and incorrectly believing that is diversification. To be truly diversified, a portion of your assets should be invested away from the stock market. One such place is the bond market. As well, commodities such as gold or real estate can be attractive to diversification-minded investors. Stay within your comfort zone, and don't tie up your funds in assets that aren't easily sold. Diversification is important. To do it right, consider a number of factors including how much risk you are comfortable taking, called risk tolerance, your age, your time horizon, and your investment goals. Many financial experts suggest owning a mixture of growth, value, and dividend stocks along with a smattering of international stocks. You should also consider stocks in both large and small companies. The bottom line, for many people, diversification isn't very exciting, but I can't stress enough how important it is to have a basic understanding of this concept. Note, if you want instant diversification, invest in index funds, ETFs, or mutual funds. This allows you to own a wide assortment of investments without having to buy a large number of individual stocks. Some people hire financial planners to help with the diversification process. Only you can decide whether this is an appropriate path for your assets.
On one hand, you want to be properly diversified so you aren't exposed to too much risk. On the other hand, you don't want to be overdiversified, i.e., owning so many stocks and other products that it reduces portfolio performance. This is when you need to think about our next topic, asset allocation. Asset allocation. Deciding how much money to devote to each investment while building a diversified portfolio, decide how much of your money to allocate are assigned to each investment. For example, if you are 30 years away from retirement, you might invest 65% in individual stocks and index funds and 25% in bonds, and keep 10% in cash. This is an example of asset allocation. In the old days, many financial planners used this formula. Subtract your age from 100 to determine the percentage of assets to put into stocks. For example, 100 minus 40 years old equals 60%. This old formula suggests that if you are a 40-year-old, you should allocate 60% of your money to stocks and 40% to bonds. The problem with this formula is that it turned out to be far too conservative, i.e., a 40-year-old should have more than 60% in the stock market. As a result, diversified portfolios often lagged when stocks performed exceptionally well. Another concern is that it's difficult to protect investors from a severe market correction. During those hard times, diversification strategies may cushion the blow, but every once in a while, a bear market can cause all asset classes to go down together. Be aware that a one-size-fits-all method does not work in the stock market because individual investors have different goals and risk tolerance. Compounding the eighth wonder of the world Einstein is credited with eyeing that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. Compounding works like this. Reinvest all earnings from your investments, including interest, dividends, and capital gains. The longer you continue to reinvest your earnings, the more money you'll earn. In addition to earning money on the original investment, you also earn money on the investments purchased with those earnings. If compounding is new to you, the numbers can be an eye-opener. Here's an example. If you invest $100 and it grows by 10% every year, at the end of the year you'll have a total of $110. If that $110 remains in your account for another year, at year end, the interest is $11, 10% of $110. This sum of $10 represents your regular earnings, but that extra $1 comes from compounded earnings, or the earnings that are derived from the first year's $10 earnings. You now have $121 in your account. Next year, even if you stopped adding money to the account, the interest will be $12.10. Now the account is worth $133.10. This may not seem like much extra money, but compounding year after year makes a huge difference over time. The more your investments earn, the faster they compound. The advocates of compounding remind you to invest early if you want to have money later. Believe them, because it is true. You are never too young to begin. Compounding is a powerful strategy that can make you wealthier the sooner you begin. The idea is that as the stocks you own increase in value, your earnings, investment profits and dividends compound as you continually invest by buying more shares with those dividends. The longer you hold on to any investment, the more it compounds. Those annual dividends and reinvestments keep growing over time. John Bogle called compounding the greatest mathematical discovery of all time for the investor seeking maximum reward. Investors who believe in buying and holding stocks often mention the power of compounding over the long term. Compounding formulas work like a charm as long as your investment increases in value. Unfortunately, the problem with the stock market is that there are no guarantees that your stock will go up in price or that you'll make a specific return each year in the market. 
When markets fall, this method may not work as expected. That's the risk we all take when buying stocks. Fortunately, the stock market has generally gone up over the long term, even with occasional hiccups along the way. Note. Compound interest works the same way when you owe money. Did you ever wonder why it can take 20 years to repay a relatively small credit card debt when you pay only the minimum amount due? It's the power of compound interest that keeps you in a debt hole. When you have credit card debt, it is wise to pay more than the minimum payment due. Classifying stocks by sectors A sector is a group of companies that loosely belong to the same industry and provide similar products or services. Examples of stock sectors include airlines, software, chemicals, oil, energy, automobiles, technology, and pharmaceuticals. Understanding sectors is useful if you want to understand the stock market. The reason is simple. No matter how the market is performing and no matter the condition of the economy, there are always sectors that do well and sectors that struggle. For example, during a bear market, the computer and technology sectors and those related to the internet often get hit the hardest. When that happens, many institutions shift their money from the weak sectors and move into, recession-proof, sectors such as food, beverages, pharmaceuticals, and household goods. Even in a recession, people must eat, drink, take medicine, and buy household goods such as tissues and toilet paper. Like anything else connected to the stock market, successfully shifting into and out of sectors at the right time sounds easier to accomplish than it is in real life. It's so obvious what sectors were the most profitable when you're able to look in a rearview mirror. Nevertheless, it's worth taking the time to understand and identify the various sectors, and figure out which were the strongest and weakest. Money flows into and out of sectors every day or week. As investors try to forecast the next stage of the economic cycle, the four stages of the economic cycle are expansion, peak, contraction, and trough. The most efficient way to invest or trade in sectors is by buying an ETF sector fund or mutual fund. This includes a basket of stocks that are in that sector, which is easier than finding stocks in that sector and buying them individually. Classifying stocks by size Stocks can be classified by size as well as by sectors. The stock's market capitalization. Market cap tells you how large the corporation is. Outstanding shares are the total number of shares issued by that corporation, including shares held by company insiders and officers. Why is it important to know about outstanding shares? The number of shares outstanding is used to calculate a company's earnings per share, as well as market capitalization. For example, a large corporation with 1 billion outstanding shares and a stock price of $50 has a market cap of $50 billion. It's up to the corporation's board of directors to decide how many shares are issued. The board may keep shares of the stock for the company's officers and employees. This is how so many employees at many technology companies grew wealthy. The market cap of a company can be found on the website of your brokerage and on other financial websites mentioned throughout the book and in the appendix. Market capitalization is mentioned earlier. By looking at market cap, investors can classify and compare the size of different companies. Here is the simple formula. Stock price per share x outstanding shares equals market capitalization in summary, market capitalization is the total dollar amount of all outstanding shares at the most recent market price. Investors use this information to compare companies. The largest blue chip companies have the largest market cap. Often, these companies grow slowly with less risk. These are the stocks that large institutions put in their portfolio. On the other hand, many short-term traders flock to volatile small-cap stocks that have bigger price swings. The size of the market cap has nothing to do with whether you should buy a stock. A small-cap stock may be a better buy than an expensive large-cap stock. It is a personal choice which to buy.
The main point is that looking at a company only by stock price gives an inaccurate representation of the true value of a company. It's important to look at a number of different factors, and that includes market capitalization. Note, as the share prices change, so does the market capitalization, however, outstanding shares hardly fluctuate at all. The three main market cap categories are large cap, mid cap, and small cap. Large cap stocks are worth between $10 billion and $200 billion. Mid cap medium sized stocks are valued between $2 billion and $10 billion. Small cap stocks are worth between $300 million and $2 by Lion and have the most growth potential. Microcap stocks, i.e., penny stocks, have a market capitalization between $50 million and $300 million and are the riskiest to trade. There is no best answer when it comes to which stocks to buy. Some people invest only in large cap stocks such as Walmart, Coca Cola, Johnson and Johnson, Apple, Boeing, and hundreds more. Why? Those investors believe that stocks of larger corporations are safer to own and will not tumble in price. Nowadays, thanks to companies like Sears, Lehman Brothers, and Enron, we know that even large cap corporations can go bankrupt. Other investors are more comfortable buying mid cap stocks that still have room to grow and become a large cap stock. Many investors and traders prefer to buy nimble small cap or micro cap stocks because they believe there is a real chance that the prices will double or triple in value. However, small cap stocks come with a higher risk that the business will fail. Buying stock in very small companies is an example of taking more risk to seek a higher reward. Note, it is more difficult for the price of large cap stocks to double or triple. For the stock price of a large cap stock to double from $50 to $100, for example, the company would have to increase in value from $100 billion to $200 billion, not impossible, but difficult. My suggestion. The best way to learn more about these terms is to go on the internet and look at different stocks. Compare the market cap and other fundamental data. By comparing this information between different stocks, you will get a very good idea of which stocks have the largest market caps and which have the smallest. There is no correct answer about which stocks are best. It depends on whether you are a long-term investor, it's possible you are attracted to mid-cap and large-cap stocks, or a short-term trader, you may prefer small-cap stocks. Of course, some short-term traders trade large-cap stocks and some long-term investors search for small-cap stocks. It's a personal choice what to buy, now that you know how stocks are evaluated. The float we can't discuss market capitalization without discussing float. For many people, float is more important than market cap. Float refers to the number of shares available for trading. The more shares available for trading i.e., high float the less volatile and more stable the stock price. Typica. Lee, more than 100 million shares available is considered to be a high float. Stocks with a low float, i.e., fewer than 20 million shares available, are often more volatile and tend to undergo larger price changes by percentage during the day. That is why many short term traders are attracted to these stocks. Many stocks that are low float are also low priced, i.e., less than $10 to $15 per share. The float can be found on the internet. Stocks with an extremely high float typically don't move that much during the day unless there is a major news event. These high float stocks are favored by long-term investors and institutions because they are not only less volatile but more predictable. Walmart, Home Depot, Apple, and Microsoft, to name only a few, have a high float. Note, let's say that a small cap stock, XYZ, has 20 million shares in total, but 16 million shares are held by company insiders and are not available for trading. Therefore, in this example, the company's float is 4 million shares, 20 million, 16 million. 
This is the number of shares available for trading. In this example, XYZ has a low float. Stock splits. Making stock more affordable a stock split occurs when the board of directors decides to issue more shares of stock to its shareholders. For example, when a corporation announces a two-for-one stock split, every shareholder receives one additional share for each share held, thereby doubling the number of shares outstanding. This is not a financial windfall. In fact, the company is worth exactly what it was worth prior to the split. Every shareholder will own twice as many shares, each with one half the value of the original shares. Even though there is no economic gain, market participants tend to like stock splits because the stock price usually increases after a split is announced. One theory for that rise is that a lower-priced stock attracts more small investors, and the increased demand results in a price boost. That's just an idea with no way to prove or disprove its accuracy. From a mathematical perspective, nothing has changed. You own twice as many shares, but because the stock price was reduced by half, the value of your investment is exactly the same. You could also see a 3FOR1, 4FOR1, or any other stock split ratio. A split is often done for psychological reasons, more than anything else. A stock split doesn't change the corporation's financial condition. As mentioned above, the biggest advantage of the stock split is that it may bring in more investors, perhaps those who felt that they couldn't afford to buy stock at a higher price. There are also practical reasons for a company to split its stock. For example, do you know what would happen if an extremely successful corporation never split its stock? Think about Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's corporation. At one time, Berkshire Hathaway was trading at over $450,000 per share. This is not a typo. Most people cannot afford to own even one share at that price. From a practical standpoint, stock splits do make sense for some corporations. Splitting the stock is purely an accounting or marketing procedure designed to make the stock more enticing to investors. Reverse splits. A red flag some corporations do something called a reverse split. When the stock price is quite low, the board of directors may use a reverse split to reduce the number of shares outstanding. Reverse splits are often done for psychological reasons with the hope that a higher stock price will boost shareholder confidence. This corporate action only affects the stock price and not the value of the company. For example, to pump up the stock price, the board might do a 1 FOR 10, or 1 to 10, reverse split. After the reverse split, the market value of your shares remains unchanged, but you own fewer shares. Consider a reverse split as a warning sign, because it is typically done after the stock price has tumbled. When a company does a reverse split and is artificially raising the stock price, it may be time to think about selling. I hope you have a better understanding of these important investment concepts. Let's change gears and move to the method you have heard so much about, technical analysis. I assume there are many of you eager to learn everything you can about this topic. If you are new to technical analysis, you will be entering a completely different world. Technical analysis is the domain of short-term traders who rely on this method to identify trends, overbought or oversold stocks, and entry and exit points. Even if you are an investor, you should learn how to read a stock chart as well as learn a few basic technical indicators. I will point out the most important ones. Get ready for a fascinating introduction. Part 4 Introduction to Technical Analysis In this part, I will teach you how to evaluate stocks and other financial products using technical analysis. This is the playground of short-term traders and wise investors who use indicators and oscillators to navigate treacherous markets. Technical analysis offers important clues to market or stock direction. It also helps to minimize risk by warning of dangerous market conditions. Traders and investors can benefit by becoming familiar with how these tools work. 
Although many people rely on hunches and feelings about what to buy or sell, or listen to acquaintances for trading advice, I urge you not to take this path. Instead, learn basic technical analysis, and you can make trading decisions using tools that are given to you for free. Note. Your brokerage software has charting software that should meet your needs. If you need a free charting program that includes all indicators and oscillators as well as an explanation of how they work, I recommend Stockcharts http colon slash slash www.stockcharts.com, but there are dozens of other websites with charting tools, a list of these websites is in the appendix. Chapter 11 Let's get technical Let's pretend that you are a doctor with a new patient who has come to your office for a checkup. You may start by having the patient fill out a questionnaire asking about his medical history and that of his family. If you relate this preparation to the stock market, this is fundamental analysis. You may also give the patient an electrocardiogram, EKG, which can identify potential problems. Studying the EKG is similar to examining a chart of the stock market. This is called technical analysis. By using fundamental or technical analysis, you can discover stocks worth buying or evaluate the stocks that you have heard about. This is far better than relying on tips from a tout on TV or a casual acquaintance. Learning how to evaluate stocks is a necessary skill for anyone who invests money in the market. As you'll discover, technical analysis is as much art as science. Although everyone looks at the same data, everyone has different interpretations. The hard part is using the data to generate useful information and make actionable trades. No matter whether you are an investor or a trader, you have two main choices. You can research the company and focus on its earnings and balance sheet. This is fundamental analysis. Or you can study stock prices and trends and look at technical indicators on a chart, this is technical analysis. A third choice would be to hire others to do the analysis. One of the smartest ways to use technical analysis is in conjunction with fundamental analysis. First, select a stock based on strong fundamentals. Next, use technical analysis to decide when to enter and exit identify trends, or determine when a stock is overbought or oversold. I recommend that you consider both methods, because each has its strengths and weaknesses. Note, you will learn about fundamental analysis in more detail in part 5. What is technical analysis? By studying a stock's past price movement on a chart, you can make assumptions about future price movements. This is the theory behind technical analysis. In theory, the shorter the time frame, the more accurate the predictions are likely to be. Technical analysis is the study of momentum, volume, and trends. It ignores company performance, economic factors, and industry conditions. In addition, as noted above, technical analysis provides important clues and information about when to buy or sell whether a stock is overbought or oversold, and market psychology, where the crowds are investing, also known as herd mentality. Have you ever heard the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words? If you have, then you'll appreciate technical analysis, because it relies on charts and indicators rather than emotions to help with buy and sell decisions. Although extremely useful, Technical analysis is not always clear-cut, because it often provides clues rather than definitive signals. It is up to each trader to interpret the signals correctly before placing a trade. Fortunately, technical analysis is not that difficult to learn, though it does take some time. Note. My book on technical indicators, all about market indicators, McGraw-Hill, was designed to help beginners understand and use market indicators. It also includes interviews with the designers of many of the most popular indicators. The market. The most powerful indicator in the world before we start digging further into technical analysis, I want you to be aware of one indicator that is more important than any other. 
This indicator, which is the market itself, always has the final word. It is represented by the major indexes including five of the most popular, the Dow Jones Industrial Average DJIA, S&P 500, SPX, NASDAQ 100, NDX, Russell 2000, IWM, and Wilshire 5000. Figure 11.1 shows a three-month daily chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. As you can see from the chart, after a rough September, the DJIA reversed direction and rallied through October. The rally turned into a strong uptrend, which you will learn about later in this chapter. On November 8, the uptrend appeared to have topped out, meaning sellers overtook buyers at that price level. Figure 11.1 Daily Chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average Courtesy of StockCharts.com Note, the other three lines displayed on the chart are moving averages, which you will learn more about in the next chapter. Also, note the volume bars, explained in the next section, at the bottom of the chart. The Stock Chart Trends If you are an investor, I urge you to learn to use and interpret a simple stock chart because it helps identify trends, the direction in which the stock price is moving. A stock chart displays the movement of a stock's price over a specific time frame. For example, let's say you own shares in Boeing BA. If you plan to hold the stock, one look at a three-month stock chart helps you to evaluate how the stock performed in the PA. In this example, over the last three months. Therefore, if Boeing were in a three-month downtrend, would it be wise to buy more stock as it moves lower? Or should you wait before buying until the decline ends? This is one of the reasons why stock charts are so useful, in conjunction with using indicators and oscillators. You can also use charts to make forecasts about a stock price, or at the very least, to improve the odds that a trade will be successful. Looking at a chart helps keep your emotions out of the decision-making process. You may love the company and the product it sells, but if the chart shows that the stock is weak and headed lower, you probably want to avoid buying it at this time. It's easy to find a stock chart for any company. Your brokerage firm has detailed charts on its website, or you can go to almost any financial website mentioned in this book. The easiest way to view stock performance is through a chart of its price history. Time frames. Charts can be displayed to show data in many formats. The first decision is choosing a time frame. For example, you can select a short time period, minutes or hours, or you might choose the popular daily chart. Others prefer a longer time period, a weekly or monthly chart. Some traders look at several charts at the same time, each with a different time frame. If you are a beginner, you may wonder which period is best. This depends on whether you are a trader or an investor. I recommend using the default that comes with the program, which is a three-month daily chart. You can always change the defaults later. Also, feel free to experiment with different time frames to see which is the most helpful. Note, day traders use short time frames such as a 5-minute, 15-minute, 30-minute, or 60-minute chart. Some will compare it against a daily chart for a longer-term view. Long-term investors may use the daily, weekly, or monthly. It's always a good idea to look at the bigger picture, because it can serve as a reality check. Volume Another important piece of information on every stock chart is volume, which shows how many shares changed hands during a given time period, usually one day. Trading volume is displayed by a vertical bar at the bottom of any stock chart, C, for example, figure 11.1. The higher the bar, the heavier the volume. The lower the bar, the lighter the volume. It is important to track volume because that is the fuel that drives stock prices higher or L. W or by studying volume in addition to market direction, you can evaluate the strength of the uptrend or downtrend. Volume also reflects the level of positive or negative enthusiasm for a stock. 
For example, if a stock price increased that day, and volume increased, that is positive sentiment. On the other hand, if a stock price decreased that day, and volume decreased, that is negative sentiment. Many technicians use volume to confirm what they see on a chart. For example, if volume is strong, that confirms that the current trend or price is justified. On the other hand, if volume is weak, that is a clue that the trend or price is at risk of reversing. Be aware of this danger sign. Sometimes volume moves in the opposite direction from the stock price. When that happens, it could be a warning that the stock may reverse direction. For example, a stock moving higher on low volume is a clue that though the stock is moving higher, there is a lack of buyers. That is not a good sign for the stock. Three types of charts There are three chart types most commonly used to display information about a stock, or other financial products such as an ETF, the line chart, bar chart, and candlestick chart. Try all of them and choose which works best for you and your trading strategies. Line charts are popular because they are so visually appealing, which is why they are used on TV and in many books. Bar charts are favored by many traders because they come across as a simplified version of the candlestick chart. The candlestick chart is the most popular because it reveals so much information about the stock price. Let's look at an example of each of the three types. Line chart A line is drawn to connect the closing prices of a stock for a specific time period. On a chart, it is displayed as a single, continuous line that connects each price point. Although line charts are easy to read and interpret, they don't provide a huge amount of detailed information. Line charts are most useful when combined with other technical indicators such as moving averages. Figure 11.1, shown earlier, is an example of a line chart. Bar chart A bar chart provides information about a stock's open, close, high, and low prices. For example, the horizontal scale at the bottom of the chart represents the opening and closing prices for a specific time period, which can range from minutes to years. The vertical scale plots the high and low prices for a specific time per OD. The bar is the stock's price range for the time period. For example, if looking at a daily chart, the bottom of the bar represents the lowest value or print of the day. The top of the bar represents the highest price of the day. Attached to the bar are two ticks, or hash marks, one that extends to the right and the other to the left. The left tick reflects the opening price of the trading day. The right tick represents the closing price. Bar charts, although not as detailed as candlesticks, explained next provide enough information to traders to make the charts useful, especially in the hands of a skilled technician. Figure 11.2 is an example of a bar chart. Figure 11.2 bar chart. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Candlestick charts Candlestick charts are the oldest form of technical analysis, some attributing this method back to the 18th century. That's when a shrewd Japanese rice trader, Moon Hisahoma, used candlestick charts to become wealthy. It was reported that he once made 100 consecutive successful trades using this chart type. Steve Nissen, an American trader, introduced candlesticks to the West in 1991 after visiting Japan. Candlestick charts are popular because the patterns are easy to interpret and simple to use, but can also expand to more complex patterns. Most importantly, they provide clues to market psychology, which helps to determine who is in control, the bears or bulls. For example, this information can be used to decide when to enter or exit the market before a major reversal. Candlesticks also tell traders when to stay on the sidelines. Perhaps the market is too volatile and unpredictable on that day, so it's better not to trade at all. For these reasons, it's worth your time to learn candlestick charting. Although basic candlestick patterns are recognizable and relatively easy to learn, the deeper you study this method, the more complex the patterns you'll learn. 
At the most basic level, beginners can use candlesticks to decipher major patterns and perhaps make an actionable trade based on what they see on the chart. Candlesticks use two-dimensional bodies to show the range between the opening and closing stock price during any given time period. The low and high prices are plotted as a single line, i.e., shadows. The price range between the opening and closing prices is plotted as a narrow rectangle, i.e., the real body. Candlestick colors The candlestick chart displays different allures such as green bullish, and red bearish, but how the colors are displayed depends on your brokerage software, which can be customized. In this book, you will see solid or hollow candlesticks, see below. The following are the basic candlestick colors, you may see colors on your screen that differ from the examples below. Green candlesticks occur when the close is higher than the previous close. Red candlesticks occur when the close is below the previous close. Solid candlesticks occur when the current closing price is lower than the same time period's opening price. Hollow candlesticks occur when the current closing price is higher than the same time period's opening price. Figure 11.3 is an example of a candlestick chart. Figure 11.3 candlestick chart. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Candlestick analysis. Studying the shape of the candlestick, the length of its lines, and whether the real body is empty or filled reveals whether the bulls or bears are winning the battle. In addition, a candlestick has different shapes that stretch and move as the stock moves higher and lower. The patterns created from the candlestick provide clues to future market direction. The patterns also help traders determine the strength or weakness of the buying or selling. For example, on any particular day, if the bulls are in charge, the chart will show a tall green real body. If the bears are in charge, a long red real body is displayed. Trading volume helps confirm the validity of the price movement. As you may have guessed, there is a ton of information contained in one candlestick chart. Figure 11.4 shows the main components of a candlestick. Figure 11.4 Candlestick Components Courtesy of StockCharts.com the doji some candlestick patterns are common and show up often on a chart. One example is the doji, which reflects indecision, see figure 11.5. The doji is characterized by small, thin lines i.e., shadows, also known as hash marks, that extend out showing such a negligible difference between the opening and closing prices that they are nearly equal. It's the cross in the doji that reflects uncertainty. There is a stalemate between buyers and sellers, and the doji pattern displays that on a chart. Figure 11.5 The doji. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. A large number of books have been written about candlesticks, teaching pattern recognition and what action to take. Should you buy or sell stocks base? Solely on a candlestick chart? No. After recognizing a pattern, confirm the information with traditional technical indicators. Using candlesticks in addition to other technical indicators can help give you an edge over other traders. I know that many new traders are intimidated by candlesticks. The matrix of squiggly lines and patterns moving in different directions can be confusing. Be patient, because as you gain experience, the patterns and shapes begin to make sense. Let's continue our discussion, turning our attention to one of the most basic concepts of technical analysis, support and resistance. Identifying support and resistance on a chart is required if you want to understand and use technical analysis. Support and resistance Recognizing support and resistance on a chart is important to traders because it helps identify when to buy or sell, which improves the probability of making a winning trade. Speaking from experience, I've found that even when support or resistance is identified on a chart, it is not easy to know the best time to enter or exit a position. With practice, however, it gets easier. Support. When buyers win the battle when a stock is falling, there are specific prices where enough buyers step in to buy the shares, 
thereby supporting the price and preventing it from falling further, sometimes only temporarily. Some traders refer to it as a floor. Support is the price level at which the stock price found support the last time it traded at this level. The demand for the stock is strong enough to prevent sellers from driving the stock price lower. When this happens, buyers are in temporary control. Support is often at whole dollar amounts, because people tend to enter orders at whole numbers. To find support levels, study charts to see how the stock price reacted in the past. The three-month chart in figure 11.6 illustrates how the stock touched, or nearly touched, support three times at $60 per share. Figure 11.6 support. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. If a stock declines below a certain price point, often at moving averages, and continues to fall, technicians describe that stock as, breaking through support. When support fails, it is a bad sign for the bulls. There weren't enough buyers to hold up, support, the stock at that price level. When support is broken, it's a significant sell signal. If the stock price remains below the support level and doesn't bounce back, the sell signal is I. Tact. Short-term traders are constantly scanning charts to identify whether a stock breaks through support or holds support. According to technicians, no matter how good the fundamentals or how much you love a given stock, when it breaks through support on increasing volume, you should consider selling. Resistance. When sellers win the battle resistance is the opposite of support. When a stock price is rising, there are prices where sellers step in and prevent the stock from gaining further. Resistance is the price level at which a stock price has stopped rising and sellers take temporary control. Some traders refer to it as a ceiling. Figure 11.7 is an example of resistance at $75.50 per share. Figure 11.7 Resistance. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. When the stock appears to be repelled or struggles to move higher, many traders sell their shares on the assumption that the stock will stall and reverse. At least temporarily, there isn't enough demand for the stock to overwhelm sellers, so the price does not move higher. Breaking through resistance If a stock is able to rise above resistance, technicians say it, broke through resistance. It is common for stocks to break through resistance and move much higher. It indicates that the stock is strong and can be bought as it moves higher. Technicians tend to wait until after a stock breaks through resistance before making a trade. Using support and resistance in real life in hindsight, it looks easy to identify when to buy or sell by looking at a stock chart. After the market closes, support and resistance price levels are often obvious. Unfortunately, during a live trading day, it is difficult to buy and sell based solely on support and resistance. The biggest problem. There are numerous, head fakes, also known as false breakouts. For example, a rising stock may quickly break above resistance and appear to be unstoppable. It may seem like a good time to buy shares, so you do. Soon after buying, the stock unexpectedly reverses direction, and the price moves lower. This happens frequently. It's hard to know when a rising stock has the power and strength to trend higher throughout the trading session, or instead reverse. In addition, a falling stock that breaks below support levels might appear to be headed lower until the end of the trading day, only to reverse direction to the upside just after your position is sold. This phenomenon is famous for tricking many a C. One trader. As you learn more about technical analysis, including how to use support and resistance levels to make a profit, don't be in a rush to learn all the concepts at once. It takes time to understand how to use the charts to earn profits, but for the sake of your trading account, it's worth the effort. Hint. Although short-term whipsaws such as the above are common, the solution is to have a strategy. This helps you decide whether to reduce risk by selling losing positions or to add to winning positions. 
Understanding trends One of the main purposes of charting is to spot trends in their early stages. Remember, a trend is the direction in which a stock, or other security, is moving, or is expected to move, over an unspecified time period. Stock prices rarely move in a straight line, which is why spotting the trend direction is so important. Regardless of which chart type you use, it's essential to understand that every stock or ETF moves in one of three directions, up, down, or sideways. Whether you are a trader or investor, spotting short-term or long-term trends should be one of your goals. During a bull market, the long-term trend is up. During a bear market, the long-term trend tends to be down. There is an old trader saying, the trend is your friend until it ends. The idea is to ride a trend higher or lower until it runs out of steam. Unfortunately, it's easy to spot a short-term trend but it's difficult to determine when that trend will change direction. Traders use a variety of methods to try to identify when a trend ends. If you were able to consistently determine when a trend changes direction, you would make a fortune. Many technicians spend their days trying to identify major or minor trend changes, or determine whether the current trend will continue in the same direction, or end. If you are bullish about a stock or the overall market, the goal is to participate in uptrends while avoiding downtrends. If you are bearish about a stock or the overall market, the goal is to participate in downtrends while avoiding trend reversals to the upside. Being able to evaluate the trend of the overall market, or stock, is a key factor in determining your success as a trader. Correctly identifying market direction gives you a better idea of whether to participate or avoid trading. Note. There are short-term and long-term trends. Traders attempt to profit from short-term trends, whereas investors ignore day t. Day market fluctuations and hold during long-term trends. Identifying and reacting to short-term trend changes is not that important if you plan to hold stocks for the long-term, i.e., years. Let's review the following in more detail. Uptrend, downtrend, and sideways trend. Uptrend when a stock is grinding higher, it's in an uptrend. Short-term traders rely on technical analysis to buy stocks that are trending higher, this strategy is called trend following. Following an uptrend is considered one of the easiest and most profitable strategies ever created. Instead of trying to guess which direction the market will go, simply follow the markets or a stock's direction. During a bull market, and even in a bear market, there are always certain stocks in an uptrend, which can last for a day, week, month, or years. The hard part for traders is determining how long the uptrend will last. That is why they use technical tools to estimate when the trend appears to be coming to an end or has already ended. We will discuss these tools in the next chapter. Sometimes stocks rise so quickly that they break out above the current price level and move dramatically higher, which is profitable for anyone holding that stock. On the other hand, some uptrends end abruptly and reverse direction. These reversals are extremely difficult to predict, which is why traders don't hold their positions indefinitely. They trade according to what the technical indicators and oscillators are signaling. If your stock is in an uptrend, hold it as long as possible or until your indicators give clues to sell. It takes patience to hold during a trend, primarily because of head fakes that may make you believe the trend has ended. Figure 11.8 shows a daily chart of the exchange-traded fund QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100 index. As you can see in this chart, after a rocky start, QQQ trended higher almost all day. On this day, it is in a strong uptrend. Figure 11.8 Strong Uptrend. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Downtrend a stock or ETF in a downtrend tends to move lower and lower. Sometimes stocks move down so quickly and with such magnitude that it can be called a plunge. If you are holding a stock or index that is in a downtrend, you are most likely losing money, depending on the strategy you are using. 
Downtrends are frustrating for bullish investors and traders, but they don't have to be. There are ways to profit from a downtrend, you will learn so. E of the ways in chapter 18. An alternative is to patiently wait until a new uptrend emerges. If you are a trader who can identify the beginning of a downtrend, you may want to reduce your holdings, especially when the decline is accompanied by high volume, which typically means that many institutions are selling. If a stock is in a downtrend but stops falling or recedes, it's likely that by the dippers have entered, looking for bargains. However, that does not necessarily signal the end of the downtrend. Although downtrends can lose steam after a few hours or days, a long-lasting downtrend brings fear to the minds and hearts of bullish investors. A continuous downtrend may turn into the dreaded bear market, defined as a stock market decline of 20% or more from its previous high point. The good news is that although short-term downtrends are common, a downtrend that lasts years doesn't happen too often, although downtrends that last for months occur periodically. In figure 11.9, you see the S&P 500 SPX moving sideways for most of the day, then sinking after 2 p.m. The downtrend continued right into the close. Figure 11.9 downtrend. Courtesy of stockcharts.com. Sideways trend a sideways trend is really no trend at all because the price changes are so small. Basically, in a sideways trend, the stock doesn't stray far from where it began. A sideways pattern is displayed either as a relatively flat line on a stock chart or as a more volatile line that stays locked in a defined, price range. When a stock moves sideways, technicians say the stock is consolidating before it breaks out of the consolidation pattern, either higher or lower. A consolidation pattern appears on the chart as a very compressed line that hardly fluctuates at all. When the sideways pattern ends, it could move violently, or it could move very little. Its ending is unpredictable. It's not surprising to see a stock or index meander in a sideways pattern for long or short time periods and then suddenly break out in one direction or the other. Because these breakouts are impossible to predict, it's often best to avoid trading when a sideways pattern appears on a chart. For traders, the sideways pattern is challenging. If you are a trader and experience a sideways stock pattern, I suggest that you sit on the sidelines until the market or stock makes up its mind in which direction it wants to go. Figure 11.10 shows the Dow Jones Induster. Al average in a sideways trend. Figure 11.10 Sideways Trend. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Note. Although stocks often move sideways during the day or for even longer, sometimes the overall market becomes a lengthy sideways market. During a sideways market, volatility is low and neither the bulls nor bears gain an edge, although short-term traders and some option traders can find opportunities. It takes a lot of patience to invest during a sideways market because profits are often elusive. Trend reversals You already know about the importance of identifying market and stock trends. Once you become more familiar with the stock market, you should closely analyze trends to help anticipate future stock direction. One big challenge when using technical analysis is determining when a stock trend has run out of steam and reverses direction. However, while reversals are difficult to predict, indicators often give clues about when a new tradable trend begins and when it ends. In essence, this is what the stock market is all about. Trends move higher, lower, and sideways. Although investors aren't usually concerned with short-term trends, traders must watch them closely if they want to survive and thrive in the market. Hint. It's not important to learn why the market trend ended or reversed direction. What is important is recognizing what is happening. Figure 11.11 is an example of a trend reversal. On June 21, the stock price broke above its 100-day moving average. Around July 1, it broke above its 50-day moving average and held support on July 19. 
It rallied strongly from mid-July to mid-August, peaking on August 16. A double-top formation developed. After a second retest of the high on August 23, the stock price abruptly reversed direction. It broke below its 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages. This signaled the end of the uptrend and the start of a new downtrend, until it bounced on October 12, attempting another assault on its 200-day moving average. Although many traders attempt to predict a trend reversal before it happens, it's remarkably difficult. Nevertheless, there are often subtle clues of what may occur. For example, a stock that was previously in an uptrend may stall and appear to run out of gas, then drop below its moving average look at figure 11.11. If that occurs, the reversal is confirmed. You will learn about moving averages in the next chapter. There are two main types of reversals. The first is the intra. I reversal. Intraday reversals are trend changes that occur within the same trading day. Short-term traders are focused on intraday reversals. Figure 11.11 Trend Reversal. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. The other type is the long-term trend reversal, in which stock prices change direction after months or years. Long-term investors are focused on these. Note. It takes excellent market timing skills as well as the ability to manage risk to trade trend reversals. Before identifying a reversal, use more than one technical indicator to confirm your analysis. Drawing trend lines now that you know about stock charts, here's a cool thing you can also do on your charting package, draw trend lines. Have you ever played the game Connect the Dots? This is what it's like when drawing trend lines, instead of dots, you connect a series of highs and lows on a chart to confirm a trend. One of the first actions many technicians take is drawing trend lines. It helps them to determine when to enter or exit a stock position or what direction the trend is moving. The alternative is using the infamous eye test, which is not very technical at all, and it's easy to make mistakes using it. Hint. Check with your brokerage firm to make sure its charting package supports drawing tools. Then use the tools to connect lower highs and higher highs or vice versa. You can either create a single trend line or create a channel, which is a stock price moving between two parallel trend lines. See the next note. Advanced note. If you draw two trend lines, one for the top and one for the bottom, you create a channel or envelope. They are parallel lines that are drawn along the tops and bottoms of the highs and lows. Creating a channel helps to determine price targets. By drawing trend lines, when a stock or index makes higher highs and higher lows, this occurs in an uptrend, you can see it on a chart. Conversely, you can also see if a stock price is making lower lows and lower highs, this occurs in a downtrend. An increase in volume can boost momentum. Now that you have a basic understanding of stock charts and trends, in the next chapter you will learn how to use indicators and oscillators to determine when to enter or exit a position and to identify overbought or oversold conditions. You may find that indicators and oscillators are easier to read and interpret because they are mathematically based and therefore more precise. Chapter 12 Indicators and Oscillators In the previous chapter, you were introduced to the main features of technical analysis. Here I present a few of the most useful tools used by technicians. Even long-term investors should find these indicators and oscillators helpful. They are especially invaluable to short-term traders. The technical indicators you will learn to use in this chapter include moving averages, relative strength index RSI, Bollinger Bands, volume, and the VIX. Introducing indicators and oscillators Technical analysts use tools such as indicators and oscillators to determine when to enter or exit a position or to detect if the market or a stock is overbought or oversold. Overbought is a technical term used to describe a security that has been subjected to continuous buying pressure and is due for a price correction. 
Oversold is a technical term used to describe a security that has been subjected to continuous selling pressure and is due for a price rebound. Traders also use oscillators to help with their buying and selling decisions. Just as a carpenter needs a hammer to build a house and a golfer needs the best clubs, traders and investors need indicators. By the time you finish this chapter, you should have a better understanding of how to use these tools to provide insights into market or stock direction. Another reason to use indicators is to help keep your emotions in check. When used properly, indicators often act as an early warning system, alerting you to potentially dangerous or profitable market conditions. Indicators are also used to identify when a market or individual stock might reverse direction. Finally, traders use indicators to monitor the market trend up, down, or sideways. For all these reasons, it is worthwhile to learn about indicators. No one rings a bell when the market or stock reaches a top or bottom, so you must rely on tools such as indicators and oscillators to signal which way the market is blowing. Using indicators to anticipate direction increases the odds that a trade will be successful. But remember that technical indicators and oscillators are merely tools, there is no guarantee that using them leads to profits. They are not the holy grail. Although there are hundreds of technical indicators and oscillators, you only need to monitor a handful. Traders with two, any tools often get overwhelmed, especially when the signals are contradictory. This phenomenon is known as analysis paralysis. Traders have so many signals that they end up doing nothing at all. I learned from experience and experimentation that it makes more sense to use indicators and oscillators as clues rather than the final word. Consider them as one piece of a puzzle that we call the stock market. I'm limiting this discussion to the top three indicators and oscillators. To learn more about other indicators, there are many books on the subject including my book all about market indicators, McGraw-Hill. My book is unique because it includes interviews with several of the people who created the indicators. Let's begin with my personal favorite, the one indicator that nearly all technicians have on their chart. Moving averages. A simple but powerful indicator a moving average MA, is the most basic and, in my opinion, the most valuable technical indicator ever created. When displayed on a chart, it provides a visual image and actionable signals. In other words, the moving average helps with your buy-or-sell decisions, and it helps to identify when a trend begins or ends. Most traders compare the stock or index price with its moving averages before making a trade decision. That is one of the simplest and fastest ways to determine if you are trading with or against the trend. Richard Donchian, who developed a variety of moving averages while working at investment firms, used them with his trend following system. Moving averages show the average stock price over a specific number of trading days such as the last 20, 50, 100, or 200 days. By overlaying the moving average on top of an individual stock, index, or ETF price chart, one can instantly see the direction in which the stock or index is headed. The average is moving, because every day, the oldest data point is removed and replaced with the most current. To be technical, the moving average is calculated by taking the average closing price over the last 50, or other number, of days. As the 51st day is added, the first day is dropped. Because the data is constantly changing, the average is called a, moving average. By repeating this process every day, a smooth line on the chart is created. Trend followers prefer to follow moving averages Becca say they can quickly identify the trend's direction and detect potential reversals. To see how to use moving averages, select the simple moving average SMA on any stock chart. When the chart is displayed, the 50-day and 200-day moving averages typically appear as the default settings. Add other moving averages, the 100-day moving average, for example, if you wish.
Short-term traders often choose even shorter time periods including the 14-day or 20-day moving average. Many traders display moving averages with multiple time frames. Note. Instead of the simple moving average, you can also choose the exponential moving average. The exponential moving average gives greater weight to the more recent closing prices, providing a more price-sensitive reading. It's a personal choice which type of moving average to use. You can try both to see which one fits your trading style, but at first start with the simple moving average. If you have never used moving averages, you're in for a surprise. Even investors who don't follow most technical indicators pay close attention to moving averages. Think of moving averages as your new best friend, because they keep you on the right side of a trend. They will keep you out of trouble, as a good friend should. Figure 12.1 is a daily chart of the S&P 500, SPX, with the 20, 50, and 100-day moving averages. It shows SPX falling below and then rising above its moving averages. Figure 12.1 Moving Averages Courtesy of StockCharts.com Moving average trading signals Here are the most basic signals to look for when using moving averages. 1. Buy. If the index or stock crosses above its 50, 100, or 200-day moving averages, and remains above, that is often a signal to buy. Use other indicators to confirm that the buy signal is valid. 2. Sell. If the index or stock crosses below its 50, 100, or 200-day moving averages, and remains below, that is often a signal to sell. Again, use other indicators to confirm the validity of the signal. Note. The shorter the time interval, such as the 14-day and 20-day moving averages, the more signals are generated. Hint. Many traders use moving averages to identify support and resistance levels, which we discussed in the previous chapter. Short-term traders often use the 14 and 20-day moving averages on a daily chart to look for signals. A swing. Raider may use the 50-day moving average. Long-term investors tend to use the 200-day moving average for buy and sell signals. For a more significant long-term signal, consider using moving averages with the weekly, rather than the daily, time period. A simple trading system that has worked for long-term investors is buying the indexes when they move above their 200-day moving averages, and selling when they drop below. Although this simple strategy has generated consistent profits in the past, there is no guarantee it will work in the future. Nevertheless, it's been proved to be an effective strategy over many decades. Although you should not base all trading decisions solely on moving averages, or any other technical indicator, this indicator is still one of the most effective ever created. If I were forced to choose one indicator to help with trading decisions, I would choose moving averages. Note. Another powerful indicator that takes moving averages to an even higher level is MACD, Moving Average Convergence Divergence. It is a sophisticated but extremely useful indicator that I discuss in my follow-up book, How to Profit in the Stock Market. Moving averages aren't perfect. The main criticism of moving averages is that they are slow to react to market conditions, so their signals are often late. Hence, moving averages are called a lagging indicator. On the other hand, moving averages are not designed to catch tops or bottoms but to help identify trends. For that reason alone, it is remarkably worthwhile to use moving averages on a chart. Relative Strength Index along with its cousin, Stochastics, Relative Strength Index, RSI, is extremely popular with traders because it helps to determine whether a security is overbought or oversold. RSI is typically displayed near the top of any chart. If it is not visible, select RSI from the chart's drop-down menu. J. Wells Wilder, an airline mechanic and engineer, created RSI in 1976 after learning how to trade commodities. 
RSI is a simple but effective technical oscillator that oscillates or moves up and down between 0 and 100. To be technical, it is a single line momentum oscillator that moves between 0 and 100 with a default setting of 14 days. Although based on complicated mathematical formulas, RSI is extremely easy to use and interpret. You can use RSI on any time frame, but most use it on a daily or weekly period. One of the best ways to use RSI is to warn of potential reversals. When a stock gets overbought, although the price can keep trending higher, the probability of a reversal increases substantially. Keep in mind that a stock can remain overbought for long time periods before reversing. Nevertheless, RSI warns that the stock is in the danger zone. Conversely, when a stock gets oversold, although it can keep going lower, the odds of a reversal have increased. Once again, a stock can remain oversold for long time periods before reversing. RSI signals here are the two main signals to look for when using RSI. 1. Overbought. If the RSI line rises above 70, and stays above, that's an overbought signal. 2. Oversold. If the RSI line drops below 30, and stays below, that's an oversold signal. If you own a stock that is in the danger zone above 70 for overbought or below 30 for oversold although it could reverse direction, RSI cannot tell you exactly when. For example, I have seen RSI hit 90 on certain stocks, and yet the stock price continued climbing higher. Even though the stock was ridiculously overbought, it became even more overbought. Conversely, if RSI falls below 30, that is a flashing red warning sign that the underlying stock or index is oversold. Again, it doesn't mean a reversal is imminent, but it does point out that the selling was overdone. The underlying security is due for a snapback rally. Nevertheless, be careful about using RSI to time the market. Instead, use RSI as a signal to alert you to when a security overextends to the upside or downside. Experienced technicians will use it for timing purposes, but it's most useful as an early warning system. Think of the terms overbought and oversold more like flexible guidelines than a hard and fast rule. For example, one mistake that beginners sometimes make is selling a stock as soon as RSI hits 70. Then they watch in shock as the underlying stock moves higher, becoming even more overbought. It is not necessarily a sell signal when RSI touches 70, nor a buy signal when RSI touches 30. Oversold and overbought are similar to hot and cold readings on a thermometer, as trader Alexander Elder put it. Note, you can look at RSI on a daily or on a weekly chart. I have found that the weekly RSI gives a smoother, less volatile signal, especially when used with indexes such as the S&P 500, NASDAQ, or Dow or with ETFs such as SPY and QQQ. Figure 12.2 shows RSI at the top of the SPX daily chart. Figure 12.2 RSI. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Note. As you can see in Figure 12.2, RSI is showing that SPX S&P 500 index is extremely overbought at 69.36. Not surprisingly, SPX took a dive shortly after this screenshot was made. How to use RSI to make a trade if you are a beginner? You may be wondering what actions you should take when RSI moves above 70 overbought or below 30 oversold. As you've just read, RSI is not designed to precisely time when to buy or sell. There are other indicators such as stochastics that help with that decision. Stochastics, introduced in my companion book, is a sophisticated momentum oscillator that is useful to experienced traders. To repeat, just because RSI says, i.e., signals that your stock is overbought or oversold doesn't mean to sell immediately. All it is saying is that the stock is in a danger zone and is at risk of reversing. 
It may reverse soon, or it may reverse weeks from now. The point is that you are probably playing with fire by holding this stock for too much longer. For investors, this information may not be of much concern, because they will likely hold no matter what the stock is doing. However, traders want to know when a stock is overbought or oversold. Although it is okay to keep holding the position, keep in mind that based on this oscillator, a reversal is coming though no one knows when. RSI limitations I don't want you to think that RSI, or any other indicator or oscillator, is flawless. If it were, then every trade would work perfectly. Using oscillators such as RSI is often more art than science. The indicators are based on complex mathematical equations, which is a science, but using these indicators to make trading decisions is an art. Although RSI's signals are simple to interpret, they're not perfect. First, RSI generates a lot of signals, some that are false. Thus, you should not react in a knee-jerk fashion to each signal. One suggestion is to use RSI on a weekly chart, rather than a daily one, because there are fewer signals, and with it, fewer potential false signals. When RSI says that certain stocks are overbought or oversold, many TRA. ERs don't act immediately but monitor the stock for a while before buying or selling. Note. I have observed that when RSI shows that major market indexes such as SPX are overbought or oversold above 70 or below 30, and remain at those levels for a while, the chances of a reversal are high. Volume. An underestimated but important indicator volume is the number of shares of stock traded over a given period. It's the fuel that drives stock prices higher or lower. Technicians typically have volume on the bottom of their charts and monitor it closely. By studying the volume bars, they can determine whether volume is strong or weak. Volume also helps determine whether a stock is moving due to true buying or selling interest. In today's environment, billions of shares are traded on the world's exchanges. Most of that daily volume is generated by institutional traders or high-frequency algorithm, or algo traders. Higher or lower volume has always given clues to traders. As discussed in Chapter 11, if the market, or a stock or ETF, is rising on heavy volume, it's considered a positive sign. It confirms the uptrend. On the other hand, if the market, or a stock or ETF, is falling on heavy volume, that is a negative sign. It confirms the downtrend. The bottom line. Volume gives important clues to traders by validating whether an uptrend or downtrend is strong and may continue in the same direction. The higher the volume, the stronger the trend, in theory. Bollinger Bands Bollinger Bands consist of two components. First. There is an upper band and a lower band, displayed in blue or black. There is also a dotted line in the middle between the two bands. This is the default 20-day simple moving average. Here is the key. The stock price tends to bounce around between the upper and lower bands. The price moves, bends, and turns independently of the Bollinger Band. Many traders don't realize that the 20-day moving average line is a key ingredient of Bollinger Bands. It is a moving average because it is constantly adapting to the ever-changing stock prices that are plugged into the formula. Those two bands were purposely and brilliantly designed to be set for two standard deviations above the 20-day moving average. For a stock or the market to pierce the upper or lower bands, it must make a very strong move. Standard deviation is used in statistics to measure risk. Two standard deviations are well outside the norm. Therefore, when a stock tags or pierces through either of the two bands, it is a warning sign. A stock typically won't remain in that condition for too long before changing direction unless the momentum is overwhelmingly strong. At the most basic level, when the stock price rises above the 20-day moving average, it's a bullish sign. When it's below, it's a bearish sign.
As you will learn, there is so much more to Bollinger Bands than this simple crossover signal. Note, because Bollinger Bands are displayed on top of the stock chart, the four lines can be confusing to some traders. After a few practice sessions, however, it usually becomes clearer. Here are two of the most basic Bollinger Band signals, overbought. When a stock or market price pierces the upper band, the security is in overbought territory. Oversold. When the market or stock price pierces the lower band, the security is in oversold territory. Figure 12.3 shows the upper and lower Bollinger Bands displayed on a chart. Figure 12.3 Bollinger Bands. Courtesy of BollingerBands.us. Reminder. Just because a stock is overbought or oversold doesn't mean a reversal is imminent. As you know by now, stocks can remain overbought or oversold for long time periods. I hope you enjoyed reading about some of the most important indicators and oscillators in technical analysis. Before you go, I want to tell you some of the problems not only with indicators, but with technical analysis in general. The problems with technical analysis critics of technical analysis claim that reading stock charts is akin to telling your fortune by reading tea leaves. They claim it is impossible to make predictions about the future based on what happened in the past. Critics claim there is no proof that technical analysis works but those who earn their living from technical analysis only smile at the criticism. It doesn't mean that technical analysis is perfect, however. The biggest problem is that the signals are not always easy to interpret, and worse, you often get false or incomplete information. In hindsight, everything seems obvious, but in the middle of a trade, it's not crystal clear at all, and mistakes are common. Although, GH technical analysis is not flawless, investors and traders should have a basic understanding of this method including how to read stock charts, and more importantly, how to interpret indicators and oscillators. If you decide to use technical analysis, keep it simple. You do not need more than a handful of indicators and oscillators. You don't want to have so many conflicting signals that you're afraid to make the wrong trade. This concludes our discussion about indicators and oscillators. My hope is that I've provided enough information to whet your appetite for further insights into technical analysis. If you are fascinated by the subject and want to learn more, I suggest you read my follow-up book, How to Profit in the Stock Market, which discusses how to use these technical tools and other methods to make a profit. The VIX There are certain indicators that alert us to psychological clues that people might be getting too fearful or too greedy. Understanding where the crowds what Wall Street calls the herd, or investing their money helps you decide how to invest yours. When you find out where the crowds are investing, it is sometimes wise to do the opposite. Sentiment analysis, which I call, reverse psychology, measures the mood of the market. The most popular sentiment indicator is the VIX, the Chicago Board Options Exchange Volatility Index. The VIX estimates the volatility of the S&P 500 index over the next 30 days using the implied volatility of a group of out-of-the-money put and call options. Note. Options are simple contracts that allow the owner to buy, call, or sell put shares of a specific asset at a specified price for a limited time. The VIX gives useful insights into what option traders think will happen to market volatility over the next 30 days. It is often used as a contrarian indicator. For example, when the stock market moves lower, option traders are bearish, and demand for put options exceeds supply, thereby forcing option prices higher. Usually, a lower stock market and the demand for puts cause the VIX to spike. On the other hand, when the stock market moves higher, investors tend to get more complacent and buy fewer put options, and implied volatility decreases, thereby forcing the VIX lower. It probably seems counterintuitive that when opt-on buyers are overly bullish and complacent, according to a declining VIX, the market may move lower.
However, this is how contrarian indicators work. For example, if option buyers are overly bearish and fearful, as depicted by a spiking VIX, the market may move higher. Generally, when the VIX surpasses a 40 reading, there has been panic buying of put options for protection and speculation. In times of extreme volatility, the VIX may move even higher, above 50, but the fear and the panic typically do not last long. When the VIX reaches levels of that magnitude, fear of an outright crash is widespread, and it may signify a severe market correction. For contrarians who have an opposite mindset from that of the crowd, it is a buying opportunity. Although the VIX was not designed to give traders an assessment of fear in the marketplace, it has been used primarily for that purpose. In fact, one of the nicknames for the VIX is the fear index. Hint. Do not use the VIX to time the market. Instead, use it to get an overview of the mood of the market. When the VIX is in the basement conversely, when the VIX is in the basement, below 20, the market tends to be calm, and there is little fear among option traders. The VIX can remain low for long time periods before finally moving higher. If the VIX falls below 12, it indicates that an extreme level of complacency has been reached. When that happens, the market may be at or near a top. There's a saying, when the VIX is low, it's time to go. When the VIX is high, it's time to buy. The VIX is not a perfect indicator. Although it has been effective at identifying emotional extremes, it has an awful track record at calling market tops. The VIX can remain low for months or years without generating a buy or sell signal. Although accurate in spotting complacent or panic-driven markets, it has historically proved to fall short of predicting an imminent reversal. In the next chapter, we will delve a bit deeper into the weeds to learn about various chart patterns. Some traders love trading off patterns, whereas others prefer to use indicators and oscillators because they are so precise. Many traders use both methods. Anyone who is good at identifying patterns on a chart will enjoy reading this introduction to the main patterns. Chapter 13 Basic Chart Patterns Traders who prefer to analyze the market with visuals should enjoy this chapter. Many technicians make trade decisions based on chart patterns, while others prefer indicators and oscillators. Most traders tend to use both methods. Chart patterns are a popular feature of technical analysis. Technicians constantly search for patterns that provide clues to future stock price trends. The theory is that because investors repeat the same trading behavior, certain patterns occur again and again. Chart patterns are one of the tools that technicians use to evaluate how the crowd is trading. In fact, some patterns occur so frequently that technicians give them names. Although no stock price pattern is foolproof, for example, Many patterns are formed but fail to develop, or there are false signals chart patterns work often enough to make them a valuable tool. A skilled technician not only recognizes patterns but trades based on the information they provide. When certain patterns appear, they can help traders avoid disaster, and also help them identify profitable opportunities. The ability to recognize chart patterns takes education and experience. With practice, you may be able to identify some basic patterns. However, don't make a trade simply because you see a certain pattern on a chart. I'm providing you with an introduction to chart patterns. If you are interested in learning more, several books have been written on this topic. I have included a sampling of these in the appendix. Common chart patterns The following patterns are simple to decipher and appear quite frequently on stock charts. They give early warning signs that something important could happen, though unfortunately, there are no guarantees these patterns will turn into profitable trades. Double bottom reversal bullish. Looks like AW, the double bottom is an easily recognizable chart pattern that shows up repeatedly on a stock chart. Even more useful, 
The pattern is obvious to spot if you are looking at the overall market such as the Dow or the S&P 500 SPX. The double bottom P. TTERN in figure 13.1 looks like a W. The stock or index falls to its support levels, reverses upward for a period of time, and then returns to support without breaking through. That's when the stock turns from a potentially bearish pattern to bullish. The double bottom pattern can develop quickly, or it may take several weeks or months to complete the pattern. When the stock price bounces off the second bottom, increased volume confirms the pattern is valid. Figure 13.1 shows the double bottom reversal pattern on a chart. Just as with any other chart pattern, this pattern doesn't necessarily mean it is an actionable signal. As always, confirm with other technical indicators or oscillators before making a real trade. Figure 13.1 Double Bottom Reversal Courtesy of StockCharts.com Double Top Reversal Bearish Looks like an M, the double top is another common bearish pattern. As you already might have guessed, it is the opposite of the double bottom. It has two peaks around the same price level, resembling an M. After an uptrend, when the stock price has failed to break resistance after two attempts, the uptrend is likely to have been exhausted. When the stock cannot break through the high of the second leg and reverses, the double top pattern is complete. Look for increased volume as the stock price falls, thus confirming the bearish pattern. Figure 13.2 shows the double top reversal pattern. Once the double top pattern is identified, traders who follow patterns may turn bearish on the stock or index. Note how volume increased as the stock price broke support. Note, it's a mistake to take a bearish position just because you recognize a double top pattern on a stock chart. Double tops are easy to spot, but few actually turn into a profitable trade. Figure 13.2 Double Top Reversal Courtesy of StockCharts.com Head and Shoulders Reversal Pattern One of the most reliable patterns is the Head and Shoulders Reversal Pattern. It indicates that buying has stopped at the top of the uptrend and is about to reverse direction. If you look at the chart in Figure 13.3, you'll see Hat the pattern really does look like a head and shoulders. The stock moves higher but pulls back to form the left shoulder. It then moves higher to form the head, a move that seems bullish. It then falls back to its support level, or neckline, which is the alignment of the two support levels. The stock rises again to form the right shoulder but fails to break resistance. Keep your eye on the neckline, because if the stock breaks below the neckline, the chances are high a profit can be made on the short side or by exiting an existing long position. The broken neckline confirms that the upward trend of the stock has not only ended but reversed. In addition, as the pattern plays out, volume decreases until it almost disappears. Once the stock falls below the neckline, however, Volume may increase if the stock plunges, which is what technicians expect to see. Figure 13.3 displays a head and shoulders reversal pattern. Figure 13.3 head and shoulders reversal. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Advanced chart patterns The following discussion is aimed at traders who are fascinated by patterns and want to learn more. Do you really need to know how to spot these patterns on a chart to be successful? No. Many highly profitable traders do not pay any attention to patterns. It's really a personal choice. However, for those interested in learning about advanced chart patterns, keep reading. Gaps The next chart pattern, gaps, appears often on charts. This pattern is different from the others and often turns into an actionable trade. Nevertheless, be cautious when gaps appear since it's easy to get whipsawed, i.e., lose money when the stock price moves wildly in different directions, and head faked. Gaps are a common pattern that show up as blank or open spaces on a chart. It means there was no trading in that price range because the stock price, gapped, or skipped over, that open space on the chart. 
you can think of a gap as an empty area, similar to a long jumper running, leaping, and landing. The space over which he leapt is a gap. After a gap has occurred, there tends to be exed. A ordinary volume, either intense buying, gap up, or selling, gap down. For example, let's say there is breaking news overnight that a new drug by a pharmaceutical company, ZYX, was approved by the FDA, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, as a new flu vaccine. When the news is announced in the middle of the night, buyers overwhelm sellers. The previous close of ZYX was $66 per share. Now ZYX is gapping higher. In the pre-market, ZYX is trading for $71 per share. When the market opens at 9.30 a.m. ET, the stock price of ZYX gaps up from its previous close, $66, to an astounding $74 per share. When looking at a stock chart, there is a gap between $66 and $74 where no shares have been traded. The imbalance between buyers and sellers, i.e., supply and demand, is displayed as a gap on a stock chart. Gaps are clearly visible on a daily chart. They are significant because they indicate that strong buying or selling demand has overwhelmed buyers or sellers. Gaps can occur at any time including in the pre-market or aftermarket, but most often following breaking news. Technicians have identified four types of gaps, breakaway, runaway, or continuation, exhaustion, and common. How is this useful? Let's say that a stock you own gaps higher on strong volume at the opened breakaway gap. Then it appears to run out of steam and stalls, exhaustion gap. By identifying the different gaps, you can make buy or sell decisions. For example, you may consider selling a stock for a profit into a breakaway gap, or perhaps you might sell when an exhaustion gap appears. Hint. It's useful to know that when a stock gaps higher but can't move much further, it may return to fill the gap retreats to the earlier, pre-gap, price. The gap that appears most often on a chart is the appropriately named common gap. This type of uneventful gap appears when there is a gap between the closing and opening prices, but the amount is so small that it's inconsequential only a few pennies. Common gaps don't usually provide a lot of trading opportunities. On the other hand, a breakaway gap is eye-catching and a potenti. LLY profitable trading opportunity. That opportunity involves buying in an uptrend or shorting into a downtrend. This gap type occurs when a stock moves higher on much greater than average volume. Some traders attempt to buy breakaway gaps right at the open, not recommended for rookies, because stocks often reverse direction soon after the gap. If you decide to buy into a breakaway gap, and this does not mean to chase after it, and the stock keeps rising, you just might see the strong uptrend continue not just for a day, but for weeks or longer. No one can predict how long this trade may continue, so there are risks in holding the position, especially right after the open. Breakaway gaps are often seen early in a trend. A runaway, or continuation, gap is similar to a breakaway gap except that it occurs in the middle of a trend, while the breakaway gap begins a new trend. Do not be concerned if you have trouble distinguishing among the various gaps. It takes time to learn how to trade them successfully. Finally, there is the exhaustion gap, which occurs when a stock has made its move higher on less than normal volume, but runs out of steam when buying demand declines as the stock price falls. With little volume or enthusiasm, the stock price falters. Exhaustion gaps are characteristically followed by a reversal, which results in a mad dash out of the stock and a rush of sell orders. Volume may increase as the exhausted stock retreats and once bullish buyers turn into bearish sellers. Trading Hint. Almost all gaps occur when the market opens, unless there is breaking news in the middle of the day and the stock stops trading. Do not make the mistake of jumping into a trade in the first five minutes, what is known in trading circles as, amateur hour. Gap up once a stock breaks out after the open and gaps up. 
let the stock go. It's usually too late to chase it higher and too risky to bet against it. The only trade that makes sense is to sell the position on the move higher when you own it. Otherwise, it's best to leave breakouts alone, as these are very dangerous trades. As one of my trader friends said, don't jump into the mosh pit. Figure 13.4 shows a stock that gapped higher at the open on October 28. Figure 13.4 Gap Up. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Trading gaps are not easy. The problem with trading gaps is that the stock price moves so quickly that only the most skilled traders can profit. Sometimes a stock that gaps up continues higher all morning. Other times it may reverse direction within minutes. Many rookie traders have found themselves on the wrong side of a gap and lost big. For example, let's say a stock gaps down at the open perhaps there was negative news about the company. Many traders may try to buy the dip as the stock gaps down. There is an old Wall Street saying, don't try to catch a falling knife, and that's exactly what you would be doing if you try to buy into a gap down or sell short into a gap up. The problem is this, no one can predict whether the stock is going to keep going lower or reverse direction. In this example, by buying into a stock that gapped down, not just dipping, but gapping, you are essentially gambling and not trading. Beginners should avoid jumping into this unpredictable trade. Triangles, pennants, and flags If you thought gaps were confusing, wait until you read about triangles, pennants, and flags. Fortunately, I'm going to keep this discussion short, as these patterns are most useful to very experienced traders. Those who are fascinated by advanced chart patterns can consult a number of books, a few of the best are mentioned in the appendix. Skilled traders use their brokerage software to search for these patterns. Triangles A triangle is part of the continuation pattern explained earlier. It simply means that a stock is continuing to move in the same direction, perhaps pausing consolidating along the way, although the trend remains intact. The triangle can be bullish or bearish. There are three types of triangles, ascending, descending, and symmetrical i.e., pennants and flags. Ascending triangle. The bullish ascending triangle pattern can be seen on a cha. T when two lines converge to form a triangle. The stock price is moving higher, even pushing above resistance. This is an inviting pattern for many traders because the odds increase for a breakout, where the stock price spikes higher. Figure 13.5 is an example of a bullish ascending triangle. Descending triangle. The bearish descending triangle is an inverted image of the ascending triangle. The stock price is falling below support and making new lows. When the two lines converge, they form the triangle. Short sellers get excited to see a descending triangle, as the odds increase for a breakdown. Symmetrical triangles. Pennants and flags are part of the triangle family. Many technicians believe that pennants and flags give the most reliable signals. They are continuation patterns that allow a stock to move sideways before continuing to trend higher or lower. Figure 13.5 Bullish Ascending Triangle Courtesy of StockCharts.com Penance This continuation pattern is similar to a small triangle, but its trend lines converge to create a pennant. Check to see if volume increases as the pattern forms, confirming that the trend is valid. Figure 13.6 shows a pennant on a stock chart. Figure 13.6 Pennant Courtesy of StockCharts.com Flags A flag is a short-term continuation pattern that shows a brief pause before taking off again. See if volume increases as the pattern is formed, confirming that the trend is valid. Although the flag looks similar to a pennant, a flag's trend lines are parallel. Actually, when you see the pattern on a chart, it really does look like a flag, and even has its own flagpole. Note. A bearish flag appears as an inverted flag on a stock chart. That concludes our discussion on technical analysis. Now it's time to look at another method of analyzing stocks, 
Fundamental Analysis This method is used by long-term investors to find suitable investments with stocks in companies that have strong earnings and revenue growth, have little or no debt, and are often, head and shoulders, above the competition. Part 5 Introduction to Fundamental Analysis Now that you have been introduced to basic technical analysis, it's time to learn about another popular method for analyzing stocks, fundamental analysis. If you want to invest in a business because of its earnings, its debt level, or how the company is managed, you've come to the right place. With fundamental analysis, the focus isn't on the stock price or its trend, but on the inner workings of the company. Beginners often ask, how do I find good stocks to buy? By using fundamental analysis, th. Why will get valuable clues. Speaking of looking for clues, in chapter 16, I include a must-read interview with legendary fund manager Peter Lynch. He used fundamental analysis to find high-quality stocks selling for bargain prices. He was famously known for visiting stores to get stock ideas and also observe which stores had the most customers. He was the first to coin the saying, invest in what you know. For all these reasons and more, it's worth your time to learn basic fundamental analysis. Get ready for a slower-paced, more analytical experience. Chapter 14 It's really fundamental Fundamental analysis is the study of the underlying data affecting a corporation. In other words, you learn everything about the health of the company that issues the stock. For example, you may look at how much the company earns, study the balance sheet, or check the company's debt levels. Not only does a company with strong fundamentals have excellent earnings, but the expectation is that in future years the company will keep growing and generating profits. Using fundamental analysis to evaluate companies is the method of choice for long-term investors. Unlike technical analysis, a tool used by short-term traders, fundamental analysis involves a lot of research. Unfortunately, Many investors don't take the time to examine companies thoroughly before buying. Many just buy because they received a tip or they read about a company on the internet. Truthfully, it is difficult for many people to conduct and understand fundamental analysis. Often, the deeper you dig into the data, the more difficult it becomes. Nevertheless, that should not deter you from looking. Many wonderful stocks have been discovered by investors doing their due diligence, which is the reason this method is so valuable. Why use fundamental analysis? When buying a stock, you are not buying a piece of paper, you are buying a piece of a corporation. That is why you want to study the corporation and decide whether it's a worthwhile long-term investment compared with other companies. By using fundamental analysis, you hope to find companies that offer the best chance of maintaining and growing profits over a long period. Typically, long-term investors don't care how a stock performs today or in a week or month, but over years. Investors also use fundamental analysis to find reasonably priced stocks, something that fundamental analysts call fair value. It requires effort to find companies whose earnings will grow in the future along with its stock price. If you do your homework and closely study all aspects of a corporation, and if your analysis is correct, you should be rewarded with a higher stock price over time though. There are no guarantees. Fortunately, many of the factors such as the company's assets and liabilities, earnings, and amount of debt can be found on the balance sheet. A balance sheet, for those who aren't familiar with Accounting 101, is a brief financial report of the corporation. Over the short term, the prices of high-quality companies can decline. If your analysis is correct, and if the long-term prospects for the company are good, you don't need to be concerned with temporary pullbacks. If you like to conduct research and have a longer-term mindset, then fundamental analysis could be just what you are looking for. Most of your time will be spent searching for and identifying strong, undervalued companies, while less of your time is devoted to trading. 
Where to find fundamental information if you are going to go this route, do it right. Think of yourself as a stock detective trying to uncover the truth about a company's finances. Your task is to analyze the data to find undervalued companies worth your investment dollars, or to identify ones that should be avoided. Fundamental information about companies is available on your brokerage firm's website. This information is also found on financial websites such as Bloomberg, Briefing, MarketWatch, Yahoo Finance, and Google Finance, to name a few. To dig deeper, look at the quarterly and annual 10Q filings on the SEC's Securities and Exchange Commission website. The SEC requires companies to submit this information using its EDGAR Electronic Data Gathering, Analysis, and Retrieval database. The 10Q is a detailed report of the financial performance of the company. To find this information, go to sec.gov and search for EDGAR. 7 Ways to Analyze a Company's Fundamentals Now Let's take a closer look at some of the methods behind fundamental analysis. As I said before, think of yourself as a stock detective trying to uncover the truth about a company. To avoid unpleasant surprises, do careful research. 1. Identify strong industries with a bright future Begin by determining what industry the company belongs to. Ideally, the business will be simple and understand. BLE with good long-term growth prospects. Buying shares of stocks in companies that are industry leaders should be one of your goals. Don't forget to compare the company with its competitors, and be on the lookout for thriving newcomers. Look for companies in profitable industries such as technology, online retail, real estate, and soft beverages, to name a few. Then find and analyze data for the strongest companies in those sectors. You don't want to invest money in a stock until you understand the company's business. Also consider the economic environment. In the midst of a recession, when jobs are scarce and people struggle to stay out of debt, think about recession-proof industries such as food, retail, and pharmaceuticals. After all, people have to eat, shop, and buy medicine no matter how the economy is doing. Once the country is out of the doldrums and jobs are plentiful, businesses that are growing and expanding such as technology should lead the market higher. Their prospects for the future should be excellent as consumers look to buy the latest gadgets. Because there are always contrarians they do the opposite of everyone else, some long-term investors prefer buying stocks in industries that currently are out of favor, but may be an excellent value in the future. These are companies whose shares have taken a temporary hit. During past recessions, some superb companies dropped along with the rest of the market. They were also often the first to recover when the recession ended. Admittedly, it's not easy to buy stocks when everyone else is selling. However, a long-term investor searches for bargains, so buying stocks in strong companies that are temporarily struggling may be an appealing strategy. As always, use fundamental and technical analysis to identify companies that are diamonds in the rough. The bottom line, it's easier, and potentially more profitable, to buy stocks in robust industries with a bright future. 2. Find the leading company in each industry Think of the stores that advertise heavily and have brand name recognition. These are industry leaders. More than likely, these companies are part of the SN. 500 index and perhaps are part of the 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average DJIA. The consumer is king. If people are buying the company's products, earnings will increase, which should result in a rising stock price. To find industry leaders, look for companies that have growing sales and earnings with little or no debt. The future prospects of such companies are excellent. Once you have identified an industry with the best chance for success, choose companies that are stronger and more profitable than their competitors. In the past, the personal computer and the Apple iPhone and iPad, along with the internet, fueled a huge advance in the technology sector. 
Alphabet and Amazon, and similar companies benefited from the movement to online sales, and their shares soared higher for years. Companies that were slow to embrace online sales, such as Sears, JCPenney, Kmart, and thousands of others, saw their stock prices drop, with many of these companies going out of business. Ironically, Sears, one of the first U.S. companies to allow customers to order products by mail, could have become an internet star if management had the vision to grow the company's online presence. Sadly, upper management failed to capitalize on the increased popularity of online shopping. Not surprisingly, Sears filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. As a stock detective, look at the overall industry as well as the individual companies within that industry. Even if the industry is doing well, when you pick the wrong company, you could lose money. If you choose correctly based on fundamental and technical analysis, you are almost certain to make money over time, with caveats, because nothing is certain when it comes to the stock market. Note, in addition to finding fundamental information on the internet, look at the well-respected Value Line Investment Survey, a popular newsletter followed closely by many value investors including top investors Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch. This periodical is available at no cost at any public library or online with a paid subscription. The Value Line Investment Survey has loads of fundamental data about individual companies. A D includes an excellent analysis of each company's future. 3. Study the balance sheet as mentioned earlier. A balance sheet is a report of the financial condition of a business, including items that only an accountant could love. Although understanding the balance sheet is hard work, interpreting the numbers is even harder. The balance sheet reveals how well the company has performed beginning with its first year in business. Remember this. You shouldn't invest thousands of dollars or more in a company unless you know a few facts about it, such as its earnings, the cost to run the business, and its debt. Examine the prior year's balance sheet to get an idea of where the company has been and where it may be going. Compare these numbers with the balance sheet of the competition. The whole point of fundamental analysis. Find the best, or one of the better, companies in the industry. When you uncover the truth about a company's finances, you can make projections about its future prospects. The balance sheet is found at the back of the annual report. Here are a few items you'll see on the balance sheet. Assets what the company owns, such as cash, property, equipment, real estate, and accounts receivable liabilities what the company owes, such as declared and unpaid dividends and accounts payable, shareholders equity, or net worth assets minus liabilities, as long as the company is not hiding debt or liabilities, the balance sheet will give you a glimpse of its financial condition. Reading a balance sheet takes experience and skill because some companies, the kind you don't want to buy, hide expenses and debt while exaggerating earnings. Here's wise advice from Warren Buffett. He never invests in a company if he doesn't understand how it makes its money. After studying the balance sheet, if it is not clear how a company earns money, invest your money elsewhere. If you are a risk-averse investor, Stick with well-known companies that pay dividends and are listed on the major stock exchanges. 4. Understand the income statement while the balance sheet tells you about the company from its first year. The income statement is all about the current year. The first line of the income statement lists the company's sales or revenue, also referred to as the top line. Look to see if earnings or revenues are increasing year over year. The next section of the income statement lists operating expenses. This is the cost of doing business and includes salaries, advertising, employee training, new equipment purchases, rent, and utilities. There is usually a line for research and development R&D, or the cost of developing and investing in new products. The next three sections describe the company's income. Have you ever wondered where the term bottom line comes from? This refers to a company's net income, which happens to be on the bottom line of the income statement. 
Income is the remaining sum. After paying all expenses, how much money did the company make? This is net income. 5. Look at company insiders. You can get clues about the success or failure of a company by learning whether corporate insiders are buying or selling stocks in their own company. Corporate insiders are officers, directors, or shareholders of a corporation who own more than 10%. Of the company's common stock or other class of equity, SEC Rule, Section 16. Insiders have access to proprietary information, the reason this rule was created. To look at the trading activity of insiders, go to the Edgar database at sec.gov, the SEC's website. It contains many fascinating financial documents about the actions of insiders. Some investors created strategies based on mimicking the actions of insiders. After all, insiders should be more knowledgeable than others about the future prospects of the company. Nevertheless, there are problems with tracking insider transactions. Sometimes insiders buy or sell for personal reasons that have nothing to do with the company. Due to the manner in which these transactions are reported, you may not find out what insiders are doing until it is too late, as insider reports are sometimes delayed for up to three months. The bottom line, although insider information can be useful, because of the delay in reporting, most investors should end. T trade based solely on insider activity. 6. Read the annual report for many people, reading the annual report is boring. These reports, issued by every publicly owned corporation, are sometimes as long as 80 pages or more. They contain important financial documents such as the balance sheet and income statement. They also contain information regarding the company's growth strategy, marketing and advertising plans, sales strategy, and any potential situation that could negatively affect the company. A letter from the CEO is usually part of the report. It will mention steps being taken to increase profitability, business strategies, and thoughts on how the company has performed. It is standard practice for companies to highlight the positive aspects of their business while minimizing the negative, and who can blame them. Some of the most fascinating tidbits can be found in the footnotes, where you may learn about perceived risks, ongoing legal issues, and other problems. Sometimes the smaller the font size, the more negative the information. Although annual reports are still available in print format and will be mailed to you if requested, most annual reports are found online at the company website. If you focus on buying stocks in well-known companies with strong balance sheets, popular products or services, and excellent customer service, you will avoid many potential problems. After all, excellent companies don't hide negative information in the fine print and are almost always upfront with shareholders. 7. Go shopping Some of you may be thinking the heading above is a typo. In fact, if you use the strategies of famed mutual fund investor Peter Lynch, you go to stores and observe which have the most foot traffic. Those are the companies you want to study and research, but not necessarily to buy immediately. Let's use Sears as an example again. A few years ago when you were at the mall, you may have noticed that while the Apple store was crowded, fewer customers shopped at Sears. Let's use Sears as an example again. A few years ago when you were at the mall, you may have noticed that while the Apple store was crowded, fewer customers shopped at Sears. That was an important clue of the future prospects of both companies. You know what happened next. The stock price of Apple kept going higher, while the P. Ice of Sears moved lower. Although Sears was one of the most popular companies in the United States at one time, it never joined the 21st century by shifting its products to the internet.
You didn't have to read a balance sheet or talk to management to find out the company was struggling. All you had to do was go shopping. The snapshot page to get a quick overview of a company's fundamentals and the stock quote go to the snapshot page on your broker's software. It is often the first page you see when logging on to your trading account. Every broker has a snapshot page, including print and online sites such as Yahoo Finance, MarketWatch, Bloomberg, Barron's, Forbes, Google Finance, and the Wall Street Journal. A full list is in the appendix. Figure 14.1 shows a snapshot of Apple, Inc. In the snapshot page shown, data such as the stock quote with the bid and ask prices, 52-week high and low, and volume is included. If you look closely, you will see nearly all of the information discussed in this book. Consider the snapshot page as a starting point when doing research about a stock. For investors interested in buying dividend-paying stocks, the dividend yield and ex-dividend date are also displayed. Depending on analysts' reports, you may see the company's outlook for the stock as well as an estimated target price. In addition, you should see the market cap, P.E. ratio, earnings per share, and trade volume. The number of shares sold short, i.e., short interest, is often included on the page. Figure 14.1 Snapshot Page Source. Yahoo Finance. Keep in mind that a snapshot is just that. It's a brief picture of the most important information for traders. It does not replace doing research about the company. However, if you need a quick summary of essential data, there is no better place to look than the snapshot page. In the next chapter, you will learn about the fundamental tools that stock analysts use to evaluate the financial health of a company and whether the stock price is a good value. The most useful tools include EPS, PE, PEG, and RO, all of which will be explained next. Chapter 15 Use Fundamental Tools to Find Stocks In this chapter, you will be introduced to the tools that fundamental analysts use to evaluate stocks. After all, before buying a stock, you want to be sure that the stock is selling at fair value. Some fundamental tools are extremely useful and relevant, while others have fallen out of favor. Although there are hundreds of fundamental indicators and ratios, I introduce you to the ones that are the most useful. These tools include EPS Earnings Per Share PE Price Earnings Ratio PEG Price Earnings Growth RO Return on Equity This information can be found on the Stock Overview or Statistics page on your broker's website. Data can also be found at online financial sites and in print newspapers. Figure 15.1 shows a stock statistics page. Figure 15.1 Stock Statistics. Source. Interactive Brokers. Client Portal Platform. June 2021. Hint to traders. Traders may wonder whether any of the fundamental tools and ratios listed above are useful. Yes, they are useful. If you are bullish, it's always a good idea to trade stocks with good future prospects and strong balance sheets. Stocks with good fundamentals not only are good investments but provide excellent trading opportunities. Use the tools that are available to you, fundamental or technical, to help find winning stocks. Let's take a closer look at four of the most popular fundamental tools that investors rely on when evaluating whether a stock is worth buying. Remember, there are many other tools besides these four. Earnings per share. The key to choosing a good stock One of the most useful pieces of fundamental information is EPS, or earnings per share. No matter how much you love the company or the management team, if the company doesn't earn money, or if it doesn't earn enough to satisfy Wall Street, eventually its stock price will fall. There are exceptions, of course. The stock may not fall immediately if earnings are poor, because Wall Street may have forgiven the bad results, for now. More commonly, new companies may not make a profit for years, but the stock may still rise on the expect. Tion of future earnings. As an investor, 
You must pay attention to how much a corporation is earning and decide if it is worth owning the shares. A good example of this is Amazon, whose stock price steadily rose even though the company had no revenue, and in fact lost money for the first 14 years. When Amazon's earnings finally exploded higher, patient long-term investors were rewarded with an extremely high stock price. This is one reason why the company's current earnings are compared with those of the previous quarter or previous year to determine the earnings growth rate. Because some companies are seasonal, quarter-to-quarter -quarter comparisons are not as useful as year-to-year -year comparisons. The bottom line, if a company's earnings are growing each year and are expected to grow in the future, its stock is one you might consider buying. Where to find EPS You can find EPS below net income at the bottom of the company's income statement. Calculate EPS by dividing the after-tax profit by the number of outstanding shares. In addition to looking at financial websites for up-to-date EPS results and estimates, you can find earnings by entering the stock symbol followed by the word earnings into a search engine. For example, if you type Amazon earnings, a list of the top websites with Amazon's earnings will be displayed. Be sure to check the dates, because the search will display old information as well as current. The earnings estimates game stock analysts are professionals who are paid by their firms to research corporations and evaluate their creditworthiness. In addition to making buy or sell recommendations, they also estimate or predict a company's future earnings. Often, a stock rises on the expectation that the company's earnings will grow in the future. If a company beats analysts' estimates, the stock price usually performs well. If a company misses those estimates, even by as little as one penny, the stock price tends to tumble. Sometimes a company beats published earnings estimates and the stock does not rally. At times, there is a whisper number, or an unofficial estimate that is generally not made public. Failing to be at that whisper number can result in a stock's price getting slaughtered. CEOs are under extreme pressure to beat the earnings estimates. That can lead some CEOs to take actions that boost the bottom line now, while adversely affecting future bottom lines. How can this happen? CEOs earn cash or stock bonuses for good performance each quarter. Since companies do not want to miss estimates, which can hurt the stock price, they tend to guide analysts to the most conservative, i.e., low estimates. It's a game that I call, beat the estimate. If analysts' estimates are on the low side and the earnings per share beats the estimates, it generates a lot of positive publicity, and the stock price tends to rise. For example, if a company is expected to earn 10 cents per share and earns 15 cents per share, beating the estimates by 50%, it's highly likely that the stock price will please its shareholders. On the other hand, when a company doesn't meet analysts' earnings expectations for the quarter, the stock could get severely punished. The last thing that anyone on Wall Street wants is a surprise, especially when it is bad news. Introduction to stock ratios There are a number of fundamental tools that can help investors determine whether a stock is a good value. A few of the other well-known and popular ones are listed below, including the P.E. ratio, PEG, and RO. Unlike many other fundamental metrics that have outlived their usefulness, the P.E. ratio is one tool that is still followed by many investors. Let's begin with it. The granddaddy of stock ratios. The price-earnings ratio Many people use the price-earnings ratio to evaluate whether a stock is selling for a reasonable price. Dividing the stock price by the annual earnings per share gives you a P-E ratio, also known as the P-E multiple, that helps determine whether a stock is fairly valued. Here is the formula for calculating the P-E ratio. P.E. ratio equals current stock price divided by earnings per share Some believe that the P.E. ratio is the most effective way to evaluate a stock. Actually, the P.E. ratio is just one of many tools to help an investor decide which stocks to buy. Let's take a closer look at how to use the P.E. ratio. 
When a stock priced at $20 per share earned $2 last year, it has a trailing P.E. of 10, $20 divided by $2. It's a trailing P.E. because it uses earnings from the previous year. If a $20 stock was expected to earn $4 next year, it would have a forward P.E. of 5, $20 divided by $4. Forward P.E. relies on estimates of future outcomes. The great thing about the P.E. ratio is that it can be used to compare a company's current P.E. against its historical range. The P.E. can also be used to determine if a stock is cheap or expensive compared with other stocks in the sector or the overall market. Here's some advice. Do not buy a stock based on one single indicator or ratio. The P.E. ratio is a good place to begin your research and should be considered before investing in a company. However, you should However, you should not stop there. Look at a number of other fundamental and technical 